Shout out to all my beautiful nature lovers out there. It's your boy Ian, AKA the Lit Professor, here today to drop the first lesson in the Spiritual Ecology course, which is pages one through 11 of David Abrams' Becoming Animal. So first of all, if you guys would like to sign up for the Spiritual Ecology course, you guys can for free at thelitunderground.com. The link is above the photo right now and is also in the description, no matter where you were listening or watching this right now. And this is a free course that surpasses anything that you would get in a university. And I am going to be critiquing, editing, and supporting your journal entries book reports and final essays for free for till the end of time because I know how important spiritual ecology is. If you guys would like more inter information, I have already uploaded and filmed an introduction video that goes over all this and what you need to know for the course, or you can find all that out at the link above. So let's hop right into this, everybody. What is, and oh, just a quick FYI. There is a movie, Becoming Animal, that I watched last night with you know, a loose storyline, a loose presence by David Abram. And it's pretty good. If you guys really love this book or want to go even deeper, uh, go check it out. It's not an action thriller, but it's it's a good book. And it's filmed in Grand Teton National Park, where I spent a lot of time over this past summer at my while visiting my family. So what what is Becoming Animal? What What is the main concept of this book? Like, why, why did I choose this first? I have five... We're covering five seminal texts in spiritual ecology, and there's 500 others. Why is this one going first? Because this book is about living a, a phenomenological experience with nature. And why am I using that highfalutin word, phenomenological? Because that is going to be a huge theme in this course. But what does that mean? That is just a basic or a more advanced term for awareness, direct awareness. Awareness in reality of what's happening. You looking out and having nothing else on your mind while you are experiencing reality. Contact with nature. And that's what this book is going on. Not just having an experience with nature because any, anybody can walk out for two hours in nature and have direct contact with nature if they leave their phone and just kind of relax a little bit. But accepting what's going on within nature, accepting what, who we are as two-legged animals, accepting our presence, and then even more so than that, and this is what this course is going to be about, is living that phenomenological experience with nature, no matter if you're in a room like I am right now, or at a work, or on your lunch break, no matter when, where, or how, you can experience nature, because nature is always around us. So, this, this course and this book, and this idea of living in contact with nature is not a drill. This has been being built upon for thousands of years and in the academic and artistic world for a while since really, in my opinion, the Chinese poets took it to a whole new level. Tu Fu and um, Cold Mountain. This is about speaking, living, living and listening to the natural world. Full integration. And I would like to address, before we even go any further, the critics out there, because there's going to be... A, I already know it and that there's going to be people, you don't need a course for this. Why would you need a course for uh, learning how to exist with nature? Okay. Okay. So let's let David Abram who d puts David Abram just slams the haters in the introduction to this book. That's what this, that's why this video is going to be longer than maybe some of the other ones for the length in uh, correlation with the length of only 12 pages because he is literally slamming all the people because if you are, a person who loves words and loves arts and integrates that with nature. You've met the Luddites. You've met those people. And let's listen to what David Abram has to say. Look at, oh, and boom. Yet words are human artifacts, are they not? Surely to speak or to think in words is necessarily to step back from the world's presence into a purely human sphere of reflection. Such precisely has been our civilized assumption. But what if meaningful speech is not an exclusively human possession? What if the very language we speak now arose first in response to, animate, to an animate, expressive world, as a stuttering reply not to the others of our species, but to an eg enigmatic cosmos that already spoke to us in a myriad of tongues? Boom, everybody. Did you hear that? I got to go full screen for that. Did you hear that? Boom, where are all the haters at now? But we will continue addressing the haters as we go on and all the doubters. So, and that, 
the people who really are get into this are the homesteaders, the Luddites, the people who have learned to detach from the world, the people who have, for whatever reason, do not want to be a part of the world anymore because home people who are not of the world are perfectly fine. That is a great and noble path and you are actually creating good in the world, but disappearing from the path is maybe a problem because why become a detached, bitter, and sad Luddite who has to comment on people who are, you know, like David Abram, why, does, why did he put that in there? Because he has experienced a certain amount of hate in his life since he wrote probably Spell the Sensuous and became a public figure. Because no matter what, people, the people who are detached from reality, from the phenomenological experience of what's going on because they're living out on a farm and they're in a huge echo chamber, guess what? I know that you're connected with nature. I know that you can experience it and we don't need this. But what about everybody else? That's what this course is about. Helping everybody else, the seven, the seven other billion people who haven't done that yet. Good for you. You did it. Turn it off. We don't need you. But if you want to step up and help other people, you're going to have to get out of that. You're going to have to put yourself out there and continue moving forward. And the people who slam, okay, and what that quote was really saying is that language and I, I heard this like a couple weeks ago. I was talking to somebody who like spends a lot of time in nature. And they're like, nature removes me from the concept. The Tao that is not called the Tao is not the Tao. And I'm like, yes. But <laughs> what David Abram just said, what if there is a, what if language came from forms within nature? The fo And I'm going to get a little bit deeper into this in a bit. What if the, they, they came from forms within nature? What if language wasn't to say, Bleh get away from me or wow, food. What if language didn't come up in that way, but came out from nature? Because we are not the only species with language and we have no idea about plant languages between plants and within all the different um, kingdoms. We don't know those relationships yet. We just are stuck in our little world. And that's why, and that's why the people who act like this are really no different than people who are super religious and people and people who are super scientific. And it seems like there's a weird cross parallel that I've seen before to people who are out there and act like this to being very dogmatic or very in either a religious sense, either super left brain or super right brain. And that's just what I've seen. And I, I'm not ranting here. David Abrams, the one who's putting this in his book, the religious people, the scientists, everybody. And the, it's about the, creating a referential to nature, creating a separation from nature, creating a hierarchy within nature. Like, look at these goofballs, bro. Like, and it's important, but what is going on, everybody? And we don't need dropouts in this war. In a war where, and it is the war that... The earth and the environment is being destroyed. We don't need people who are being wispy. We don't need people who are not seeing reality. We need people who are studying the forms of nature. And I'm going to read a passage from Robert Bly right now in his essay. I think it's titled, Form That Is Neither In, neither in Nor Out. And he says, quote, So when we speak of form as a wildness and consider a poem's form as drawn from the careful economy of nature, we can then imagine the poem as being as a being that moves fast, can leap in the air, escape from tigers or professors, and live for generations, even during lean times. And what Bly is trying to say is that the best natural poetry is one that forms from nature, that finds from nature. And it's, if we study nature, if we study this photo right now, these look like, I guess, flamingos, if I'm saying that correctly, um, that is a wild form. That is something that leaps and bounds and dies and has to survive if it wants to continue on. Those flamingos right there. And art and the best art and the best things have that form. It mimics animals. It mimics nature. It, art, even though art and the avant-garde has kind of ruined that concept, it's still there. It's still existing from nature. Every, the axiomatic root of everything is from nature. And look... When you discover and can live in this reality where, for instance, it, these energetic codes exist and we don't have that as much in poetry because of Christianity and the break of um, nature in Christianity. 
Um, but you see it, though, in Beowulf. If you guys have ever read the uh, Middle English or Old English of Beowulf, there it is. It looks natural. It has a certain form to it. And even Chaucer, a couple hundred years later, had a bit of that form. And then suddenly it disappeared. Boom, out of it. And if you look at the occult, if you look at things like the Kabbalah and other things, everything has a form. There are forms to this earth. There are forms that we are going, that if we study, we will connect deeper with nature. And in the third book of the series, The Mystery, Mystery Teachings of the Living Earth, I am, th that is what that book is about. It's basically a remix of the Kybalion. So stay tuned for that. We'll get into this concept way further lately, later. And Dave, uh, David Abram on page five starts responding. Let's pull this up. Responding to all the haters. He responds to religion. Um, the people who want to take direct engagement with nature away and replace it with these things I'm going to be going over right now. And what they're trying to replace it with is, of course, and when I mean replace it, when I'm saying replace it, they want to create it as a referential as not the direct phenomenological experience that we are trying to get to. They are trying to separate it, create it, and make it a simulacra, a copy of a copy. And now nature has been reduced with virtual reality to a copy of a copy of, of a copy times 100, with, and we can't even track its original origin. And that's what's crazy with, about the internet. I just said that everything has an origin in nature. And of course, the technology powering it does. But a lot of the ideas have even transcended nature, which is, which is kind of scary. So, of course, we have religion, everybody. The big kahuna. Um, for thousands of years, we have tried to, instead of experiencing nature, we have tried to wisp it off into ways, to, um, into mythologies and superstitions, and mo mostly to avoid death. But that, you know, that's a different story. Then, and, and you know, I don't, this happens, but you know, most, if you're listening to this, you probably don't deal with two religions of people unless you have family members or work somewhere weird. But the people who I deal with the most are the neurotransmitters, the atheists. Oh, excuse me. The, <laughs> that's all they are is just neurotransmitters. Cause it's all consciousness is, is just neurotransmitters firing. Uh, these neurotransmitters are firing and synapsing and that's what creates consciousness or, and I'm sure you've heard that before when you ask what is consciousness? They don't, and you know, there are different theories. If you read the theories of Schelling and get into Carl Jung and stuff, that their nature might be the way our conscious or unconscious manifests. And that's what, you know, I think we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll be getting into that more. The other way is DNA, that our behavior, we're just animals that are programmed by DNA and all this and what I'm doing and your cat and the mountain lion out there is all just DNA acting out. Or even worse, worst of all, and this is like the new thing, is the subatomic realms. It's physics. It's, we can't even see it. It's gone beyond. It's the Big Bang. It's particles within particles that are influencing all these different things. And you need to know who the people are saying this. It's the only people who say this are saying it to be cool and to be a jerk. It's to just be redundant. You know, anyone can play the logical game. If we want to sit in logic land, I can do that all day. I can go to the nth degree and I can do that. But there is no exploration. There is no trust in something deeper. And I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about even trusting other humans or trusting nature or reality or love or emotions. There is no trust with clowns like this. Look, at you've all heard it. You've, oh, well, I can't see it. Well, I love nature, but that's too, logic is the empiricism is the only thing that can save society. You know, I have heard it a million different times and it's old and that's, we're trying, I'm trying to destroy these people right now. And if you want to read, I think on page five and six, David Abram, um, as I'm sure you saw, destroys this. And what, what do you do? I'm here to talk about what do we do about these people? You know what we do with these people? We throw them out. We create social pressure on these people. Don't engage. What repeat? Do not engage with these people. You can engage in places, one-way activities like this, but we need to create a reality where they can't participate, where they, um, people are going to look at them like, why are you so cold? Because in this all combines this kind of logical approach works great with capitalism because capitalism is a cutthroat. Capital is a artificial concept that cuts through everything that if you chase capital, then you can make an excuse for any behavior. It can get rid of everything. And there's this distinct connection 
with capital. And um, this isn't school anymore, everybody. We're not stuck in school anymore. I get it. In school, there you have to play games with people, and there's the logic, and the, there's a girl that's way too emotional. We're not stuck there anymore. And we have to. And what I meant by creating social pressures is that those people are going to be ostracized. Those people are now the norms. With you know, so much science now out there that this is now the norm. And there is an integration of ecology and biology and the sciences, but. That, once again, that is not the solution. I don't care what you figure out about nature. If everybody isn't on board, if we don't have at least even 10% of people living a full phenomenological experience with nature, and I would assume that it's probably right now 0.00001 um, of the world's population, then it doesn't matter what study or uh, protest you go to. None of that matters. What law you pass, because in the long run, we're going to destroy it anyway. It all gets destroyed. And yes, we are, I am smart enough to admit that science and logic has done insurmountable things for us, that we would still be stuck chopping off limbs and without penicillin, with all these different things, and that there is a time and place for that. But the time and place for that is the eight-hour workday where the scientists and the logic, logic, logicticians do their work. But then outside of work, they keep living it. People, people who aren't even scientists are living their whole existence as scientists. It's so freaking annoying like i can't they, like the people who actually have a sense of color within them it's the most frustrating thing and that's why i like i said the first six pages of this introduction are talking about this there is a lived experience right in front of us i mean most but most of our concepts of nature that even we have learned that those of us who understand nature and love nature live through referentials referentials like this right here this is a referential of nature something that is you know this is we're seeing nature through this glass and you know this is kind of a cool concept but and one of the, my favorite examples of this is all the protesters you know look at these climate crisis people right here are do they have good intentions yes or that what they're doing is wrong Probably not. This is it's good emotional rage from the heart, and they're frustrated and want to help. But like I said, the the this isn't waking up people to living a phenomenological experience. That that has this has nothing to do with that. Politics. Um, th th these people. This protest right here isn't saying, look around. Should I worry? We are orphans. Less meat equals less heat. Um, this isn't, they are calling for political solutions from their overlords who are also living in referential worlds. Do you think that the, um, for instance, you know, one of the biggest politicians in America right now um, is a young female from New York City. How much, one of the big environmental activists, I should say, how much nature is she really living in Washington, D.C. and the Bronx? Let's just be honest. It doesn't matter how great her intentions are, even though I think they're good, and I think it's a good, you know, great direction, but how, 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 how sincere of a nature lover are you into waking this up, or is this about economics and about different types of control? And that's what it seems like all this is about. These people don't seem very general like genuine phenomenological um, observers of nature. They seem, you know, caught up in an aesthetic. The axiomatic disconnection from phenomenology creates bad decisions. Without a worldwide acknowledgement of that, groups will find ways around laws created to help the environment. No matter what laws get passed or what happens, we it's basically come, has to come down to an environmental anarchy that we create a new baseline for society, that we create a new baseline for people where it's like, wow, should we be living in these weird suburban, like in Las Vegas, where I live, uh, a lot of people have pools and waste a lot of water and like you have all these plants that like aren't producing any bountiful you know food for them we could it isn't inconceivable to raise the baseline where everyone would be like yeah that's that's a good idea we don't need that like we could have community pools and like whatnot and this, this these referentials and these things and this disconnection starts to create problems and rifts and cracks in the society because these people right here, like I said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
These people right here are creating a polarity. These people are now creating a separation between the religious people, between the scientists, the people who we need. These people are like, they're just crazy liberals. Um, that's not what we need because you can live, you know, with the crime. And the weird thing is, is that a lot of, a lot of the world's religions can actually exist coexist with the phenomenological experience with nature you know with actual re real reality no but like people like Wendell Berry you know the a beautiful author he was a Christian he just I think he's still alive but he donated his whole farm to a uh, small Christian university and you know kind of and he wrote about you know integrating those two things that's fine and that's like kind of a new way new wave of thinking for people who want to continue their family traditions or whatever but those people are going to be driven away by this, by these types of actions and by nailing yourself to the tree. And like I said, there is a time and a place for that. But the way that it's being done seems a little bit like making nature the referential because that's all this is. Look, climate justice, nature, the climate is now the referential for justice and justice is going to be through laws that are going to be enforced by, you know, officers or whoever. And it's all kind of it's all kind of wacky everybody this is all kind of a far away cry from living a phenomenological experience with nature and i won't probably get too much into this for, in becoming animal again but i just wanted to touch on that and you know what i mean boom um and these are just you know some nice photos real fast i don't know what i had these in for beautiful so i live in the desert everybody i live in las vegas and I have heard thousands, like literally thousands from thousands of different people about why the Vegas, why Vegas sucks. Oh my God. Like right now I'm looking out my window. It's literally 111 degrees right now. That is not fun. If you've, I don't know, you have probably never been in 111 degree heat. It is just the, the, the journey from 95 to 111 is insurmountable. It's like the journey from like zero to negative 15 or, or you know, it's feels a lot hotter, but People don't want to acknowledge or live in this desert. Everybody abuses it. Everybody hates it. And the abuse of the natural world continues every single day. And this has to start in our local communities. Um, for instance, there is, okay, and well, excuse me, the way I wanted to tie this in is that the government, the United States government has deemed that this desert, my desert, not my desert, but our desert, uh, <laughs> has is the was the place to do the nuclear testing for yeah, out at creech air force base that's where they did all the underground and above ground nuclear testing because they saw it as nothing they saw this you know right here as not having any substance to it just being some you know sagebrush and some cactuses and they still do military they don't you know explode nukes but they still do military testing the largest you know drone tests happen out in that desert and it Unlike other places I've been, when I go out to the desert, at any point there's glass everywhere and, you know, ATVers and people abuse the shit out of the desert because they don't understand the desert. And anyone can understand the desert if you are experiencing a phenomenological experience of nature. It's really easy to enjoy Hawaii or like California or Yosemite or Yellowstone. If you've ever been there, suddenly all the all the really mean and weird people who like have day jobs and like are really nice and they're enjoying nature and they're sitting out and they don't do that though in their hometown. They don't go out and ex have that same reaction. But the desert is even worse. Everyone just hates it. And it's, you know, just really crazy about how once, like I said, once again, it, we have to go all the way. This is not a drill. We have to go all the way with living this phenomenological experience because if we don't, certain things are going to get left out. It's like, oh, well, you know, the desert's not that bad or like slaughterhouses. We can have a little bit to feed everybody. Like, you know, the little things are getting like, oh, we can burn that, build that subdevelopment over there. Like, you know, that's, that might be sacred ground, but whatever, man. Like, we have the rights. We've owned the rights for a while. And you guys know what I mean. That... And the reason we do this is that we, let's, let's pull this, let's read a couple quotes real fast. Well, first of all, we don't want to be stuck here, everybody. That is the root of it all. We do not want to be stuck here in nature. Like, 
not in nature, but in our reality. Guess what? I am going to die one day and it could be painful. And you're my parents and my friends and my cat and my recently deceased dog all are going to die. I may have to live these painful deaths and go through painful deaths. And, um, I live in a world where there are today, there was a, you know, an attack in Afghanistan. There are, and billions of animals get killed every, every year. I live in a cruel world, but I have to, to live a pure phenomenological existence. I have to accept that world, everybody. And the ultimate nature of death, you know, and this is like kind of getting into Ernest Becker's denial of death text. It drives out the theoretical solutions. Instead of thinking and feeling and becoming more animal, we create, um, you know, mass supermarkets and graveyards and mass freeways. We create all these things instead of acknowledging what's going on. And I would like to read off, um, we're almost finished everybody, a couple more quotes that I found that were great. Whether sounded on the tongue, printed on the page, or shimmering on screen, language's primary gift is not to re rep represent the world around us, but to call ourselves into the vital presence of that world and into deep and attentive presence with one another. These pages, too, are nothing other than talking leaves. Their insights sur stirred by the winds, their vitality reliant on periodic sunlight and on cool, dark water seeping up from within the ground. Step into their shade. Listen close. Something other than the human mind is at play here. We have to create this, this book right here, Becoming Animal, what you have listened to for 11 pages for 27 minutes about at this point is a psychological text, one that will teach us to have better interrelations with one another. If we can observe the natural world, our axiomatic experience of the world, how we are supposed to participate in advanced, how are we supposed to participate in a, it, everyone, how are we supposed to participate in advanced level human problems if we haven't learned to experience the easiest thing out there, the, our axiomatic experience of nature? If we haven't learned to solve that, which we haven't, that's what the drive of into civilization and into war and all those other things was about. If we haven't solved that problem yet, then what, what, where are we? How are we going to be able to navigate interspace travel and, you know, uh, the growing population? How are we supposed to do these things? This is the human solution, everybody creating a phenomenological experience with nature. This is the root of where we have to start no matter what. I don't care about laws. I don't care about anything. I don't care about the news. I care about making sure people know that this is happening and getting them out there without their phones, without the photo and spending time out there. You know, one of my, one thing that really pisses me off sometimes is when I'm out trying to have a nice time in nature and there's people around, you know, you want to be alone sometimes, but I live out, I live in a city of 3 million people and I drive 20 minutes outside of town and hang out the, can hang out in the desert even 10 minutes outside of town and not see anybody for a whole day. There's 3 million, there's only two ways out of my, really out of my city, two places to really go, outskirts, you know, north and south. So 1.5 million people, if not 3 million people have access to this one point and no one's stopping. There is nobody. Nobody else th had the thought to come out and take a look around, you know? And like I said, this is only t this is the, the minimum distance away that you need to get to, you know, feel like you're in nature. No one else had that thought. And I'm sure you feel like this at your hometown. Go outside to the outskirts. How many people are you seeing? And in nice places like Portland and others, but there's, you know, the, the trails are busier. But ser serial killers torture animals because they were abandoned by the family to go hang out in the backyard by themselves. In this weird reality, they, we, have, we need to teach people how to live a phenomenological experience, an aware experience with contact in nature. Or the problems are going to magnify and get bigger. The unrest, the in logical insanity, the the divide between, you know, the, the political polarity is going to continue to increase no matter what. Our inner reality, everybody, and, you know, tech addiction, pill addiction, you know, it's all going to, it's all going to continue to manifest. Our inner reality as a collective manifests as objective reality. Te and 
that's it, everybody. I mean, you've heard that before, our inner reality, but it's our inner reality, not my inner reality, our inner reality. And it's up to you. That's what this course is about. I'm giving this away for free and going to be supporting people for free on their journey, no matter how dumb, how stupid, how smart, no matter who, how trolling, who come as you are, let's get going, everybody. So I have an assignment, everybody. And like I said, watch the intro video or go to uh, the info page on the course page to figure out um, where to submit your assignment. It's pretty self-explanatory though. But so I want about this presentation or about these first 12 pages, 100 to 200 words of journaling about the chapter. I won't be reading these. Oh, hold on. Let me, sorry. Excuse me. But use this as a time to gather and clarify your thoughts. And the reason I won't be reading these is because this is a personal time for you to be writing. I'm going to be reading uh, your book reports two times in a row to, you know, get, and your essay, final essays to get a full picture. But this is not that. This is an informal place for you guys to write. And so don't worry about grammar or like whatever. This is literally just to make sure you are writing because writing is important. Explicating your thoughts is important. Um, the intuitive ideas that come to you now will be invaluable to you while writing your book report and final paper. So here are some tips. This may be an excellent time to reflect on the evolution of your relationship with nature. So like just this, this, this intro for this book, I'll just talk about how you've maybe come into a more phenomenological experience with nature, maybe coming from a, maybe you, we all kind of had it as kids and then probably lost it. And how have you returned or why do you want to return? That's maybe a good time to write about that. And then if you're stuck, if you have no idea what to do, and, and if you want to complete the course, you're going to have to do this. Um, just pick a passage, like one, even use one of the quotes I picked, and if you want, and from the text that spoke to you and respond to that. Just write 100 to 200 words about that. That should be a paragraph or two. And I think that's all, everybody. Thank you guys for tuning in. This was a monster presentation, and expect more soon. Comment. You write, post your journal entry in the comments if you want. That would be great. I mean, post it on the website, too to get credit, but um, say what's up, tell me how you guys liked it, and I'll see you guys later, peace. What's up to all my conscious nature dwellers out there? It's your boy Ian, AKA The Lit Professor, here today to drop the second lesson in the Spiritual Ecology course. Today we are covering chapter two, Shadow, in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. And the chapter runs from page 13 to page 20. Four. And if you guys would like to join the course, you guys can go to this link that you see on the screen right now and get more info or watch the intro video. So, boom. Today's video is not going to be as intense or as long as last video because the concept today is deep but not too deep because we are talking about the shadow and depth ecology, as Abram calls it, in terms of the shadow. So, First of all, the first couple pages of the chapter speak from themse for themselves. And this is beautiful nature writing. And take, take a deep look at what he's doing here because this is what good writers do. This is an example of great writing. And when it comes to nature writing, it is even better. And one of the main things he does, which I love and which I always advocate for for all my students at, in the Lit University, is that the elimination of most pronouns. And he kind of gets a little bit weirder because he moves into the second person and is using you a lot. But he doesn't even use you that often. He's using a lot of verbs and descriptive words. I could say, I see my shadow on, oh, you know, fading away into the sunset. Or I could say, shadows fade into the sunset as the night calls over the mountain or over the horizon. You know, that was off the top of my head. Which one sounded better? But for whatever reason, people love because of the personal narrative that we were taught in high school and in college to use just pronouns, I, me, my, we, and it goes on and on. But you, people don't realize is that that creates a separation between you and the reader. Every time I say I, the reader thinks that it's themselves. They say I, Ian, but no, it's not I, Ian, it's I, David. But if you can eliminate that, if you can remove the illusion, or remove the block, then you can create the illusion that you're, you know, we're supposed to be doing with writing in the first place. So that's, and we'll talk about more, more about that later. And so what David is talking about here, or Abrams is talking about here, is that the shadow is our axiomatic expression. And that's why it is the 
first thing talked about is that if I look at my shadow, let's move on here. If we look at our shadow, we think our shadow is flat and that, you know, I'm walking and I have this flat shadow, but there is space between us and the shadow. And starting to observe this is the first step in gaining the phenomenological awareness we talked about in the intro video. It does shadow uh, shadows don't exist after a certain point of elevation after we go above the clouds and above other things suddenly shadows become more obsolete it is a shared experience of all kingdoms of the ground level earth all of us share the concept of shadows plants mammals rocks all of us have that shared experience the only things that don't are maybe windows and the wind as abrams like uh talked about so it's so cool that he did this at the very start. The first thing he talks about past the intro is the shadow. And rereading this, you know, for the course, that blew my mind once again. When I read it, it blew my mind. But just seeing after, you know, and knowing where he's going to go, it's just like, wow. Most people never talk about that. And most people think that their shadow is flat. If we talk about it, we think it's like Peter Pan or whatever. And But there is space between us and the shadow. And there is expansiveness. There is an expansiveness, excuse me, we'll just go back to that first photo, between us and the shadow. And so let's say I have, there's a shadow on my side of my face right here. There is a length of shadow though that goes all, that expands out. If we're looking at our shadow, it is three dimensional, if not four dimensional or five dimensional if we want to get super trippy or if you are super trippy, that is. And that's mind blowing in and of itself, because once again, we are just trying to get back to the basics, back to the fundamentals of phenomenological awareness right now. That's what I am teaching us right now, because everyone has lost that people walking around every day aren't thinking about the depth of their shadow. And if you can't even think about the depth of your shadow, then how are you supposed to move on to the depth of other things? And that's, that's what I think is super cool. So let's move on to a quote. I don't some nice photos of the shadow. So the living, this living shadow is born afresh every dawn, or rather the shadow is what remains of the night as the night's gloom flees the, sorry, the night typo gloom flees the advance of the rising sun. And that's a pretty cool concept is that, and, and that's what we see at the start. If you read the first couple pages, it's this descent into the world of shadow, which is nighttime. Night is just all shadow. We don't think about that, but in the day we think of, of light. But then it, as he gets even deeper is that, you know, during the shadows during the day are hints of the night, which is so cool because if we want to get it, and he doesn't take it here, but just the psychological concept of the shadow and duality and polarity within us, it's around us at all times and we just don't see it if we look into and read between the lines and look around us there the metaphors exist and guess what people in primitive societies probably weren't doing that they weren't making this connection that i'm making now and abram doesn't even abrams doesn't even make this connection but if we're trying to ascend and into higher consciousness we don't need phones. We don't even need books at all these times you know it can help but we don't need any of the stuff because it exists all around us, which is pretty freaking crazy. It exists, you know, in these momentary pictures and these ideas. As we're just looking at these photos, they're everywhere. Every single moment we can see that this is occurring. So then we can just, I'm just taking you guys through these photos just for fun. And to quote, Abrams again, do we notice this? Do we feel somehow different at high noon when the darkness has seeped into us? Do we feel the weight of our own shadow? And let's talk about that. Do we feel somehow different at high noon when the darkness has seeped into us? So he's talking about this concept I was talking about at high noon. There is no shadow. Suddenly our shadow disappears. Shadows start disappearing at that time of the day, especially if you're in like a flatlands area. Does the darkness seep into us? It does. And do we feel the weight of our own shadow, the press of its difficult knowledge against the inside of our own torso and skull? 
That's pretty crazy that the shadow then is external and then gets consumed into us. He's speaking of this because if you're just looking at this from a phenomenological angle, where does the shadow go? We can say, well, obviously with the physics and all. But if we're looking at this from a little bit deeper, if we've taken the next step, everybody, it is absorbing into us. Is it the shadow itself that looks out through our eyes at midday? Small wonder that so many traditional peoples give themselves over to siesta and sleep for an hour or two at this time, letting their tissues and organs respond to this interior visitation by the night, allowing the many cells or souls within them to be tutored by the darkness that has taken temporary refuge within their flesh. Are you freaking kidding me? That is such a deep concept that at midday, do you ever get that midday sleepiness? Like I do. I mean, if I'm eating good and energized, I don't, but sometimes, you know, you get that midday drowning out. And what is that? You know, I've always, you know, we'll just be honest here. I've always attributed that to carbohydrates that people eat a ton of gluten and stuff in the middle of the day, but that is a real concept. And the energy does get sucked out of us, you know, during at 10 PM or excuse me, 10 AM or 12 PM, 12 PM feels a lot more intense when the shadows don't exist anymore. And I feel like and what Abram is maybe talking about is there is a lack of perception going on within the middle of the day. So be mindful of that as we're going on because today's exercise and, and homework is to observe your shadow throughout the day in the morning at noon and then at you know midday or at dusk time and see if it feels different. Make personal observations and then record them. And I think like you said, you're going to feel something similar to what Abram is talking about right here about how you want to give yourself over to the shadow and it and it's also kind of weird that at midday and this this is kind of a this might be a personal thing but it seems like a lot of things happen midday the 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 affair happens at midday at at lunch we all you know at the at the break at the break of the day you know people take their bump of their vice, whether it be another coffee or another substance, they go sleep with their mistress. There's always these weird things that happen at midday. And is that this weird metaphor for darkness? I don't know. I don't know. But that's just something that I've observed. Um, so then we kind of get into this concept of the power. Oh, maybe I do. I have this quote. Okay. But we'll just look at these two photos real fast, you know, of the mountain. I was supposed to place these a little bit somewhere, uh, someplace else. So, quote again, has my shadow now dissolved and dissipated or is it present but hidden, swallowed within the wider shade of evening? And we're talking about evening now, everybody. We have moved back down now into evening and that's why I kind of showed this transition now. We're moving into evening time. We talked about midday. Let's move into evening. Or is it the evening itself, nothing other than the garment woven over all our disparate shadows from those separate darknesses that walk on their own during the day, yet gather themselves into a common thickness as the sun slides behind the hills? So that our individual shadow, as we have said, is our own private patch of night, torn from the black cloak every morning as we stumble out to greet the day. I mean, this is so deep. I mean, we'll have to, we can go over this line by line. Has my shadow now dissolved and dissipated? And we're talking about at night when, you know, dust comes or is it present, but hidden swallowed within the wider shade of evening. So imagine being under a tree, right? And suddenly you can't see your shadow anymore, but you're under the shadow of a tree. Have you really lost your shadow or is your shadow just now been consumed by the tree shadow? And we, we think that concept still happens at night. Or is the evening itself nothing other than the garment woven from all of our disparate shadows, from those separate darknesses that walk on their own during the day, yet gather themselves into a common thickness as the sun slides behind the hills? So what he's trying to say here is that at night, is it all of our shadows combined, all of the shadows in the, uh, you know, I guess in our region combined to create the darkness, which is freaking crazy you know and once again the empiricist well i don't know the sun goes behind the behind the moon or whatever and, and the earth and we can't see it yes i know 
But have you ever thought a little bit deeper? That's what's going on here, everyone. This is so fun. How playful is this? How crazy is this? How deep is this, everybody? This is my third time reading this, and I'm still mind blown. Are you mind blown? Maybe. Say what's up, everybody, if you're listening right now. Say what's up in the comments. Tell me about your experience with the shadow. Leave your, you know, I should be saying this earlier, but subscribe to the channel. Say what's up. Join the course. You guys know the, you guys know the business. I don't, I don't need to lecture you guys. You guys are smart enough to know this. Um, so then finishing this up, so that our individual shadow, as we have said, is our own private patch of night torn from the black cloak every morning as we stumble, stumble out to greet the day. Now that is a fire concept. And he just kind of um, explicated what I was saying a little bit that, you know, is our shadow just, you know, our private patch of night. And then we have to give it back every single night. That's pretty crazy. And now we're going to start talking about the power of the mountains, man. And, you know, we live in a world now, like my house right now, it's, there's all these shadows that are being created, but if all these houses were torn down, I just live in a flat desert area with mountains, you know, not too far away, but I, I live in this flat area. Um, but now through buildings and through skyscrapers, if you live in New York City or Philadelphia or Los Angeles, suddenly, or an apartment complex, suddenly you are consumed into the shadow of these buildings, much as something would be, uh, this house is about to be consumed by the shadow of the mountain. And I mean, chat, and he talks about how when you are in the shadow of a mountain, how you become the mountain, just how, you know, how we were talking about how your shadow gets into the mountain. And it's a crazy concept because there is a different vibe. If anyone has spent a lot of time on a mountain after sunset, and I sure have as a, as a skier and, you know, a hiker, you know, when that mountain goes down and when it's, you know, before sunrise, it's kind of a different vibe. Something kind of changes in the animals and the insects, everything starts acting a little bit differently. And is it because we have become now be a part of the mountain? And I think it is we have because the shadow is not a flat thing. It stretches across of us. The mountain is projecting this thing across us. Just how if I was standing above you and you were laying down, my shadow would be projecting onto you. And it would probably be a little bit weird if I was standing over you, but it would be having some sort of an effect because I am standing over you and my shadow is on you. And, you know, just some nice photos to show this man. I mean, have you ever been at a river when the sun goes down, and but it's still sunny outside and the shadow is basking it? Oh, my God. Kayaking, when that happens, is it's amazing. Wow, this is a great photo. Beautiful, man. Um, boom. Next quote. Shadows are qualitative attributes of the bodies that secrete them. They are time-dependent realms that change their contours with the, with the hour and the season. Momentary life zones where the shadow-casting mountain or boulder or body quietly envelops and fathers a range of other boundaries under its sway. And this is so cool because he's almost dissing on the haters here in the sense that he is, you know, he's trying to give life to shadows. That's what this chapter is about. We are trying to give a sense of sentient sentience and consciousness to shadows. And he's saying that there are qualitative attributes that make them some, bring them somewhat more into that sentient realm because much like us, we are time dependent and we change and we are not this, um, uh, stagnant being that's like one of the things of being existent in objective reality but also in subjective reality and in terms of consciousness and being able to lock within time and it's i just think that concept's really cool maybe reread this quote again real fast shadows are qualitative attributes of the bodies that secrete them they are time dependent realms that change the contours with the hour and the season momentary life zones where the shadow casting Mountain or boulder or body quietly envelops and fathers a range of other boundaries under its sway. So kind of getting into the same concept we were just talking about. And, you know, and that's what I'm trying to show with these photos here is that we are, shadows have life. Like there is a sense of life. That's why we call it the shadow, you know, our shadow self. And like, 
for the photo, you know, photos like this are exist and movies and shadows are used because we have some weird connection to the shadow and maybe because it's always with us or maybe it's because of all these other things that we've already talked about. So the last quote of the presentation beyond a certain degree of astonished gawking and, the, and, and, um, Abrams is talking about stargazing to everyone who hasn't done the reading yet. Um, uh, we're talking about stargazing here and people who are sitting down looking at the stars like this in a prone, either standing or sitting position. By a certain degree of astonished gawking, our necks begin to hurt and our legs begin to buckle. Typo. Our bodies long to lie down horizontal on the earth. We lend ourselves to gravity, becoming adjuncts of the ground itself. Only by thus renouncing the vertical stance, dropping away our upright individuality and leaning back upon the earth, Letting our gaze become the gaze of the earth itself, do we make some sense of the endless depths in which earth dwells? For those depths are not our habitat, they are earth's, and so it's only by unfurling our limbs and settling back into the body of earth that the night sky becomes for us a steady comfort and a womb. And I mean, that's some fire right there if I've ever read it. So let's, let's. Oops. Let's hop on into this beyond a certain degree of, so when we lay down, <laughs> there's an ice cream chuck outside of everybody. I was like, what is that? Um, when we go and lean back, our gaze becomes the gaze of the earth itself. Do we make some sense of the endless depths in which the earth dwells? Because we are starting to see the gaze in the totality of the earth. And if the earth is conscious or not conscious, but the earth and its shadow and its shape has its own concept and sentience too. For those depths are not our habitat. They are earth's when we are looking up at the sky. And we can't look at that forever. We eventually have to lay back and fall asleep because it is so profound. It becomes... Only by unfurling our limbs and settling back into the body of earth that the night sky becomes for us a steady comfort and a womb. And that's so crazy because we are now resting, letting the earth take over for us. Now it's the earth's job. We have been observing and doing all this stuff for the shadow. Now it's time for the earth to observe itself. You know, and that might be reaching a little bit. Let me know in the comments if that's reaching. And, you know, just some com nice photos to end. I mean, it's so nice stargazing. Anyone shout out? Anybody see the meteor shower that happened a couple weeks ago? I think in um, early August. I can't. It started with a P, whatever it was called. I was up in Wyoming. Saw some crazy meteors. Haven't seen that many, like, sitting out there a couple hours, man. Saw some crazy ones. And that's it. So let's talk about the assignment and the homework, everybody. So spend a day observing your shadow during morning, moon, noon, and sunset. Spend a couple minutes or a lot more, hopefully, appreciating, reflecting, playing, and being at present and being present with your shadow. Make sure you do this before journaling, everybody. And you can move on in the series if you need to. Like pretend you can't do that for a day and you want to keep going, then you know, read more and watch more. But before you journal and submit the assignment, you know, make sure you're doing this right. This isn't for me. I don't care if you complete this. You're not getting anything for completing this. What you're getting is hopefully something for you. This is for you. Then um, make application of these principles in the field are what changes the nature of this book from just being a book to actually something that changes your life. Submit a 100 to 200, excuse me, word, I should say, 100 to 200 word journal reflection that combines your experience with what you learned in the chapter. And the optional bonus is write in the same style David does during the first couple pages of the chapter. Notice his use of verbs and descriptive words instead of pronouns. This is the core of good nature writing. Quick example of that. Let me pull open the book real fast. Um, just, I haven't even picked out a passage, but he does it the whole time during the first couple pages. Um, The sun gaze grows fainter still. Soon it's possible to stare back at it without wincing as it slowly slips behind the ridge. A final glare, a flaring gleam between the two trees silhouetted on that ridge. And then the sun is gone. And you could say, I watched the sun gaze grow fainter. 
And then, you know, I'm st it's staring back at me and wincing. You could say all that and that's what's kind of going on, but you don't have to do that. And like I said, challenge yourself to do that. Maybe don't even use a pronoun the whole time during this journal entry if you're going to be talking about your experience. Uh, but I would like you guys to um, do what you learn, but then what he also talked about. Some of these concepts we were talking about being about being consumed by the mountain and where uh, where does dark the shadows go in, in darkness. All these things we've talked about. You know, talk about a little bit of both because your personal experiences aren't going to help you on the book report. So that is all, everybody. I will see you guys in Chapter 3. That will be dropping soon. Thank you guys for being here. Good luck on everything. Peace. Shout out to all my students in the Spiritual Ecology course hosted by the Lit University. It's your boy Ian, aka the Lit Professor, here today to drop another lesson. So for all the first time viewers out there, Spiritual Ecology is about creating a more spiritual relationship with nature. And you guys can go to the link in the description below and join the course if you like or get more information about it. It is a free course. It is a complete deep dive that has, unlike anything that has ever been done before into the topic and I'm going to be judging not judging excuse me editing and reviewing your essay submissions for free till the end of time so boom today we are covering and shout out to everyone else now all my students how are you guys doing say what's up how are you liking the course um, a couple people have already signed up and submitted a couple journal entries and it's been really fun so today, though, we are covering chapter number two in David Abrams' Becoming Animal House. And this is where things were starting to get a little woo. The, I like to call it the eco, eco la la. <laughs> so I would like to start, though, with a quick poem by uh, Meng Hao John, who is a Chinese wilderness poet, who, wilderness poet who lived in the 7th and 8th century. And it's titled Sent to Chow the Palace Reservoir, Reviser. Excuse me. You polish words in rue-scented libraries, and I love in bamboo leaf gardens. A recluse wandering every day the same winding path, home to rest in the quiet. No noise anywhere. No noise anywhere. A bird soaring the heights can choose a tree, but the head soon tangles impetuous goats. Today, things seem becoming thoughts felt. This is where you start forgetting the words. This is where... You start forgetting the words. Boom. There it is, everybody. Meng Hao John was writing doper poetry than most people are writing in 2021. Uh, but that's a story for a different day. And this is I, – I, the reason I brought this in is because the Chinese wilderness poets do the same thing David Abram does. And I would recommend you guys do, especially if you guys are trying to write – beautiful prose that will reach the masses. If you're trying to write for academic journals that nobody reads so that you can, you know, that's a different story. But let's let's examine this. You polish words in rue-scented libraries, and I, and I. So we have two personal pronouns there. And then suddenly, we move into like mid-personal. Mid mid, mid that's not even a term, but a recluse. So that's a, what, like a third person? A recluse wandering every day the same winding path. So now we've moved out of the personal. And now we've lost the personal. And then at the end, it kind of comes back. Today, things, but this is where you start forgetting the words, but forgetting the words. So we've moved completely into nature. And we could see in the middle uh, the referential of nature a bird soaring through the heights can choose a tree. This is what David Abrams is doing. Once again, we're going to keep talking about this. And I would recommend doing this. It's almost like you ascend. We start with the, the first lines and it connects with us emotionally because it's personal. And then we move up into nature and then we move back. We, you know, ride this energy and we're riding this wave of moving. Um, so for example, if you're writing an essay, you could start with a uh, an essay, you know, academic essay or a blog post, you could start with something tangible for the audience. You could start with something asking them a question or, you know, making a statement. But then you can move into more prose. You can weave some prose in there, even through in academic lines, you know, by using things like color or um, gerunds. 
And then you can bring it back down again into the personal and the academic, and you can kind of float it. And that's what David Abrams does at the start of literally almost every single chapter as we see this writing, and let's, let's refer to the text here. My right hand is reaching for a book. Fingers are opening, stretching toward the binding, and suddenly the tome is climbing into my hand. So my, we start with a my, my right hand. But then fingers are opening, stretching toward the binding. Why doesn't he just say, I, I got the book. My, I, I reached for the book. I got the book in my hand. Because that doesn't sound as good, but a lot of people write that way. But in, especially in informal settings where they don't think it matters, like a blog post, for instance. But being able to use, we're seeing um, this nice verbiage, stretching, opening. Look, he's using gerunds. He used three gerunds. In two lines. It's like gerunds are a secret tool, everybody, that you should be using more, more of. And so, there, you know, there's not too much to say about the first couple pages. I'm just going to let those speak for themselves. But on page 27 in my text, we hear, we see, boom, and we got a nice house here, everybody. We're talking about the house. Where are you right now? Let, let me know where you guys live. Where, where are you guys tuning in from? Like, how are you in an apartment? In what city? Are you living out in your art? Are you driving around in an RV? Got a house? What, what's going on, everybody? I'm broadcasting live from Las Vegas, Nevada right now. Uh, I kind of live in Al Alpine, Wyoming and Las Vegas, Nevada. Hopefully, New Mexico sometime soon or Arizona. That would be dope. So, 27. This, this sitting on chairs is a strange new thing for the primate body. Holding our hindquarters away from the ground, our flexible spine suspended in air, civilized to be sure, yet how much more nourishment our spines once drew from their off-renewed relationship with the ground. And I'm just going to do a shameless plug here because by the time you guys see this, but I run a thing called Yoga for Authors, and it's also Yoga for Readers. And it is so important, first of all, to move your body and get off chairs and onto the ground or onto a surface. Standing desk, desk, I literally sit on a desk. I have four yoga mats on a, on a desk. I sit on a desk so I can do butterfly pose and you know wide-legged forward fold and hip stretches and back stretches because chairs are so limiting. So... Reconnecting with the earth is something that um, in the, I guess, biohacking community has been called grounding. And so we, scientific studies have shown that there is mood improvement and uh, less cortisol release if you stand on the earth for a certain amount of time. Have you ever been out to a park and walked around or you live someplace where it's temperate all year and you can put your feet on the earth? There's a certain, re a certain resetting of the body that happens when you do that. And it is very important to put your feet not on cement, not be not with animal souls covering it, covering between you on the earth. And I know a lot of people live in winter climates and they can't do that for eight months a year. And I just kind of heard an interesting theory about how most of the earth should honestly be living 30 degrees above and below the parallel. But that's a different story that, you know, why are we living in these harsh environments? It's really because of stubbornness that our ancestors just didn't move because like, you know, being able, the eternal spring does exist in certain places, San Diego, you know, <laughs> and you know, the, a lot of places in North America, you know, for instance, like California are already bought and sold out. But, you know, if we could, anyway, that's a different topic, though. So there is this concept, though, of gravity. And that gravity, we think, is a drag upon our aspirations. It pulls us down, holding us back, makes life a weight and a burden. And gravity is an interesting thing because gravity is such a powerful force in our life. Most people talk about the heart, right? The heart is a pump, but the heart is actually not a very powerful pump. There's actually 10 other ways that, um, are, that are stronger pumps of blood than the heart. One of them, the strongest being is gravity. So put your arm above your head. If you leave it there for a while, you can already probably start to feel the blood go down. If you leave it there for a while, but gravity is pushing blood down your arm, but the heart can't push back up and defeat gravity. Thus, you know, it being a stronger pump of blood than the heart. So I think it's actually kind of interesting that he starts to mention gravity here and us being sit, sat down in these chairs. And we gravity is a word that starts with the G, G-R. What are some other G words? You know, one that I like to, that I made the connection with just for fun is gnosis. So gnosis is knowledge. Knowledge, where does knowledge come from? And if we want to get all hierarchical or get a little spiritual, maybe from nature, from some, there's a chain of knowledge coming down. But when it reaches us, there's the G, gravity. It is ground, grave, 
um, even gender, you know, these really, you know, gender is fluid, but, you know, these more solid components to life all start with G. And it's very inter interesting. Um, the Language Crystal by Lawrence William Lyons. Really weird book. A lot of really wacky stuff in there. Check that out, though. If you want to get more into letters and this whole G, I didn't really, I, I remember this from years ago when I read it. So, gravity, though, pushing us down. And he makes an interesting con connection to that in the sense that he talks about eros and desire and love love of ourselves and love of others leads to the love of the earth, which is kind of a crazy concept. And we, when we talk about love, we are falling in love. And if you've ever been in a whirlwind love before, um, that's what it feels like. It's like you forget who you are and it's like you're falling down. It's like, ah! You know, it, it gets crazy. I can't remember. Bro, I've made so many mistakes when I've started like dating a person, like in those first couple weeks, like in university classes or like just like my life becomes a, in a shamble. And I, when I watch my friends, when I see like my friends go, roommates go through that, it's kind of insane. And it's really about, un, so if we're talking about gravity in our house, and it's interesting that he puts this in there, is that, but these chairs, Like the, mag the, like the felt magnetism between two lovers or a mother and her child, the powerful attraction between the body and the earth offers sustenance, 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 I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry everybody, and physical replenishment when it's con consummated in contact. Al although we've lately come to associate gravity with heaviness and so to think of it as having a strictly downward vector, nonetheless something rises up into us from the solid earth whenever we are in contact with it. <coughs> and I'm, we're actually going to be talking about that in the field work, but there is this rising up from nature. We can, there is this co-creative relationship with nature that we can create. And there, so does nature transcend gravity? And that's a freaking mind blowing concept, but let me know about that. You know, let me know your thoughts on that. So let's hop into the slideshow, everybody. Enough of me going off as usual. Gravity, everybody. Ooh. Gravity. Love. Eros. Love. So let's talk about the the actual content here. David starts talking about being an Idaho. Any my any <laughs> and you know, in, in great state. Been there before. I actually was reading today that you shouldn't say that word because of all the cults that live there. That your that videos could get taken down because of that. So David's in a house there and with his wife and they actually conceive a child there and have a home birth with the midwife, which is awesome, which I would recommend for anybody out there. That's what I'm going to be doing. Not me, but my partner. <laughs> I'm going to be having a home birth. Um, but the, the big crux and the big moment here is when the child... <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. When the child leaves, so he has this daughter, and him, the wife and the daughter leave to Belgium, which is crazy, taking the daughter to Belgium. And David is riding back to the house and then gets there. And when he gets out of the car, he's excited. You know, he's a, probably been in a relationship for a couple of years and now has a kid, and he has his first time alone, <coughs> 10 days alone. And he gets in there, and the house is sharp and it feels menacing. And then he says, he realizes this pretty immediately and says, don't worry, the child is coming back. She'll be home soon because the house loves the child's energy. And then suddenly the, the house relaxes. How crazy is that? Has anyone ever had an experience like that? Because I certainly have. And one of the best ways to notice it is when you do a house cleansing. If you do a certain house cleansing or putting, put a little bit of energy in the house, the energy of the house changes. And what is that? Who knows? Because I know there's all these doubters out there and once again the doubters are addressed when david asks well why didn't the automobile have that reaction or the snowy fields i was driving past why didn't everything have that field if it was feel if it was all from my subconscious if it, was, if it was all just a manifestation then why didn't everything else have that why was it just the interior of the house that did that because we have a relationship a co-creative relationship with our house this room right here that i'm in <coughs> has wood 
it's everything in here has been derived from nature. This book that we are holding, everything has been derived at some level, no matter how far back from the natural world and our animal senses can process that it can make connections with it. Just like an animal can make a connection with their home. And what is this suburban house right here? Everybody like what the hell? I mean, what is going on here? But, um, <laughs> Good, good photos by me. Excuse me. Oh, there's love right there. Home birth, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Getting over a cold, everybody. The house knows. Have you ever done something dumb in someone's house before? <coughs> like, like been house sitting or your parents have gone out of town and like you had a party. The house almost has a visceral reaction to you. It kind of feels a little weird. There's like weird shadows. And like, even if you're living there or have spent a lot of time there, it feels totally different when the person is gone. But David is recommending, once again, we've talked about this forward creating a, maybe we haven't creating actual dialogue with the earth, with life. <coughs> when you create a dialogue with life, There is a reaction to that. Words hold power. And maybe there is something listening out there. And even if there isn't, your subconscious gets the cue a lot better when it's not stuck in the open loop vortex of your mind. So that is that section. And I think that is was pretty cool. Boom. So he also talks about beams. This is I couldn't really find a nice photo of beams, but like even the beams in the walls that I can't see or that are, are around us. David is explains about le having to leave the house and you know, having to leave a house is especially important to you. It kind of sucks. And he think he hears an intruder in the middle of the night and he goes, <coughs> and, and first of all, before we address this, don't take the easy way out. Don't, if you're going to answer this question for your journal or in the comments right now about why that reaction happens, don't use logic. Try not to do it with logic because I can tell you the logical answer right now that the subconscious and, you know, subconscious impulses in the brain feel differently and we have the sense of anxiety. Great. Awesome. But for everyone else out there, intruder in the house, there's this intruder in the house. And what happens? David goes looking for the intruder, but then he notices all the beams that he's never looked at before. <coughs> and that's one of the exercises that I actually learned at a weird Buddhist meeting in when I used to live in Portland. I only went to one time. The theme that I've always remembered from the class was to look up more, look up and observe your surroundings, things that you've never seen before. Like I'm seeing something in the corner. I'm like, what is that? And that's an easy way. Even though our animal instincts know that they're there, our, we can start to create, once again, what we're trying to do here and why the house is important. I shouldn't have mentioned this at the start of the video is that we're trying to create a phenomenological framework map for our mind. And the shadow is always present, but the house is very present in our lives too. And understanding and creating a map with our house is important. And that's what this process of David realizing what these beams are. And they all have, they all were derived from fir or pine trees or oak trees, mahogany planks, you know, that come to us, even metal. They, all these had this, journey to get to us and all the personality and we have an individual relationship with each of them and it's crazy to think about it. you don't need to have a pet beam or anything like that but starting to move toward that relationship is really going to help you create a more aware and better life and this isn't we can get into this later but being more aware is going to help you fix the problems in society and become more aware of them. One of the critiques of spiritual and deep ecology is that we're just ob not observing anything, that we're just a bunch of hippies who aren't seeing what's going on. But if, if you actually create the phenomenological framework that's being told here, you can actually create better social critiques that maybe if you spend a lot of time in nature too, don't have all of the trauma, don't have all of the postmodern deconstruction angst to it. To it, You know what I mean? You can actually look at things how they are and approach them in a, maybe a more creative way through nature. That's what spiritual and deep ecology gives you access to if you want that, you know, if you want to direct the energy in that way. Boom. And we just got a couple photos to end everybody. So let's talk about the journal assignment. So let's write. So you guys are going to be writing. Um, 
100 to 200 words about the chapter, your experiences of observing your house or a combination of both. You know, observe what's going on, look around for the day, have fun, even just a little bit. Look around, try to put your hand on the wall, put your hand on something and feel into it. Just meditate for 30 seconds on something and let me know what you think. Like I said, maybe David's crazy, maybe I'm crazy, but maybe you're crazy too. Um, you can also practice moving from using personal pronouns and transition into nature writing without a referential. This works in poetry, prose, and nonfiction. Boom, I, I really talked about all this, and I'm excited to read these. I said at some point I wasn't going to read these, but I actually really want to. All the ones that were submitted, of course, I was going to read the first people, and you know they were so fun to read that I want to read everybody else too. So I can't really edit that out of the first video if I did say that, but... I am going to be reading all the journals, even though they're automatically graded because they are just so fun to read. So that is it for today. I wanted to keep it a little bit more brief. I didn't, you know, the start was kind of long, but the content was pretty short. Thank you guys for being here. This is the Spiritual Ecology course. I'm signing out. Peace. Shout out to all my students in the Spiritual Ecology course. Thank you for everybody who has joined so far. We're already up to 10 people in the course who've signed up for the course. People have been submitting journals. And once again, this is a free course and you can join by clicking the link in the description below and you can get more details there or in the introduction video, which is also on the YouTube channel. So today we are covering chapter three, Wood and Stone in Becoming Animal by David Abram. And, you know, this chapter is so cool that I actually made a typo on the first uh, slide and I called it a rock because really the, the peak of this chapter for me is when Abram's Trice, I mean, I think does a great job of showing that rocks aren't just inert matter, but animate beings. So <laughs> I just said rock. And the chapter starts with David taking his daughter out, or is, they're outside and you know, listening to coyotes. And it brings up this conversation of awareness. And what what is awareness? That's what we are trying to actually build here with our phenomenological uh, workspace that we're building, uh, this framework from ground up and understanding things like rock and even where awareness comes from is important. And David talks about one of the main things he talks about in this chapter is the twofold consciousness that develops after, you know, we're separated from the womb. But when we're separated from the womb, we don't join consensual reality immediately because we don't have language yet. We are in the world of ideas and feeling. For even a, while, a couple of years, even if we do acquire language, we don't have enough language or enough maybe capacity to divorce nature like what, what I'm sure you know happens. And... What kills a child's connection with language is the, the verbal arts, and not just verbal language, but the language of our civilization, of consensual reality, and it's um, breaking with nature. And this started to happen in uh, the Middle Ages with Christianity and Islam, uh, mostly, and in the literature, and uh, we'll get into more of that later. So let's quote, do a quote. Such a lesson amounts to a denial of much of the child's felt experience and commonly precipitates a rupture between her speaking self and the rest of her sensitive and sentient body. Yet the pain of this rupture is quickly forgotten by the speaking self. There are more than enough discoveries and distractions to offset the trauma of this self-estrangement. Since accepting and abiding by this odd lesson unlocks the gate to the curious universe that all the grown-ups appear to inhabit. But... The breathing body, this ferociously attentive animal, it still remembers that world. We still remember that world. And what are we gonna what are we doing to go back to that world? And that's what this course is really about. It's trying to mend that wound. And that's what and this gets into so many different things. Autoronk trauma theory that I've talked Autoronk trauma theory that I've talked about on this channel before. Uh, Julian James book, which we talked about last time, and even meteors, even meteors hitting Earth and um, fracturing our consciousness from this unity consciousness because of trauma and pain and recovery and, you know, tr tribulations. Once again, that that's what, that, what how, but the initial thing that happens in our society before all of that, 
and maybe it's a manifestation of all of that, is the verbal disconnection with nature. And let's get into that right now. And once again, it starts with the verbal, man. And we're doing it every single day. If we actually, you know, people have talked about the language of our society and how it's patriarchal. And, you know, and this has come up more. But when we start talking about language being specious, speciesist and anti-nature, it's a little bit harder to pinpoint because it's really, if I'm, you know, if you're being degrading to someone, that's pretty easy. But being de degrading to nature happens all the time and no one thinks about it. That's our whole society is being degraded to nature. I mean, if we don't even have uh, rights for people of color and for women yet, I mean, and we do, right? We, we have rights and everybody has inherent rights. But if, you know, there's still discrepancies then and, and lack, uh, excuse me, who cares even about discrepancies? But how about just lack, a lack of consciousness about alternative points of view and alternative um, cultures and stuff and just deep prejudices that still abide in our society. And we have to conquer a lot of, and David would argue differently that we need to conquer our, pro our axiomatic problem with nature first. Instead of worrying about all that, we need to heal our relationship with nature, which will then heal all of that. And that run that theory runs into problems when you start thinking of people like Ted Kaczynski and um, even the Third Reich and fascism that proliferated in Europe because a lot of them, as as um, Murray Chupkin or whatever, um, excuse, in the essay Social Ecology versus Deep Ecology, a lot of the shamanic practices actually can get manipulated into really crazy things. So, you know, th th this worldview is very... It rides a fine line, this worldview that Abram is pushing, because the shaman turned into the monarch and the priest turned into the dictator. And there's certain talents when it comes to phenomenological observation, we'll say. And people are going to be, I guess, upset if some people are better than them, so they're, or other people are going to use that to put themselves in a hierarchical chain, which we'll talk about in a second. And, you know, things start to get bad and people are start to get oppressed through even worldviews such as this. They're very nice about nature and it could, you know, get into, you know, one of the favorites is, you know, there's this, and there one group of people is better than another. And that's, it's, it's all just a false, false narrative. So once again, the verbal and, you know, and it's also weird that we give children, Give children dolls because if we let children connect with animals and plants by themselves, if we don't have this divorcing of language and we don't say that, you know, the, the, the coyote can't talk or Gen Genie the cat can't, you know, communicate with you or rocks that aren't real. And we can do, you know, we can treat things and cut down forests and make gravel pits and there's no worries. But even if we, if we don't even include any of that, good or bad, but we let them just connect They'll find out the differences, but they're going to do that, as Abram says, through feeling rather than through language. So then the divorcing is going to happen. The differences are going to manifest anyway, because as they get older, they're going to be like, this cat can't talk to me. And, you know, this is, we need wood to, to live. And we need, you know, there's certain things that are required to live. And, you know, and that would require death, death of things in nature or transition. But I think that's just such a cool concept of I didn't have that. You didn't have that. Most people never had that. Even people who lived a very natural life never even, you know, were probably raised in a religious household. And I would like to talk about, oops, a little bit out of order, a book that explains this, I think, in a very good way. This is one of my favorite books. We're going to be doing a Robert Bly course soon, but I would recommend you get started on this now. It is News of the Universe, Poems of Twofold Consciousness, a collection of poetry from around the world. And I think this is separated into four or five chapters. And Bly explains this breaking from nature in our language because it was around in Beowulf and he's been Chaucer, but eventually he shows and shows the examples of the prime poets of, you know, Christian poets divorcing us from nature. But then he shows our our recovery, our recovery with people like William Blake and the early modernists, then the um, the, the midwave uh, poets from the 40s and 50s, and then um, now a more diverse cultural. Uh, there's two sides, but there's like more experimental nature poetry, and then more of a diverse cultural um, indigenous poetry that has come about. And one of the poems, and 
of course I'm going to pick, um, I mean, one of the OGs in the game is Rilke. Uh, Rainer uh, Marie Rilke, and this was translated by Robert Bly, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this one for us later. When the god, needling something, decided to become a swan, he was astounded how lovely the bird was. He was dizzy as he disappeared into the swan, but his deceiving soon pulled him into the doing. Before he had a chance to test all the new feelings inside the being, and the woman, open to him, recognized the one soon to be in the swan, and she knew what he asked for was something which, confused in her defending, she could no longer keep from him. He pressed closer and pushed, and he he pressed closer, and pushing his neck through her less and less firm hand, let the god loose into the heavenly woman. Then, for the first time, he found his feathers marvelous, and lying in her soft place, he became a swan. And lying in her soft place, he became a swan. Can't even, you know, begin to tell you how beautiful of a poem that is. And we're going to be doing a real course eventually, too. But, you know, think on that, everybody. If you want to journal about this, you can even journal about this because, you know, I'll love to read a little bit of Rilke. You know, <laughs> anything, anything, to, you know, read about Rilke, I'll do. But it there we are a part of nature, no matter how far we get with AI and with anything, we are not going to separate. And Abram says, quote, it seems unlikely that our ancestral lineages could have survived the animistic sensibility were if, if the animistic sensibility were purely an illusion, if this experience of the sensible surroundings as sensitive and even sentient were a, a callow fantasy, utterly at odds with the actual character of those, of, of those surroundings. We, we, if we didn't have this connection, if we didn't understand the world as being animate and being alive and being able to create a co-creative experience with nature, would we have made it through the dark forest? Would the human animal really have evolved? And I would say no. And if you agree, then that part of us is actually a part of our lineage, just as much as languages or poetry or music, love, sex, food, friends, um, loving nature. That connection with nature and trusting nature, a playful, loving, trusting connection with nature has always been a part of us. And being able to regain that, it's going to be re regaining something that has been lost to us in this world, in these, in these houses. And once again, like David said, Marcus Aurelius, you can tap into, but this is what Marcus Aurelius said, you don't need to go to the beach, you can tap into it all in your own mind. And that's, you know, that's true. And that's more of an Eastern uh, line of thinking. And, you know, what really the problem is, is, and is that David calls it the great chain of being, the great hierarchical ladder that we start to put ourselves in. When we say, you know, the forest in these trees, they're, they're pretty deep. And us humans are at the top, and then maybe like dogs, then cats and cows, and, you know, animals like that. Mon probably monkeys actually goes, probably goes humans, mo primates, and then probably the dogs. You know, whatever order you put it in. But... In these dark forests, we didn't forget about something. We didn't forget about the stone, everybody, not the rock, the stone. And what is the stone to us? A lot of people laugh at this. I've heard so, you know, I've been in, in I mean, I have been in probably in less, less than 15 crystal shops, but in a couple times that I've been in crystal shops, someone drags their boyfriend, their husband, their son, and it's always a guy and they, they're always saying, this doesn't do anything. Why, why are you? Do, why are you doing this? It doesn't matter if it one if it does something. It's it's about acknowledging and understanding the eminent nature of the mineral kingdom and developing a relationship with the mineral kingdom. I don't know if this one of these crystals in this room that I can't find right now has any type of effect on me, but I do know that it's from the earth and it does have a place and a consciousness at some level. And that's what David starts to argue here. And this is where we get into ro the proving rocks sentient. Is the debate between matter and it's not even it is a debate if matter is animate or if it is inert. But when we move into the framing of it being animate, we unlock a whole different world and why not exist in that world what do you get about being logical like i said when people start making cults and being superstitious that's a problem but that can be 
that can be blocked with critical thinking, with, you know, skills in our society. And I understand people wanting to get rid of superstition and thinking like this at all because people are dumb and it would probably be the best for us, but we're going to lose so much. So think of a, a rock that you can sit on. It, it helps you. It is a part of your reality, a, a rock in your yard or a, a rock at a, at a place. Um, like I'm thinking of a rock right now at the desert, uh, Sek- Sekhmet Desert Temple that I really like to sit on and read on. I've done it multiple times in my life. That is a place and a, and it's always going to be there unless a bulldozer comes. And how hard is it for humans to stay in one position? Like I've done, there's actually a couple of yoga moves, kind of more old school yoga and yin yoga. Has anyone, anyone, has anyone ever done yin yoga? Check out Yoga for Authors also on thelitunderground.com, everybody. But yin yoga is one of my favorite types, but it is freaking hard to hold a position for five minutes doing, you know, a stretch. You, you start to see and talk to the demons after a couple minutes in your head. <laughs> you know, you start to think, you start thinking of, uh, Memories and thoughts that you haven't thought in 10, 12 years. You're like, did I really do that? Like, oh my God, it's good. This is just exists in the recesses of my own mind. Like, I remember one time I just laid out a huge fart, man, at this job I was working. I was working security at some VIP event and I was just ripping these big farts. And like, people were leaving the room because of them. I like, they're like, oh my God. Like, what is that smell? Did someone poop their pants? And then on the other day when I was doing yoga, I remembered it. But it is hard to hold yourself there. And looking at these rocks as just being dead and not having this fortitude, this steadfastness that is so much deeper than what humans can even understand or experience locks you off to a whole different world. And it's a world that can even start to get magical, spiritual. And, and it can blow your mind because this can be actually tested. For instance, I sometimes meditate with two uh, quartz uh, wands and they're like quart- big quartz points. And I have one in my left hand that's pointing up and then my right hand pointing down. And that's to because, um, you know, the theory is, is that energy moves up the left side of the body and down the right side of the body. And when and a crystal then filters that energy and energizes it and enhances the process. I swear through, you know, it, not gaining me anything that when I meditate like that, and especially if I'm doing um, chakra meditation where I'm visu- visual or visualizing certain images, it gives me a 10 to 20% boost. Why is that? Is it because it's in my hand? Maybe, but after 40 minutes, I forget that it's in my hand. The experiences in the sessions, it being in my hand becomes a non-factor after like 30 seconds. Why are those sessions better? And I don't do it all the time, but it's like a really potent tool I can bring out. Once again, I don't know. Animals see rocks as part of the world. Animals get behind rocks, they hide behind rocks. They don't have a separation between rocks, but because rocks aren't this inherent part of our reality every every day, and we see them as these things that hurt our feet if we step on them, or something to decorate the yard, that separation continues to grow. And then just with all the propaganda that we get, you know, in school and stuff about the rocks not being animate, it starts to get a little bit annoying. And once again, this is just some photos of Christianity, what Christianity has done to us. And then we get into a section about Vincent Van Gogh, everybody. And Vincent Van Gogh was pretty unknown in his whole lifetime. And I was just talking about this the other other day on the Creative Muse podcast. You know, Emily Dickinson, Kafka, Melville, um, Proust, you know, as an author or a person, all you have to do is keep working. It doesn't matter if people know. It doesn't matter if what happens. But if you follow your divine purpose as an artist, and by divine, for all, for all the logical people out there, I mean your unique path that has been meditated on out in nature and doesn't have the ego involvement. Something that is not, that is larger than at least your conscious mind, you know, the ego mind, a little bit, at least a layer deeper than that, if not to infinity. And Vincent van Gogh made paintings and landscapes animate. I mean, look at this art. It starts to peel and grow and move. It starts to move. And as Abram says, when you go to a Vincent van Gogh exhibit and you leave, and I've seen uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Getty and 
the Met, you know, um, museums that I've been to, I've seen his paintings and it's true. And I don't know if it's, other, but I'm sure if you went to one of his exhibits, when you leave an art museum, your head is spinning and you see the world in a different way. It's kind of very um, psychedelic in that way. But Vincent van Gogh really pushed the limit on that. And people didn't understand. He died broke and unknown because people didn't understand. But people needed small glitches in the matrix to help their minds get the, get the idea. Just like certain changes have to come slow. I'm sure you guys know that. But stuff like this with certain movements like modernism and postmodernism, if we look in the writing world, even in um, the ecology world, you know, moving from deep ecology to social ecology, now to spiritual ecology, which I'm trying to, you know, blow up to the level of social ecology. It has to, it has to happen slow for the people to wake up. But as people start reading books and start to see it, and then people start copying it and then even surpassing it, then Vincent van Gogh just seems like it seems normal, but it's pretty profound stuff that people didn't have that idea of the world through art for, you know, at least for a while, for at least, yeah, for a while, they didn't have that idea. But when you look at cave paintings, it actually seems more animate. Like they have this animate connection with the earth or the Chinese wilderness paintings. There is that like kind of liminal space existing. So in the last thing he talks about as the big, big whopping um, argument for rocks being animal is seeing a cliff. I've seen cliffs or a waterfall in Yosemite or um, in Wyoming and Canyon in Kauai. And I had my... Oh my God, man. Like coming around a corner and seeing a certain view, it pushes you back. You literally, oh, what is that, everybody? And it still happens to us. And Abram argues that that is a real motion. We, it affects us in real space and time. That is something animate that is happening. Even though that it is there, it is making us do something. That is a pretty cool argument. He kind of calls out the people. Um, and that's it for today, everybody. We're just going to be trying to keep this, trying to keep the pace and not trying to, you know, some, I'm sure I'm going to hit an hour, you know, episode at some point, but that's not going to be today. Um, oh, and let's do the journal. Excuse me. Um, write 100 to 200 words about the chapter. If you were stuck, pick a passage from the text and write about that. Um, you can also write about the real poem, or if you want, write a bit about your fractured relationship with nature and your personal process of regaining it. You know, what you've been doing up to this course, what you want to do, what your goals are. You know, and that's, that's something you can explore here too, because this is about personal development. You can, we could keep this academic or we could kind of keep this a little um, more fun for you guys. So that is all. This is Ian, AKA The Lip Professor, Dropping out. Peace. Boom. What's up, everybody? It's the Lit Professor here today to drop another lesson on David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. And shout out to all the students in the Spiritual Ecology course who have been writing their journals, chilling, um, having discussions. And for everybody who would like to learn more about the course, you can go to the link in the description below or click on the card in the top right, probably of your uh, corner of your video screen right now. But how is everybody doing? What is up? How have you guys been enjoying the book so far? Let me know either on uh, the litunderground.com or on YouTube right now. And also like and subscribe, everybody. I know uh, this maybe doesn't have as much traction as my other courses, but I would love to have your support in that way. So once again, today we are covering chapter number four, which is titled Reciprocity in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. And how is everybody doing today? And I'm going to start maybe doing some quick summaries before we even get going to give a preview about what we're going to talk about. And I feel like these are the basic concepts taught in this chapter. Open up your senses. You are food too. We are corporal beings that are going to die and we try to avoid that. Don't hide inside. Don't hide inside in buildings or in technology or in the subatomic realm of your mind then we need to take back the language of nature which we talked about a little bit last time and then we just need to live aware as always so the first thing that we do is in this chapter 
is we talk about our hands. And I, I guess I actually didn't get any photos of the hands, so we're, we're going to have to make this full screen. And David asks us to start examining our hands. You know, when's the last time you really examined your hand? And when you touch your other hand, you're not just touching your hand, you're also receiving touch. It's a unilateral um, connection. And that's this is like such a nice, logical way of doing this. Well, first, we learned about our shadow. Then we learned about um, our house and being aware in our house. Excuse us. Then we, uh, we learned about um, why matter is animate in the last chapter. And now we are learning about our sensory perceptions because that's what it's about, man. The sound of the you know a crow cawing the sound of you know river water and rain and thunder and just the rustling of the aspen leaves that's what it's about it's about making that contact and i really haven't made that cl as clear as i have wanted to in the last you know couple of videos it's all, they've almost been too academic cuz all this is just animate matter waiting for us to grasp it everybody and that's so dope. And so our hands have this relationship. If I place my hand right now on the camera, on this computer screen, I'm not just touching the computer screen. The computer screen is touching me back. And then David gets it. And so when you're hugging trees or doing something, there actually is this co-creative connection because one, we can't say what is consciousness. Like what is the tree feeling? We can interpret, but we, it may be beyond our perception. You know, and even just as much of getting out and, you know, reading on a tree or reading outside, doing what we can to ground, to get that sense of groundedness we talked about last chapter. And this is a beautiful photo. And, you know, once again, one of the easiest ways is to put our feet on the ground. And Abram says, my feet are like ears listening downward and a dark rhythm rises into me from this contact, a pulse that slows down and deepens the private beat within my chest and this is a proven scientific fact that grounding actually does have an effect on the body and slows down the heartbeat super cool stuff look into it, everybody and apparently there's such thing as grounding mats that simulate that if you like live in a winter place or like can't do it i don't know too much about that i've never needed one because i live in you know a climate that i can go outside every day of the year I, I it snows once maybe one time and it melts the same day, you know, every three years or so. So <laughs> unlike other places. So, you know, shoes are a joke and I would check out minimalist footwear. There's a lot and you don't maybe need to go as extreme as the Vibram five fingers. But, you know, minimalist footwear is the first step because then your foot is formed to it. And then it's about getting used to walking barefoot because our feet get trained like this summer in Wyoming, for instance, when I first got out there, um, and I was walking around barefoot all the time. It hurt a little bit. But by the end, I could walk anywhere. And unless I stepped on a really jagged rock, you know, it didn't hurt. And let me know your experiences with that. Have you ever done that? Have you felt your feet getting trained? So once again, check that out. I have a pair of um, shoes that I actually don't remember the name of right now. But maybe I'll post a link in the description. I'll be talking about it on Yoga for Authors too. I also wear Vibrams. Uh, flat top shoes are sometimes better too if you have to wear something. Uh, with laces like high tops and of course if you need um, transition in you know a slow way even over the course of a year don't go running don't go hiking especially if you're using you know a running uh, running shoes or hiking shoes hiking boots if you're going backpacking always bring a real pair of shoes and be used to those also um, you know don't don't make dumb decisions everybody we are not exempt from this economy, though, of, of nature. You know, we, are, we can act exempt all we want. We can, you know, put our souls on the ground. And, but we are food. And David is asking us to settle into this role, to settle into this role of becoming animal, of understanding our spot in this evolutionary chain. And there is no solace, everybody, in the subatomic realms, in the realm of science. It's over. And we're just gonna, I'm just going to blow all this right out right now. Science is a monastic practice. But how can you translate that back to the natural world after pretending the natural world doesn't exist through how your experiments have to be 
uh, done all day. We talked about being in an art exhibit and, you know, leaving and your consciousness has changed. But if anyone has ever engaged in um, ma a mathematics course or a science course, it alters how you think. It alters how you feel. There is a separation. You kind of get that weird. If you ever, you know, the science and uh, math majors at college, and if you're science majors, they look a little bit more, um, their skin, as he says, feels a little bit less connected, a little bit more shriveled. And I have felt that, like I said, just in science class and mathematics class, I can't imagine doing that full time. And once again, I'm not saying that this is, it's actually not wrong to do this, but it is a monastic thing. And the problem starts happening when we start referencing the world through subatomic realms, when these people come out and then that perception has not come back to nature. And we're going to talk about this more. And David talks about, um, this guy looks like the type of guy that would dis dissect a frog. Uh, he talks about dissecting frogs and feeling like they came from a local area, but it doesn't really matter where they came from. And he asked for permission, and that was okay. And, and before we even go any further, if you guys have made it this far, thank you. Th this chapter is titled Reciprocity. And creating a relationship with reciprocity is basically what all the field work is going to be about. That word reciprocity, I love that word, is give, take, pull, push, because we are going back. We are going to give eventually, but we can start now. And the discernible effects, I think, are, are noticeable, you know, in sense of magic. But I think on a very logical scale, it's an acknowledgement of death in, with a physical action. What other physical action can you do other than saying, I'm going to die one day? Other, if you go out and you give something to nature and say, this is going to be me one day, you know, I'm doing this now, that's actually probably a pretty mellow and humbling experience. It's like uh, the slave talking, whispering in the uh, someone, uh, the person who is having a Roman triumph like Caesar and saying, you are mortal. mortal. They're whispering, they would whisper in their ear so their ego didn't get too inflated. That didn't really work in Rome, everybody. That's not maybe working in our society either. And so these small battles, though, like, for instance, he's talk, he talks about a, dissecting frogs or the physics professor talking about how, you know, the world is like the, this chair is not solid, and I, but it only, is, only holds us, me up because I'm per, uh, solid also or perceived solid. And functioning in that way, these are all little battles like biology and geology. There's all these different fields, and each one of them is great and you know innovative and needs to continue. But when it's given to us, the general public, without these uh, this ancillary knowledge or without warning, then we create a total disconnection, and all these small battles lose end up with us losing the war, and then having to do climate protests and like all these different things that, and using politics to get. An awakened consciousness of people, which isn't going to work in the long run. There is only one solution, and there has been only one solution. Your 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 local, like my local park, got destroyed. I mean, not destroyed, but renovated and commercialized. You know, park of eighty years, historic park without any renovations. You know, that 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 has fallen. You know, it's sad to say, but I let that fall. We let that fall. We could have done a better job of awakening the constituents of my area to that if I actually wanted to save that. I should have known, obviously, that that was going to happen as soon as I was, I was 15. I had 12 years to figure that out, to actually do something about that, and I didn't do anything about it. And they actually snuck the bill through, and by the time we were protesting and had a protest out there, it had already been signed and sealed. It had gone through a year ago and no one even knew about it because no one was actually reading what was going on within these documents. Who cared? You know, people were reading, but not people would glance over them and be like, all right, hay barn, hay barn for 500 person weddings in the middle of a, of a public park, whatever. But until, you know, it actually got, you know, started get, starting to get going. People didn't notice, and that's one of the problems. See, this is where we're always behind. We're always going to be behind unless everybody 
is hip to this. And if not everybody, even 10% of people, that's all it takes. Only 10% of people participated in the American Revolution in any capacity. That includes women, children, helping in any form of way. I, don't quote me on that, but I've heard that. And I believe that, that a lot of people you know, don't participate in stuff like this. So let's, let's, let's hit some quotes up. Let's look at some of these photos, and, you know, and do you really, and something I always ask is examine the people who are involved in the certain field. If you are a, someone who is doing this for a living or wants to do this for a living, first of all, you're probably not going to aid in like your potential is probably much greater than the job, but do you want to be in these rooms? Do you want to be doing this forever and examine people who've been doing it for 20 or 30 years and then exam pit them against other people other passions of yours and people who did that for 20 or 30 years maybe to less financial success or maybe more but literally feel them in the flesh and see how they feel to you and it's th this community feels cold and stunted and i know that has to partly do with the people that are attracted to that but that's exactly it and the environment and the led lights and the glasses and the white coats it's it, it all has a sub a subconscious effect and like i said if you're going to go into this to make a change if you want to help the world with science that is fine but don't don't go don't go halfway and then try to go halfway or full into nature because you're going to be it's like running with like a hundred a 200 pound vest on like let that let that go you don't you don't need to bring that along with you i know i'm speaking to the choir but maybe that one person 10 years from now who is doing this will be motivated from this and if you know people, man, it's sad to see what happens. That's all I have to say. Scientists for the future, everybody. Subatomic realm. Frogs. Oh, I'm so sorry, everybody. I haven't been showing any of these slides. This is what I've been looking at, everybody. These are great photos, too. These are great photos. Look at this. This really um, highlights what's going on. So I'm sorry for sorry to everybody. Frogs. So quote from David Abram: My skin itself became less porous. Um, this is when he. This is a quote of when he started to, when David started to, not um, spend as much time in nature and go into the scientific world. My skin itself became less porous, less permeable to the abundant life that surrounds. Surrounds me as my conscious self steadily withdrew its participation from sensuous nature and began to live more and more in a clutch of heavy ab abstractions. End quote. Quote again. The animate nature that our senses revealed was no longer fundamental. Hence, few people seem very upset about the rapid destruction of forests and wetlands or the accelerating extinctions of diverse creatures. End quote. That's what starts to happen, everybody. Like I said, it's these small battles. It's this language. It's this battle of a language that we are always a part of. And if people go with the language. Usage is so fluid. Check out Garner's uh, Modern American Usage book and David Foster Wallace and his book, Quack This Way, if you want to learn more about that. But usage can be changed. We can be changed. There are certain words in our vocabulary that really have been manipulated for better or for worse. And, you know, one more quote, quote, to recognize this nourishment, to awaken to the steady gift of this wild sustenance, sustenance, sorry, and tells that we offer ourselves in return and tells that we accept the difficult mystery of our own carnal mortality, allowing that we are bodily creatures that must die in order for others to flourish. But is this, but it is this that we cannot bear. We are too frightened of shadows. We cannot abide in our vulnerability, our utter dependence on a world that can eat us. Vast in its analytic and inceptive power, modern humanity is crippled by fear of its own animality and of the animate earth that sustains us. Boom, everybody. Beautiful quote, but it really comes back to the de denial of death, as Ernest Becker would say. Check that book out also. Very, very important book. We'll could be covering that. We can't accept our coronal mor mortal mor mortality. Same with, you know, not understanding that we're food. It all, a lot of it comes back to these problems and the non-acceptance of deaths and infl can inflate the ego or stunt people and cause, you know, uh, projections and d certain drives that are unbeneficial for society, to say the least, that can even cause mass death. You know, abandonment issues, a lot of this starts coming back to 
the denial of death, though, and even the artistic impulse, as Otto Ronk would say, is from the denial of death, trying to immortalize ourselves through, um, you know, through our works. That's, that's, but we are immortalized through nature, you know, last but not least. And so it starts, everybody, with make, creating a language of love because, you know, language reform can become tyrannical, as you've maybe seen or have been, you know, no matter what side you're on. It is extreme. And if certain people, half, half of people say this, half of people deny that completely. And I think that there can be a, Hopefully, as us who are creating this new language, have the common sense not to turn this into a into a culture war, not to turn this into a heated debate, but more of a moderate tone of acceptance. Because these principles can function with most world religions. You know, the the usual suspects of resistance on on either side can be quelled. And the people, even the social ecologists who view this all as fluff, I think if they open their hearts a little bit too and, you know, maybe stop paying so much attention to current events, could accept this vocabulary also. Because it's actually kind of funny that the spiritual ecology movement is being hit from both freaking sides. The, the social ecologists and then like, you know, the conservative Christians are just running right through this thinking that it's all through um, legislation. That's the only answer. But as we've seen through all throughout history, legislation does not work. The only solution is human empowerment, humans making the right decisions. There are certain communities in America and in the world where no one gets murdered every year or, you know, robbed. You know, there are certain towns and groups of people, and that's just... And, you know, the social ecologists would say, though, that this is a financial thing that this is the from um capitalism right and you know they're they're right about that that you know but they're also not right about that so abrams lays lays out because every you know and look at this guy man this is what we're trying to do we're trying to get empowered to take back the language language empowerment equals empowerment using empowered words you know in instead of creating the separation Connection through actually verbs, using more verbs in our language. The flowing nooks and crannies of my soul connect to green mountain peaks, like metaphor, like speaking in this way. Like my girlfriend is great at this, man. Like she speaks in like these kind of, it's almost like very connected, but disconnected, but in, but um, tethered to nature. I don't know, you know, almost mystical, prophetic. And the second thing he said, and, and, you know, and that's good. That's what we need more of. That's the storyteller of old, the oral language. We are all connected, but it's just different hues. I am the wolf. I am the cactus. I am bacteria. I am, you know, but I am just a different shade right now. It's all impermanence at some level, but we also live in objective reality, Right. The language taking it back is going to feel liberating for, for us. Taking it back from logic, taking it back from even social ecology is going to feel great because now it's about showing people. A lot of this work is not going to be, is about creating this phenomenological awareness. But once that's done, tethering people in this through field work, tethering it through earth based spirituality and the likes of that, which we haven't talked about too much yet. Quote, Science, oh wait. Excuse me, everybody. That's my quote. That's my notes from earlier. While well, reading, hopefully everyone's taking notes. And I did it. Okay. So let's end with a couple quotes. And one of the problems with functioning in the subatomic realm is that there's a lot of stuff that we don't know and the people who are filling in the gaps as abram says are are the uh people who live in the subatomic realm all the time the logical logical uh you know people quote yet the manner in which they fill those vast gaps in the empirical data is inevitably shaped by the intuitions expectations 
pro, uh, proclivity, proclivities and perceptual habits borrowed from their ongoing and taken for granted engagement with the one realm that they inhabit with the whole of their animal bodies. What a sentence. A little bit campy. From this en enigmatic earthly cosmos of ground, wind and rain that commonly meets their senses as they daily go about their lives. And something I'm just noticing about this is, you know, that was a bit of a big sentence. And, you know, some adverbs, it is inevitably, you never want to see that like passive into adverb. That's, um, there's another adverb somewhere, earthly, which is fine. But once again, as a writer in your journals, try to avo avoid adverbs as much as you can, unless it's the last possible option. And, you know, this quote speaks to itself, though. But no matter what they're doing, they are still, that's what he's trying to say. They all still, they still inhabit their animal body. No matter how disconnected they are or what policy or what revelation they come to, it's all coming from that body, even if they take it for granted. One last quote, everybody, quote, these planetary structures are not ex extrinsic to human life. They're not arbitrary or random aspects of a world we just happen to inhabit. Rather, they are the cons uh, cons constitutive constitutive powers, excuse me, that are summoned us, that summoned us into existence and hence are the secret allies, the totemic guides and of all of our actions. They're as much within us as they are around us. They compose the wider, deeper life with which of which our bodies are a part. So all the structures of life and that's Abram starts to talk about how Charles Darwin actually brought us back out of this lofty angelic Christianity back to becoming animal and understanding that we actually have a lot of relation to a house cat, to these things. We actually maybe even shared a, share a lineage with them back at some level. And we don't want to acknowledge that because it's hard when we have to acknowledge death, but then, you know, we're just creatures who have clothes on who still take poops and like are freaking weirdos and are violent and angry and, you know, go ballistic. Like it's hard, but they are our secret outlets, the totemic guides of all of our actions. They, are our axiomatic consciousness. They compose the wider, deeper life of which our bodies are a part of. And I, you know, just shout out. And David actually talks about, kind of makes an anti-vegan argument at, or, earlier in the text, which I thought was kind of interesting, saying that, you know, we give and then we're going to get taken from. You know, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Like, that's kind of a reductionist argument, especially... With the slaughterhouse system, you know, billions of animals dead every year in you know, just gruesome fashion. I, I, I would prefer if we're going to take that argument, maybe a lo local grazing cow in your backyard and an elk that you kill. That seems maybe like a little bit of a better argument. But for the journal, everybody, just um, I forgot to set it right here. Uh, 100 to 200 words, as usual, either about the text or about this divide in consciousness, once again, about how to take back, there's, here's some ideas, write about how to take back the language, what you think we should do, maybe some certain words that we should be taking back. Uh, taking back. Talk about um, an experience of your skin becoming less porous. Um, do science, do too much schoolwork, do too, too much technology. Or most of all, talk about the connection between our hands and everything else, these feeling things that receive and give and have these crazy four-way relationships with what's going on. Because like, I touch a tree and the tree receives. I'm also receiving from the tree. I think it's four different ways. I touch and receive and the tree touches and receives. So yes, it's this weird four-way relationship. And then it, that expands to every other subatomic particle. But uh, write about those topics. That would be great. Thank you guys for being here. Um, looking forward to reading your journal entries. And we're getting close to being done with this book and uh, doing our book reports. So that will be great. Thank you guys for being, being here and peace out. Shout out to all my students in the Spiritual Ecology course. It's your boy Ian here today to drop another lesson on David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal and Earthly Cosmology. And everybody who's following along, hit the subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, 
leave a comment because I am trying to change the ecological consciousness of the world. And maybe the least that you can do is maybe leave a subscription because this course is not just going to be going deep into environmentalism. There are going to be hundreds of courses in the next five or 10 years covering, covering thousands of books, thousands of different topics, deep dives into everything, a mile wide, a mile deep, because I have the depth I need to become and to become and to share greatness with other people, literary greatness, hopefully, which, you know, people like David Abram give to us. So today we are talking about, I think, chapter five, depth, if not, it's chapter four, depth. And what is depth? Because we're not just talking about depth perception. We're talking about escaping the world of representations, which is even a bigger wormhole to get into. So everybody, once again, how is everybody doing? Before we get into today's presentation, maybe leave a comment, tell me how you've been liking the course or if you're new to the course, go check out the intro video if you are new to the course. You know, that'd be probably a better place to start, but each video stands is, you know, good content as a stand as standalone content. So, oops. You guys can see what's going on behind the scenes. Boom, there we are. So we're talking about depth, everybody. And this is just a quick summary and preview about what we're going to be talking about today. Depth being teaching us and showing us for us trying to build, us people, you and I, who are trying to build this new phenomenological consciousness around nature. Depth is very important. And one of the things maybe isn't seeing is easy. Once you can go out and feel and see, it does it, does it automatically. But we can't if we don't first escape the world of representations in our common non-natural life unless you're living out in the woods right now so to do that we have to develop a natural learn to develop a natural vision and when we start to do that we're going to realize that we have more energy and that our depth and our natural vision equals health that is correlated to our our body like we were talking about last chapter and last but not least, we are going to talk about going a mile wide and a mile deep with our perception because a lot of people go a mile deep and an inch wide, and that moniker is not true. That you know that will help you if you're just trying to make some money and live a you know a mapped out lifestyle. So let's get into the text, everybody. The text starts with, and we're just going to be talking about that. He 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 starts off David with a very nice section on hiking through hiking through the woods. And when he's hiking through the woods or hiking down a mountain, he starts entering the woods and he could see all the nooks and crannies. But then once he's down there, it starts getting more confusing, right? Because, I mean, I'm sure you've had this happen before, especially if you've gone romping through the woods, you don't know where you're at. And it's exciting. He said that's one of the best ways to get back into the primal consciousness is to get a little bit lost, to not know where you're at because you know I have to go down this way, but you don't know what you're going to hit. Even if you do know, you're just hoping that you hit the road. What if you're that one person that misses the road and keeps walking and then is lost? And if you're that person, just stay still and they'll find you. <laughs> and this starts to, our connection to this though, this primal consciousness as we're, this idea of us moving down and even noticing these things is eliminated by screens. And we'll get into more of that later. But the, the process though, when we're walking, so pretend I'm walking down into the forest he uses this term motion parallax, which I think is great because when you're walking past things and they're, they look like they're moving, but it's really you that's moving. Like a parallax on a website, it's really you that's moving, not them, but it appears the other way around. And this is one of these co-creative relationships with nature that nature can actually be moving too. Um, a tree can fall, birds can chirp, uh, the wind can move leaves. There's a lot, an earthquake can happen. There's a lot of different ways that earth can actually become an animate object other, but there's always this motion parallax going on with us, which I think is a really cool concept and something for you guys to notice while trying to gain this phenomenological consciousness when it comes to nature. And it starts getting world weird when we're in this world of perceptions because in represent excuse me in representations this doesn't exist and a lot of us sadly are in here right now having to live in the world of representations but and 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 the worst part of that is <laughs> sorry 
The worst part of that is that we are locked into the system, that now the system is basically here and we have been ingrained and our science and our technology and architecture and how our society is built is based around 4D models and AI and you know things that aren't, and let me explain what that field of vision is. There's a certain mystery when you enter a canyon, for instance. And, you know, and these people have lost their sense of perception. But when we enter a canyon, for instance, and I live in the desert, so you know, this is my natural terrain, you get consumed. You can't see out of the canyon. And then there's all these nooks and crannies that you can never find. Like if you look up here in the middle of the photo, these little caves and even small little caves and small little portions of canyons within a canyon that you can explore. And it's actually a really great thing. And you can actually get a lot of privacy, even if you're near a city or something in some of these canyons, because you feel like you're in your own world. There is nothing around you. And you actually are in your own, your own world. You know, and, and not being having access to canyons is it's kind of a it's kind of a weird thing to me, at least, because they're just so cool. And the depth with you in the land depends entirely where you are standing within that terrain. As you move, okay, and, and this is a quote, the depth of a terrain, the, re the relation between the near and far aspects of that land depends entirely upon where you are standing within that terrain. As you move bodily within that landscape, the depth of the, of the, of the scape alters around you. So there is this animate relationship happening around us, but we might be walking with our headphones on or thinking about other things. And that's what starts to happen is when we look at nature, if I'm out there look, looking at nature, I'm looking now at a representation of nature because nature is not something that I can look at and hold on to because it is an invisible, permeable landscape that is animate. So being able to still image that is actually a logical fallacy in and of itself, which was also a... I, I've felt that forever, but he, David is putting these things in a great way. And I, I, I got an email the other day and someone said, I already know all this. Like David, this guy is just like doing this in a pompous way and blowing it up. And it's like, maybe, yeah, let's say he is. What are you doing? You figured it out. Anyone can figure this out. Our ancestors figured all this out. All you have to do is be out in nature and dedicate yourself to that a little bit. Anyone can figure this out, but who's going to share this? Who's going to put sit their butt in the seat and write a good and become a good enough writer and you know how to market it and pitch it out there and then you need a it seems like this publisher's name is Vintage publisher to Tango and then it's got to get into our hands through a, a bookseller. You know, there's all these different steps here that you maybe don't want to be involved with. But if you want to wake up people's ecological consciousness, we have to do more things like this. Protests aren't going to do it, but having content that's accessible for everybody at any time that's fun and playful is, I think, I think the best solution. So when you see things as a representation, though, it starts to create problems. And that's what's actually happened with in the past two years with so many people being you know, remote and traveling around is that we see the Instagram culture and people driving. People are just driving from place to place and missing actually a lot of stuff in the middle. Because they just were like, wow, I want to go see all these different states in these two weeks or do all these things. And they don't realize that one, they're doing it for an aesthetic. And, you know, if they actually care, they would have been doing this the whole time. And then once 10 years from now, are they going to be doing it? The real OGs keep doing it. You're an OG because you have been in the game for a long time and never have, you know, gone away from the game. So another experience where this happens, and once again, you guys get the, the candy metaphors, is the is a full moon over the city. Have you ever been driving? This happens all the time with me in Las Vegas as I'm driving and suddenly, boom, right over, you know, the west side, excuse me, the east side of the valley, the moon is just coming up and it's like, oh my God, it's it's insane. And, you know, I'm sure you get so big and, you know, it's it's really cool sight to see over a city as, you know, nasty as cities are. It's one of my favorite things. So that's another example that David talks about. But I think his best example, which he connects to his sleight of hand um, magic is, and I've, ex has anyone ever been skiing? So this is the Tetons where, you know, I've lived and spent a lot of time. And, you know, when the clouds cover you while you're skiing, that's when deja vu happens. And you could see a whole valley and 20 minutes later, you can't see a thing. You might be able to see six feet in front of you. And you have to kind of know where you're at. And if you don't know where you're at, you're just hoping that you're going the right way. So I think that is a pretty cool concept when it comes to skiing. Um, 
that and and just in general that you could be watching a mountain as a like david was using it as a beacon of directions and then suddenly it's gone that's happened to me too i've been in my own city before and uh i used to ride my bike down to my college like i had to ride like an hour hour and a half every day through this wash and one time it was so cloudy and i was twisting through this wash and then i get out and i'm like where am i like what direction is what like i'm gonna keep following this trail but i have no idea what way north northwest and south you know all the different directions was i had a good idea but also that's happened to me when i've taken naps out in nature one time i you know took a took a little and uh took a big nap out on the ground in the desert at like one in the morning and woke up and it was all cloudy outside and I couldn't figure out where I was. I was like, I mean, I knew where I was at, but I was like, Whoa, where do I go? Cause like, <laughs> so there was lights cause I was kind of on the outskirts of town. There were lights in a, a couple different directions. So yeah. So this shape shifting is happening around all around us every single day, even in our, when we're moving through houses, there's motion parallax with cars walking past, you know, things in your neighborhood. And this phenomenological logical awareness brings us back to life. And then once we have that down, then we can begin the internal journey because the internal journey creates vertical people and not flat people. And that's what David starts to talk about is screen thinking and flat thinking. And I talk, I've talked about this in my video, um, Dragon Smoke by Robert Bly. Um, and that's on Robert Bly's essay on poetry, but he talks about vertical versus horizontal thinking. And horizontal thinkers are people who stare at the screen, who stare at their neighbors, who you know read the same books and never ascend and descend in their life because that's where all the magic happens, you know, up in the heavens and down in the hells. That's where life and contrast and metaphor grows out of. So living in a flat world and even in a flat world such as the Midwest or somewhere where you don't have that much variety or living in a city where it's all flat except the forced, forced perceptions, it starts to mess with you. And it's also actually a health issue because shifting your sight is actually good for your brain. I can, If I leave my house right now, I can see um, a bunch of mountains outside of Las Vegas and I go out every single hour and look for at least a minute or two and adjust my eyes to all the different mountains and look around so that my depth perception can get, you know, get some practice because that's what my animal senses do. Right now, the furthest I can see in this little room is only a couple feet, you know, five feet that way. That never happened when we were living in nature. That would, that's not how our eyes work as animals. We always were having variation, especially as mammals. And we're seeing this world through a world. And, you know, he had an interesting talk about focus and you know how cameras for movies do it for us automatically but when and it's up to us we have to do it but even our concept of focusing has been taken over by movies and you know i thought another cool thing was uh, a quote there's no depth between you and those creatures since you stare at them from a position outside um out, entirely outside of their world. And that's true when you're watching a nature show or something. It's never the same. You can never get that feeling. You always, I always feel a little bit weird and a little jittery when I see like the penguins or something on planet Earth or whatever weird show. You know, I'm like, I could go see this out there. Like there's Ocotillo and sagebrush and, you know, just shrubs out in my desert. That's enough for me for a lifetime. And wherever else I move, that will be fine too. And that's not to say I shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't see more. But like, whatever is there is fine. And a lot of people don't get that. And that's why a lot of people kind of live, honestly, live an odd life because they don't, they care too much about, you know, like I know, have you heard like so many people love the mountains and they want to move to the mountains or I live in the mountains, but they never go out and do anything. They have no real connection. They, they go on, you know, weekly Instagram hikes and it's a joke. And like, I hate to get on everybody, but like you guys have to make your own statement in this world. If you've experienced enough of nature, it's sad, but you have to get back into the world of flatness and try to get people out. Like that is your duty as a lover of nature. And you could be a, Thoreau, man, you could be a Kaczynski if you need to, but we don't need that anymore. Like the time is over with because eventually a couple generations down the line, there will be no more solitude and it's up to us to be able to create that. So the land never ends though. Like this isn't a scene about nature. 
you know, when we when you go out into the world, that's the other problem that people get in with perception and depth perception and flatness is that you go out here and you get maybe let's say you're in this valley down here uh, by, on the lakeshore. You look out and you can see some trees and maybe some buildings and stuff, but you can't see valley after valley after valley. So you just see this as a representation of reality, of this objective place in reality. And that's a problem. And that starts to create problems I'd like to talk about right now. So the first problem that happens is viewing the world from an outside objective angle. And that happens through screens because we're seeing screens, we're seeing this world, but we're not seeing it for what it is. We're not seeing it for its depth and what it does. And who wants to do that? Who wants to view the world from an outside objective angle? A lot of people, all the people living in suburban houses that never go out. There's this whole hundreds of millions of people just in the United States of America. Most of the people living in America are living in this objective, detached world from nature. They are not in the senses. They are not there connecting with their natural surroundings and feeling it. It's gone over their heads. I don't, you know, and I get why, because they have misaligned values and misaligned desires and impulses. With our planet as it might quote, with our planet as it might seen by seen by a transcendent god or by a surveillance satellite. That's what happens with this drone view. And when we become disembodied from screens and objective disembodied from screen through too much screen use and then start viewing the world from this objective angle, the world starts to become a per permanent in that way suddenly the natural world does not exist anymore and then it makes it easier for us to push through stuff to destroy the natural world because we are not connected with it we don't understand that the shrub and basin that we are getting you know building over here is the same at that someone in a different country different state different continent that's happening to them you know there is no hierarchy when it comes to stuff of course you know you want your area of town or whatever to not be trampled on or like you know, abused, but someone else's is. And once that happens to you, then you'll realize and be a part of the fight. Like that's happening to me right now. Like the desert I grew up in never got developed a lot of it. And now, now there's just these multi-billion dollar developers coming in from, you know, foreign countries and just, there is no remorse and it's going to be built far and wide on, on, and on territory where beautiful animals live and have lived forever. But and it goes right to the line. It's so funny that, that we have this thing called the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. And the local Native American tribe sold off the, their land to get exchanged for some other land in, in, in more in the city. And suddenly now developers can build right up to the edge of the boundary. Suddenly they can come right to the edge of the boundary. And of course there was a cash incentive in that deal. And it's like, what is the point of boundaries? Because when we have boundaries, then people are always going to build a right to the boundary. And it's sad. There's going to be little houses right until the edge of this boundary. And it's just so much space and so much love out there that I've given it, at least. Maybe, I guess no one else has. You know, I live out where they explode nuclear bombs for tests. So who knows anymore, right? Like, who knows what a valid opinion is and a value connection with nature? But it's from these people. It's from the disembodied people who are looking at topographical maps and who aren't out there. Because I'm out there every day and I don't see anyone out there um, enjoying themselves. You know, at most, there's maybe someone shooting, maybe someone off-roading. But no one's walking around and absorbing that. And, like, I'm the last defender, I guess. Like, I'm the last stand. And it's sad that I'm going to give up. I'm not going to tie myself to the tractor. Because, and I, I guess, you know, and I haven't done enough. Like I said, maybe the last video or somewhere else. I should have known that this was going to happen. This is obvious that they're going to keep building and you have to get in the fight early before it's too late. So like if you're young, if you're doing something and you know that there's a certain area, start now. Start, you know, building something, teaching people, handing out pamphlets, talking to the congressional people who are running. You know, I really don't believe in that. But, you know, if they're going to be making these moves, who owns this land? What's going to happen? Where is the line? Where is this property line that they're going to push to no matter what? Oh, man, it's freaking frustrating, man. So when we do this, as Abram says, quote, we dispel the 
track the trickster like magic of the world look at this photo in new mexico man there's a certain energy to the world everybody and when we become disembodied from it we can't actually experience it for what it is there's no mystery left then if we have this permanent view if we can use 40 vision and drones and see it and we have screens and then when we actually go out there we use it as we view it as a simulacra there is no more depth and we can't move on or live without this depth now though so it's like we have to keep moving into this world of depth if we want to continue on this technological progress which maybe i don't know why we need to do that but if we're going to it's not we're not right now we're not doing it through more of a wild mind and David talks about the concept that we dwell on earth and not on it. And I thought that was a really good way to end things that, that we don't, that the earth and depth is going to continue. And may is, and he asks, is the earth, are the clouds moving around us? Like, <laughs> is that spinning with the earth too? And I, and you know, in that last section was beautiful. The last couple pages, everybody, Go check those out. So for today's journal assignment, I would like you guys to write, first of all, as always, 100, 200 words on a certain passage or concept or something that came to you, you know, about, the, about this topic. Like if you want to write whatever you want, if you want to, that's fine. But for everyone who's stuck, I would like to talk about the changing realities in nature out there. When you're out in nature, maybe spend some time or think about when you've been out there. What is that changing, shape-shifting reality? What does that mean for you? If that had a, if you acknowledge that that had a personal impact in a positive way on your life, what would that be? How has that helped you form? What is the purpose of that in your life right now? Because that is, you know, I think a good question to ask in terms of phenomenological awareness. Because we have to see what its utility is. When we understand something utility, we'll probably be more apt to use it and understand it more. And these other ones were like, understanding your house, that seems logical, but understanding depth is a little bit more abstract, but it's not because we're starting to understand contrast and metaphor and mystery. These are all things inside us too. We're not just our outside bodies. We're not just these flat people. We have vertical depth that goes deep. And we maybe learn that through nature. We learn that in the cracks. We learn these things in the hidden realm, the okatare, hidden from the eye, right? So write about that, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. Peace. What's up to all my lovers of philosophy out there? It's your boy Ian from the litunderground.com here today to drop a dope lesson in the spiritual ecology course criticizing Descartes with the little shades of Plato, Aristotle, Schelling, Otto Rank, Jung, Hegel, Schopenhauer. We're going to get to everybody. Um, Heidegger in this lesson today. But we are talking about, first and foremost, Becoming Animal, uh, chapter 5, or I think chapter 5, maybe 6, in, cha in Becoming Animal and Earthly Cosmology by David Abram. And this is a part of the Spiritual Ecology course. And if you would like to join that, you could look in the uh, description below for a link to the course. And this is a course where I am going to be reviewing and editing all your submissions, um, written submissions about these videos and about the books and a final essay for free because I want to help you awaken your ecological consciousness because that is one of the main solutions that we need to do to help change this world. And I will honor that and honor your growth as a person. So, and as a writer and as an eco lover, I am here for you. And this lesson is going to be dope. So, First of all, and everybody else, man, if you're seeing this and you don't care about that, at least subscribe to the channel because I'm going to be covering in a better way now with better technology, better speaking skills, a book that you absolutely adore. And I'm going to be sitting here talking to you about that because I care about you and your growth as a, pe a person, even outside of this ecological consciousness aspect because I love books and I love writing. And today we are opening with a Cartesian critique that is Rene Descartes. Mind over matter. 
I think, therefore I am. And Abrams d- performs a great critique, but I would like to start with a more poetic critique by Robert Bly in his book, News of the Universe, Poems of Twofold Consciousness. And here I am, everybody, with my dog Jackson, rest in peace, um, died a couple years ago. This is an old photo, and you know, I really was in the mind. Have you ever felt in the mind with one of your pets before? But let's read a quote by Robert Bly. Let's switch to quote view. In his book, Flight from Woman, Woman, Carl Stern retells the three dreams Descartes dreamed the night before his formulation took its final shape. Descartes was about to settle on this division. The world is made of a of a rest cognitons, which Stern rephrases as thinking something that has no spatial quality, and rest extensa, a spatial something that has no psychic quality. So we would call this um, the mind and matter. Descartes in his first dream found himself trying to walk in a powerful wind, and as he walked, he was bent over strongly to his left. That is to say, physically, his left side became scrunched down, compressed, or crushed. He was surprised to see other people walking upright in the same wind. This dream is especially suggestive when we consider the recent speculation, now not so recent, reported by Robert Ornstern in The Psychology of Consciousness, that the two halves of the body respond and embody the modes of the opposite brain lobe. Space apparently locates itself in the left side of the body, and we would call this the lunar side of the body in yin yoga. And this has a lot of a lot of grounding in actually the occult. That's how we got into this. The left side of the body is more the emotional side and it connects to the right side of the brain. That's what we're talking about here. Space apparently locates itself in the left side of the body. The left side also favors feeling, music, motion, touch, in brief, the qualities that enable us to unite with objects and creatures. The right side of the body, oh crap, sorry everybody, favors the qualities we use to separate us from objects in order to get the distance necessary for analysis. Those include abstract language, concept, measurement of time, restraint of emotion, and the study of ethics and law. So, of course, that we would associate that with the right side, uh, the left side of the brain, right side of the body. Boom, here we are. We're all bent over now, walking like Descartes, our left side crushed. Our feelings lack air. The space has been pressed out. As Rilke said, everywhere I am folded. Therefore, I, I am. Therefore, there. Not therefore, I, I, I am. There I am a lie. So Descartes' first dream seems to have been a sort of prediction of what would happen. Not only to himself, but to the entire society. And I'm talking about this because, and reading this long quote, because the Cartesian reality that we are in, ladies and gentlemen, four minutes and 40 seconds into this video, or five minutes, is insurmountable. This thought process has seeped into our soul, into our hair, everywhere around us. And we need to understand this and critique it and move past it if we are going to move past it into a more loving consciousness because Descartes' idea is necessary. This division had to happen. We can't go in with innocence. There has to be a sight, a break. There has to be a trauma. But we are here right now trying to mend that trauma, Ronkian style though, which we are going to get to in just a minute. Descartes woke from this dream, wrote it down, and tried to interpret it according to his philosophy. He then fell asleep and this time saw fiery sparks floating in the room. After his second, this second dream, he got to sleep with difficulty. In his third dream, some terrifying things happened. A book disappeared from his hand. A book appeared at one, at one end of his table, vanished, and appeared at the other end. And the dictionary, when he checked it, had fewer words in it than it had a few minutes before. I suspect that we are losing some of the words that inhabit the left side. Our vocabulary is getting smaller. The disappearing words are probably words such as mole, ocean, praise, whale, steeping, bater, wooden tub, moist cave, sea wind. Damn, everybody. Robert Bly just killed it because that is what's lessening from my language. If you are reading this course, you understand that. The published works of our era, unless we're getting it, like I said, the outliers exist, but are becoming more city-like, becoming more flat. They are not seeping out the words and life of consciousness because our brain is connected to nature, everybody. I'm sorry. We can access this infinite portal of imagination and we are not being honored through the publishing houses and even the writers who are trying to write today with that po- infinite potential of consciousness. I don't know why. Maybe you have some speculations and want to say something in the comments because you can say what you want in the comments and I will respond in a kind and loving way. Boom. There it is, everybody. Where are we in reality? 
What kind of reality are we living when we are all bent over, our left sides all scrunched? That's what's happening. What? Do, I'm not even going to get into yoga for author stuff, but check that out on thelitunderground.com to help liven your body, everybody. Because let's talk about a quote from the actual text. And there's going to be a lot of quotes today, and this is going to this is going to go deep, everybody. So I hope you're along for the journey because we are talking philosophy. Shall we prolong the painful split between mind and body by continuing to neglect our carnal entanglement with this immense presence? Or shall we finally heal that age-old wound by acknowledging Earth's implicit involvement in all of our experience as a solid ground that supports all of our certainties and the distant horizon that provokes all of our dreams? That was by David Abram. And then Novalis, quote, The seed of the soul is where the, the inner world and the outer world meet, where they overlap. It is in every point of the overlap. Boom. Even even the poets know it, everybody. So let me prepare my notes. So we have entered Newton's sleep, everybody. After the Cartesian break between matter and consciousness. And what is that? What was that breaking of consciousness? Well, one side saw this. Um, one saw, um, excuse me. And it, and this isn't from Abram's interpretation, and this could be argued, but there is mind, and that is God. And he has infinite psychic potential. Then there is matter, and that is animals, wild plants, and all those things, and they don't possess that. And we, as humans, are a mix of that. And, you know, the Catholic guilt and all the trauma and all the pain and shame in religions grab that up, and they took it and ran with it. So... <laughs> A, a little a little scary right they and but this is where the boat is now everybody if you were watching there is a shipped boat it looks like in the desert this is where we are now man we are an abandoned boat in a desert because we have lost the flair we have lost the style that we need because we are not we need to start to move toward interacting with nature itself in its objectified form because let's talk about Let's talk about a couple things. Before man, let's talk about God. And we could refer to God as nature, higher consciousness, the upper plane of energy, maybe just synapses in the brain, I guess, maybe. But before man, na before, before man was on earth, nature had, and okay, before we get into this, I am now bringing German idealism into this, everybody. We have now brought in, because Abrams brought Spinoza in, and Spinoza is a very interesting philosopher, not just for his works and his ethics and what we're going to be talking about today, unitary God consciousness, but for the lineage that he created. Because after Sh Spinoza, suddenly we get Schelling and Hegel. They take it and run with that. And then after that, we get maybe a little bit of Nietzsche. Maybe not. Nietzsche could maybe be another camp, but we for sure kind of move into Schopenhauer. And then we move into psychoanalytical thought and Heidegger and then phenomenology, modern phenomenology, Ponty. Even now we get into maybe Deleuzian. It's kind of this very interesting chain. If you had to describe, if we only could, you know, have five or ten philosophical lineages, cl classic ones. And it kind of actually starts but we don't even need to get into that. And this all goes back to, you know, Greece and, you know, uh, the, the ancient philosophy philosophers. So there is a lot of big names I just said in there within this framework of Spinoza. And I, I feel like that is the most interesting, most potent and most livable aspect of philosophy when we actually look at it. So Spinoza really started to push this oneness of God, mind, and nature idea. And that there is no separation. It is not in the body. It is being. It is not like a Reikian interpretation of the body. It is design. It is the Hygerian being of beingness. On f fundamental ontology. Our consciousness is not unique. There is this pervasive power. And then that was taken by Schelling. And Schelling says... Um, if we want to read a little bit of Schelling, 
we can maybe find it in here. Boom, right here. Shelling coming in, everybody. To the transcendental philosophy, nature is nothing but the organ of self-consciousness. And everything in nature is only necessary because only through such a nature can self-consciousness be achieved. And then, okay, so let's talk about that real fast before we get to the, even the second quote. So going back to this idea. So this is a German ideal, more of some German idealism. Because Abrams kind of comes to a similar conclusion through Plato and Aristotle, which I thought was very clever and uh, something I hadn't. Um, actually thought of myself so we'll get into that but just because you probably have read this let's talk about a, basically the same angle which is let me prepare my notes so before man we're going to assume before man came nature had god as its other or god has nature as its other because we have nature and it's a part it's almost an other to us because we are somewhat separate uh, d from it even though we aren't it there's this weird separation between us and abrams has actually dissolved that he has dissolved that with this argument which i thought was cool but continuing on but prior to nature god's mirror was the unconscious because man okay this is what i should say man becomes realized through nature and that is the same argument as that abrams is making that man becomes man's consciousness can be realized through our sensory perception of nature but then god became conscious of himself maybe through nature and prior to nature god's mirror was the unconscious and looking at the unconscious made god conscious and maybe nature is the manifestation of god's consciousness you know, like I said, I know a lot of people have a lot of trauma with the word God and all that. But we could, like I said, think of it in many different deities or forms or whatever we want to think of it as. And this is the dark fire as Jacob Bohm talks about. Because there, what is that mirror of unconscious? What is that dark potentiality, that dark bedding that la, la, l is la laying? Ugh, I'm messing up the verbs, everybody. The, the dark potentiality at the foot, at the bottom of consciousness. What is that that we access? That is so cool. And he says that that pervades everything in all of consciousness because consciousness came out of the dark or has this shade of darkness that everything thus is dark. And that, you know, that is a whole different plane of thinking. Super cool stuff. And if we regard nature as mechanical, which a lot of people do, it only means that we ourselves have become too mechanical. We haven't seen enough and felt enough in nature yet. We haven't developed that phenomenological consciousness with nature yet. And there's a new dualism within this, though, that this Cartesian mindset, the separation of the body and mind. But one of the mendings that we see in this line of thinking more recently is through Otto Rank. And Otto Rank was Sigmund Freud's secretary. And much like Wilhelm Reich and um, Jung, who were also very close to Freud, Otto Rank took and figured out his own theory of the unconscious. And I think it fits most with what we're trying to say. And he said that the unconscious is that which we've been unexposed to and, that, and can only happen through and us finding our unconscious and us revealing that and healing the trauma can only happen through our will, putting ourselves out in the world or through our art. Freud would say maybe it's a sexual trauma or maybe, you know, it's just like a deep, you know, abandonment trauma. Jung would say it's a, we could heal it through the collective unconscious and moving through archetypes through an, an active imagination. Reich would say it's in the body and we need to roll for do certain measures to the body to get it out. But Ronk says that it's through our will. It's through the, in his book, Art and Artist, the creative urge and personality says that it is healed through the will. And the will can be activated in a very easy way through art, but also through action and through seeing the world and having sensory perceptions but creates our, and fills in our unconscious. And that thus heals ourself. And that could be nature. That could actually be a metaphor for nature. I just wanted to bring all this in, everybody to kick this thing off because this is something that wasn't addressed by Abram. So if you've been having trouble understanding this chapter, um, there's a perspective of that, but now we're going to move more into um, what 
Abrams is talking about in Plato and Aristotle. But let's read the second quote real fast just to uh, wrap this up. The Hegelian God as a starting point is at first being per se and unconscious. Only God as a result is being for self and conscious is spirit. That the attaining to being for self, the becoming an object to self is really a coming to consciousness is clearly expressed by Hegel. The theory of the unconscious is necessary. Presupposition of every objective or absolute I- or absolute idealism, which is not amb- and amb- unambiguously theism. And pause that, chew that up. I'm not going to harp on that too hard for you guys because uh, that will take us a, lo- a long time to talk about. So let's do a little bit more of Cartesian. So one of the, the primary dichotomy in Descartes' philosophy, after all, was not the divisions between mind and body, but rather the divide between the mind and the whole of the material world. And that was a quote from Abram. And the, this detachment that the Cartesian split gave us, gave us a superpower because we didn't have to care anymore. We could treat nature. We could do what we want. We could even treat humans in this hierarchical way. And a lot of people do this with emotions. A lot of people who work jobs, lawyers, you know, have to give up and cremate their care. There is this, ab- a, you know, in a lot of a dark occult people do this, is that they kill their emotions. They use rituals to kill their higher and joyful emotions. And this is something they're doing, just like you work to become a better, you know, better at your job. They work at eliminating this so they can make more ruthless decisions without being affected as, as much by their animal brain, animal emotions, human emotions, whatever we want to call them. So, Quote, quote again, every sensible phenomenon had its own mental aspect. Every tangible body within the material world was also an idea within the vast encompassing, intel- encompassing intelligence that was known inwardly to some as God and outwardly to all of us as nature. And it's basically, he's saying that it's all the same. Our conscious reflection came through nature, not through the, our interactions with ourselves, not through our own. So like I like what we were saying is that we became conscious through nature. And another way to put this is our brain is powered by our body. If our body wasn't here, our brain probably wouldn't be here. Our body was nourished by nature. You know, and that's that's another way to kind of reduce this down to more simple terms. And this kind of gets cool because like rain and weather, for instance, change our mood. There's this why does that happen? Is it because I've learned that darkness is bad through conditioning or through movies and the darkness and rain. And am, am is it all that? Or is it a certain programming, a code? And one of the main cool things that David talks about in this is that ideas live outside of us. Ideas are not, a, and this is the framework, everybody. This is a lens that we can view the world through. And this is a very potent personal development lens that can help you grow. And you don't have to hold on to it. But if you do look at it through this angle, you can gain a lot as a thinker, writer, and even this is huge in postmodernism, that ideas and emotions live outside of us, that they are not a part of us. And I always think of like an MMA fight, or if you've ever been to like a sports arena, suddenly you could almost be have be deaf, you know, have you be blind and deaf and feel a certain change in the air in that, in that like sports environment. Things start to get a little different out there. And it's also kind of weird because when you view emotions outside of yourself, you view them as this ancient ancestral thing that you can tap into like anger, for instance. And there's many different hues of anger that we can tap into, but just anger in general, if it exists outside of us and ideas exist outside of us, then that means that there's this ideal out there that there is this higher transcendental signifier as plato would say and that's what we're going to transition to into right now so let me know in the comments about your 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 thoughts about ideas and emotions being outside of ourselves and what that could mean for personal development because like i said it can actually help us hone into our emotions a little bit more and understand that we we have to, it's a two-way signal with emotions almost and it, when you look at it you feel this eerie sense with emotions. Like when you get angry or sad, you're like, you almost become too meta and like self-conscious of consciousness, Um, (laughs) uh, uh, conscious of the emotion. And you start like almost tripping over yourself while you're thinking about it. 
But he, another almost argument that David makes is that the solitary insights that we have while we're at the sea, that while we're at the heights on a cliff, in deserts, in mountains, in swamps, where did these come from? Because unconnected people throughout history and even people now have these weird similar thoughts out in nature. Certain philosophies start to breed. Like in the desert, we have this invisible landscape and pure potential, but also pure death and fanaticism and re hardcore religious f fervor take over out in the desert. It's pretty crazy. But out in the woods, people get chopped up a little bit more and things get a little bit more intense. Um, and then the sea is more flowy and oceany, but there's also this more cyclical connection. All these things are really cool. And the next big transition that we're going to make is that David talks about how ideas and species being as words were once once synonymous with each other. And he connects it back to the Greek word eidos, which means visible look or outward form. And so this helps us transition to Plato and the transcendental signifier. And the transcendental signifier is very important to all this because without the line, this is where things get a little bit crazy, without the hegel Schelling line, we probably wouldn't have got Heidegger. And without Heidegger, we probably wouldn't have gotten Derrida, who then broke the uh, transcendental signifier with his um, gap. And we'll have to talk about that at another time. But he took over um, Saussure's really new signifier. Really, It literally happened in, like, in the same year or two that they po like his theory you know, got broken, as some would say. Saussure's theory of the signifier. Transcendental signifier was shown to be a little bit um, maybe obsolete by Derrida's proposition, but we'll have to talk about that later. But so Plato, Greek philosopher, student of Socrates, mentor of Aristotle, talked about immaterial forms and transcendental signifiers. So I'm going to take this this chair back here, for instance. We we have this chair back here. So this chair is. A chair in this room and there are chairs in this room and they are chairs of a lower form and then there are chairs also out in the world but then there is the highest chair of all there is a chair that is the most chair chairness of chairs right you know the highest aesthetic of beauty there's nothing higher than that then everything like this is a lower form of that and that i that is the highest idea and this can be brought into language. This is something that can carry with into that got carried into religion, but it can also be carried with language and creativity and with certain ideas. But this this did get carried, and like I said, tells us here. But then the word idea. So ideas, like I said, if we're talking about if they're outside of of us, connect to the Plato's idea of this transcendental signifier, these ideas and these emotions, if there's these archaic things, they are, they are the angriness of anger, for instance. And idea is the feminine version of the adios. Uh, that was something that Abram said. So Plato, Plato would then say nature is ephemeral sensations. They are the ideal ideas. Nature out here is a world of all these different um, objects that have this higher significance out there. And that's a pretty cool thing to talk about and to think about. And cultures would worship, you know, if we look at earth-based spirituality, that's what it's all about. Seeing every being and object as its highest transcendental signifier, not as Aristotle would say. Um, let me gather my notes. Next page. Aristotle's different use, which is not down with the signifier which didn't really want to talk about that. So he grouped it into a collective group of individuals who share a common form. So like this chair and the chair I'm in right now and the chairs in the other room, the qualities that all make them a chair that are like our most common are what makes it uh, a chair, a chair. That's what really gets it up. Not the highest form of a chair, but the really collective similarities. And so this starts the movement toward grouping together though. And that starts started moving toward the Cartesian model of fracturing of consciousness, though. An idea should re remain ephemeral. Eph ideas, though, so, w okay. So ideas are connected to Plato. And when we talk about ideas, they still m remain kind of 
kind of transcendental when we think about ideas and dreams and when people talk about it. Our language kept ideas as out there. Ideas are ideas. They aren't action. But species remain grounded through Aristotle. And um, that's what the classifications and the groupings, that's what kind of turned into species, such as the, a species of trees, even though I don't know if that's the right word, word but the classification system. I think that's super cool. But now we've had a break because ideas have become private ethereums of an individual's mind. Ideas now don't live out and can't t attach themselves to transcendental signifiers. They have just been reduced to our own brains and the ideas in our brain, but not of the outside world. We've become selfish people. But our, and like I said, our ancestors held this idea of earth. So David then talks about this exercise that he does, which I thought was pretty cool. That when a fly buzzes, you should think of an annoying thought. So pretend there's a buzz. I should think of an annoying thought that connects to the, to the fly and then start looking and then shift, then move from that to shifting my consciousness to right where the fly is. And then focus on the fly and give, the fly, give some thought and phenomenological awareness to the fly. And then suddenly the fly should go away. And, you know, I don't know the validity of that, but that's what we're trying to look. Spiritual ecology course, shout out everybody. That's a pretty cool exercise. So now we're going to transition to a new concept. So if you guys have any questions about that Plato and Aristotle and even Otto Rank and Schelling, if you guys have any questions, just let me know. And like I said, this really isn't an approving, disproving session, but if you're trying to, if I didn't, wasn't clear enough, let me know. So now we're going to kind of try to tether the mind to earth. Because what if mind, our mind is earth's mind? What if our mind is really not our own brain stuck in this consciousness, but it's earth's mind? And it's maybe a property of the earth itself. We are immersed in the power of earth. Our brain is a part of the earth. Maybe our awareness has been generated as a medium because we are so immersed in it because of that self-reflection with earth. Quote, and let's see if we can find this one. Oh, I guess not everybody. So I'm going to shout out a quote here. Oof, these are beautiful photos. Everyone who's watching this presentation. Is not awareness too a kind of medium or atmosphere, a capacity that blooms within us, swelling and subsiding, only because we are penetrated by it, encompassed by it, permeated? Are we not born into mind as in to an unseen layer of earth? gradually opening ourselves to the nourishment of this medium, adapting ourselves to its lunar rhythms, aligning ourselves with the way it glimmers and sings in our particular species? Are we not gradually opening up to the nourishment of consciousness of the earth, adapting our, and we, our bodies adapt, like you said, to lunar rhythms, the menstrual cycle. You can't, these things are unexplainable. And the way that we align ourselves with it doesn't, isn't that how we formed as a species? Isn't that how consciousness formed? We need to acknowledge Earth's implicit involvement in all of our experience because our brain is probably an analog, talking about shelling and all this stuff, an analog to the Earth. And this connects to a lot of ideas in spirituality that you have to raise the beacon. You have to open the beacon with energy. But once we start believing in energy, we have to believe that the earth, the most powerful energy source of all, which our consciousness realized itself through on this earth as human species. We are not aliens, ladies and gentlemen. We are not anything else. Our human species did this on earth. We can talk about intervention theory and aliens and all that stuff too. And that maybe is how we became conscious, but we are not doing that here today in the spiritual ecology course. So that's what we're talking about. And I'm going to maybe just go on for a couple more minutes about this, but thank you guys for hearing that out. And the brain and our capacity within our own brain, I'm just going to be running through these slides. If you guys want to see some beautiful photos, becomes conscious through itself. And then nature is the organ and spending more time in nature, doing, practicing the principles of spiritual ecology, help strengthen that. And when that is strengthened, 
our consciousness is strengthened. We get more of the world. We start to see more depth. And this can even start, with, like I said, with a lot of things like spirituality. And starting to understand these concepts, concepts and removing the Cartesian break within our own consciousness. Starting, stopping to see, stopping seeing the world, stopping our habit of seeing the world from an upward, upward lens and coming back down to the ground and seeing the depth within it. So let's talk about the journal assignment, everybody. I have a lot of great photos. I mean, how are you guys doing? Thank you guys for coming on this journey with me. I thought this would maybe go a little longer, be a little bit harder, but suddenly I'm at the end. I'm like, I don't really need to prove this. If you believe in the consciousness power that earth has, if you have felt into that, that's why you're at this course right now. That The earth has a tone. It has a hue. It has a buzz. And that really, I think, brings out an awareness within us and maybe brought out the first inklings of awareness. So let's let's do a little journaling. So write 100 to 200 words about the text. Oop, let's pull this up. In an intuitive way. Or intuitively. If you are stuck, pick passages to deep read and explicate. And here's an optional journal idea. Stream of consciousness, write for 10 to 30 minutes about anything, anything you want. And then when you're done with that, read about what you wrote and connect up to five ideas to memories or experience, five ideas to memories that you've had or experiences in nature. Feel, feel, oh man, I'm so sorry about the typos. I, I actually fixed this, but didn't copy it over. Feel boundaries dissolve between your own writing and nature with this exercise. And the last three, two fucking videos, now this being the third, have had typos. So I'm sorry. I don't, you know, like I, I prepare all this stuff and I make notes and I do photos and like these slides are the last to go. And sometimes I just, I'm like really revving to make, you know, start talking. So sometimes that, that happens. So feel the boundaries dissolve. So pretend you write for 30 minutes look or 10 minutes. Look back and you're going to see that there's this separation. Um, and with you could be writing about your past relationship. But there's going to be ideas that you can stem back to nature, to the transcendental signifiers in nature that you give praise to. You will be able to tap into that with your writing and with this exercise. So check that out, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. Let's thank everybody who's been involved in this video. Peace. What's up to all my students in the Spiritual Ecology course? It's your boy Ian, aka The Lit Villain, here today to drop another lesson. So today we are talking about the chapter Mood in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. If you guys would like to sign up for the course, it is free and go watch the intro video in the description below. So we are coming off of a big video, everybody, the mind video, probably the big chapter of the whole book in terms of like trying to push philosophy and revelation and even an updating of his book, The Spell, the Spell of the Sensuous, David's book. And I tried, first of all, recording this video, and I'm sorry for the delay, a couple times. There were two videos with technical difficulties, and the, the last one I did, I was just so tired that it just was a terrible video. So I have the energy today, I have the mood today to make sure that we have another awesome video. So in the first paragraph, David actually helps us transition into um, into mood, and let me just pull that up. I'm just thought of that real fast. I think that as we breathe out, letting mind flow back into the field that surrounds us, we feel a new looseness and freedom. So, last chapter we got a little bit cerebral, but to really experience this course, to really get into spiritual ecology, the mind is only going to take us so far, and it's really not the experience. So. Mood is the next step really in any endeavor after the mind. If we're outlining a novel or outlining a something that we're going to draw in our own head, mood is what sets the, the stage and almost the potential for what we're going to do next. And we talked about that with our house and we all know about mood and how we feel. Like if you feel tired or something, you don't want to do something like this. But as um, quoting Abram, each 
each place has its rhythm of rhythms of change and metamorphosis, its specific style of expanding and contracting in response to the turning seasons. And this too shapes and is shaped by the sentience of that land. So if I had to say the one thing that we're learning in this course, everybody, it is under tapping into the sentience of the land. All of this, everything that you're doing is trying to promote that and get move closer toward that. And maybe, maybe, learning how to transcribe that to others. That's what I'm trying to do, but that's with any great work, what you have to do. First of all, you have to learn it, experience it, integrate it into your life. Then you teach it. Then you have to share it with other people. We've seen this forever with the proselytization through religion, but we are non-hierarchical beings in the spiritual ecology field who are just trying to push connection, oneness, you know, kind of vague terms and you know, and of course more than that, but I think that gives us more of wiggle room in terms of what we are going to, you know, be able to share. And, and, and I'm hopefully if you've been doing the journals and all this stuff, like I said, you have ammo. Now you have stuff to release to the world. You actually are moving into this spot where you are activated. You are an activated spirit. If you've done everything up to this point, you have a thousand plus words. You have a blog post, you have something to talk about. You have something to talk about at the bar with your friends, you know? So we just wanted to lay that out before we move any um, further. And the main contention in this chapter is that the certain, the landscape has moods and that the mood, those moods actually affect us or actually maybe even create our moods. But I think that's pretty obvious that when we hear the rains, you know, when there's a nice rainstorm and it's maybe a summer rainstorm, we have the window open. There's a certain relaxation and creativity and introvertness to that. Or if there's, it's a nice sunny day, fall day, and if it's great outside or spring day, we want to get out and be active. These things are very simple, but then certain landscapes have different moods also. And we've talked about this, for instance, the, the desert where I live, there's a certain hermit aspect to it. There's a certain inf aspect of infinity when you're out there in the desert because there is an invisible landscape. You can do what you want with your mind out in a blank landscape because there are very little and there are no animals. There are no even plants at times, maybe some mountains. But if you are immersed in the forest that has a lot of action going on, it has a totally different mood. Then the seasons also affect the mood. So we start to see that moods and emotions start to exist. And we've talked about this, I think in the last chapter about how emotions can exist outside of us. So I think moods can exist, exist in nature outside of us also, and have an integral archetypal quality to them that civilizations that are unconnected or people that are unconnected can tap into. So where you are at is important. And being able to travel is also important. So let's talk about the city though. So our next quote is about the city. Um, the dismal social, the dismal social ills endemic to certain cities have often been stoked by the foolishness of urban designers who overlooked the particular wildness of the place, ignoring the genius Loki, the unique intelligence of the land now squelched and stifled by local industries. A callous coldness or meanness results when our animal senses are cut off for too long from the an animate earth, when our ears, inundated by the whooping blare of car alarms and the muted thunder of subways, no longer encounter the resonant silence. As our eyes forget the irregular wildness of things green and growing behind the rec rectilinear yeah rectilinear days and i can attest to this i'm sure you can too living in whatever city if you if you live in a city this is a real thing and urban design is a joke and single family housing and you know the capitalist the 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 um the 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 charge of capital through anything and everything is sad. I've watched my own uh, hometown, Las Vegas, which was already a pretty big city, just get turned into the new Los Angeles, you know, jumping from 1 million people to 3 million people in my lifetime. And certain areas and regions that used to have jackrabbits and coyotes and even fi uh, kit foxes, which are very rare, hawks, ravens, um, whatever, insects, 
all have been eaten up by the city. And it's sad that there are places where there's like desert plots of land, maybe a square mile of desert, and there's coyotes living in there. And it's like, what the hell is going on? And the deeper you descend into the city, the less natural it becomes. You almost feel it because I live out on the outskirts. I can get to the desert in two minutes. But when I descend down there, if I need to go down there for, you know, work or for fun, it's sad. And the city was not created for nature. If we actually created cities for us, they would not look be built with um, right angles. And with all this crap, we would actually have places for recycling and maybe circular buildings and open air buildings and more parks and more places for animals, more channels for animals to come down. I mean, there are no channels in my city for a coyote pack to move up. They have to move. You know, there's nothing like, you know, being in the middle of Las Vegas and seeing a, a, a coyote and its mom on the middle of a busy road. I mean, it's sad. And I can only imagine in places like Los Angeles or other places that are even more compact, what the hell is going on? Or like a New York City or Chicago where there's actually like an urban, urban-esque environment to it. So that's, that's my sh spiel about the city. Let me know about your city in the comments. If you want to talk about your city, let me know what sucks about your city or what's great about your city. Has your city done anything? I don't really know that many cities that have honored this. And a lot of the, the cities that have, um, very sadly, have, have social problems to them. Um, for instance, like Portland and Seattle have a lot of homeless people and even crime in areas that, you know, I think in San Francisco that were meant to be very nice and natural. And there's these huge parks or you know, Central Park. Every single one of those places that I've been to all those, the major parks and all those cities and all the natural parts. And I don't know if it's just been in the last couple of years, but there's been an uh, proliferation of, you know, homeless people. And like I said, that's a social problem, but it's like, wh what the heck is going on? Now we have the human animal. We have the human animal living in these um, in these spaces that maybe were reserved to, to help, I guess, animals. But, you know, we are the human animal. So, you know, the solution, once again, is getting out. But how do we get out? Like, I don't know. Like, leave. I'm trying to do more research into this. But what's the solution here? How the hell do we get in, for, in the United States 350 million people? out of these cities and do these people even want to leave do people just want to stay because of their jobs and because of fun and food and their family do people even want to leave the bronx or um the south side chicago do people want to get out and live on a on a farm in wherever they can they can i guess not and would that be better for the land i'm sure it would be if we were coexisting with nature and i'm sure industry and stuff would probably thrive too as we've seen with as we've seen with remote working, a lot of the work that we're doing can get done. And a lot of the stuff that has been getting done has actually been useless. A lot of the construction jobs and all the stuff that is done in cities is just meant to sustain the city that is useless in the first place. Like, and all the food places and all the stuff, it's like a restaurant is really meant, especially in the inner city, is meant for people who are working too much and don't have time to go get food really fast so they don't have to do it because they don't have the energy because they're working a, useless, a, a pretty useless job. So it's like, where, where do we find purpose? Where do we find use? And I think we kind of have to restart outside of these cities. And now with the internet and maybe with uh, technology like what Elon Musk is talking about with satellites giving remote places high-speed internet, we'll have that because I've lived places and I really want to move somewhere, you know, in somewhere remote, maybe in Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, but the internet service, I couldn't, up, uh, I've been out there. I've Airbnb, I have friends, I have family who live out in places like that and they have the best internet available. And to upload this video, it'd take like 12 hours. I don't have 12, I mean, 12 hours, you know, to Netflix barely works. There's like, it's buffering a ton. So and maybe that's holding on to something too much, but we could participate in the global economy, not in cities. So that's just a thought that, and, and let me know, like I said, let me know like where I'm, where I'm, where I'm going wrong with that. Or like where my thinking can maybe get a little bit better. Like what is, like I said, maybe that's not viable, but I assume that if our consumerism ended 
mostly ended and people found a little bit of purpose and love of nature, most of us could probably move out. You know, I, and I don't know what the land issue is, land being bought up. You know, there's a lot of, lot of uh, pitfalls. So now let's get into the actual content. Quote, different atmospheric conditions, different kinds of weather are precisely different moods. Wind, rain, snow, fog, hail, open skies, heavy overcast. Each element or mood articulates the invisible medium in a unique manner, sometimes rendering it partly visible to our eyes or more ins insistently palpable. Pal palpable upon our skin each affects the relation between our body and the living land in a specific way altering the tenor of our reflections and the tonality of our dreams listen to that altering the tenor of our reflections and the tonality of our dreams that's just that's just great writing everybody i mean you can't you undeniably just some beautiful prose happening and each affects the relation between our body and the living land in a specific way. We were just talking about that. And I would maybe like for you to reflect on that in your journal today. That's what we're going to do. So just start thinking about that. How, how your current environment is affecting your mood. So let's, so there, there is an intelligence in each ecosystem. So once, so like in the desert and in the forest, and there is an intelligence that we can tap into and use as our creative, maybe muse or our creative, you know, fire to go and take action in the world. And when we can connect with nature and understand it and move with it, move with the its cycles, then things start to happen. There's a great book um, called, I think, Finding Your Divine Purpose by Gregor Molly. He's, the, I think, the smartest yogi out there right now. Um, and he recommends, and this is an ancient practice of the vision quest. Vision quests don't happen in um, a Taco Bell bathroom. You do it out in nature. You go out into nature and you sit and you relax and you let the visions come to you. Most of the time without even um, psychedelic drugs. And there is a certain component that happens. And I... It was actually kind of funny. I started this practice. I've done this practice forever, but I started a routine for a couple months in the desert, every single day out in the desert, every morning. And then I spent the summer in Wyoming and my visions changed. It was weird. There was like a 30 or 40% difference in the general theme and mood of my visions. I wasn't trying to change it, but why did it change? Is it, am I just, is my subconscious just like so narcissistic that I'm trying to just create an insane confirmation bias to be like, wow, look at change. Look, I'm so right. Look, my, all my ideas are right. And like, is I'm, am I really doing that as like this objective science, you know, a you know, occultist trying to come out there and figure out what's going on in nature and with magic. And is it really that deep? I don't really think it's that deep, but I mean, that would be the excuse for why this is going on. And another thing I would recommend is yoga and poetry out in nature or, you know, writing, doing something creative, art, do it out in a desert, let's say, or do it out in a forest. And there is a difference. I have felt this every single year when I go to Wyoming in the winter and in the summer and other places. But when I spend somewhere, uh, go somewhere for an extended period of time, there's this general shift. What the hell is going on? Yoga in the desert is great. Like I hit like infinity zone, like, but out in the forest, it's more like, connected zone like I'm really more connected I'm not like stretching I'm going I'm stretching a bit like I'm stretching a lot <laughs> figuratively but um or technically but figuratively I expand a little bit but then I zone in and tap into like the the, the forest what is that I would recommend like I said doing a meditation breathing practice moving practice artistic practice in two very different locations even in your own area like for me, I live in a desert, but there is a forest 30 minutes from my house. I can sit and do that, make that transition. Maybe you live in a, in a wooded area, but maybe go out to a lake or go out to a plains area or a farm field. You know, shake it up a little bit. See, see what the difference is. That's how we start to understand these things. We have to, we're really just scientists out here trying to do that. And one of the best ways to do this is by keeping a journal. That's, um, something we should maybe talk about is a spiritual ecology journal about how you're certain, how you have certain reactions to all this. I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to write down that right now because I do that. It's not actually a current practice I have, but it's something that I've done before. And I do that with my yoga practice. So with my yoga practice and meditation and breathing practices for years, I've just kept a 
detailed journal about what is going on in those um, every practice. And I, I can now with all this data make huge correlations about my mood, what I ate, how I feel, the weather, even more magical stuff. And then I can recreate more positive, positive or planned experiences. So spiritual ecology journal, we're going to, I'm going to make a video about that really soon. That's going to be really cool. So the, one of the ways to experience nature is to walk or ride a bike. Everybody, I know this is like maybe a little bit redundant, but you need to walk or ride a bike or you're not even riding a bike is a little bit half ass, but you know, walking is the best way to understand what is going on. Doing a lot of walking, walking every morning, every night, you need, you know, 10,000 steps a day, everybody, not in the city. If you're going to do 10,000 steps, don't go walk around a neighborhood with cars. Go take a walk and think and meditate. It's actually good for you. The time that you spent commuting is going to be time that you gain back through productive action and feeling better and actually probably living longer. You will, you will literally live more minutes in the long run <laughs> by doing that. And riding bikes is also great. Like, Oh my God, that was the best part about, um, Wyoming over the summer, ride my bike down to the lake every day or through the, you know, mountain bike through a, a, on a trail. It's just like, Oh my God. And just phew, miss it so much. And, you know, riding bikes in Las Vegas is cool too, but it's a little bit different, especially when it's 105 Fahrenheit every day. So we can escape these different moods. We can escape nature, even in a car. So David Abrams talks about, you know, you've, I've been in a car before and you're out there and suddenly, um, like on my way to Wyoming, you start smelling the manure. Suddenly you're out of the city and then the manure comes or, you know, the skunk comes and even the radio stations change. When if I'm going for through Salt Lake city through it, for instance, through Salt Lake city, for instance, suddenly I'm hearing, um, rap music and pop. But then when I'm out in the boonies, it's suddenly Christian rock and maybe, maybe classic rock. Or when I'm in Hawaii, oh my God, when I was in Hawaii, man, every time I'm in Hawaii, I love reggae, dude. There's like so many reggae, island reggae channels. It's like, like on Oahu, man, there was like 25 reggae channels. I couldn't freaking believe it. And a lot of it, I didn't even know there was like a lot of them were like bad pop reggae. I didn't even, it was like, but you know, there was a different vibe. You don't get that. You're not going to get 25 um, reggae stations in Fargo. North Dakota, you know, or South Dakota, wherever, far, South Dakota, I think. Don't quote me on that. So what was cool though, is that cars, we can still tap into it. So if we take travel somewhere, for instance, if I go from Las Vegas to Wyoming, I can see the general transition to desert to desert to mountains. But if I take a plane from Vegas to Florida, which would take less time. So I could literally drive the total time from me leaving my house to getting to my hotel room in Florida would be less than getting to Wyoming. And Florida is a totally different place. It's this freaking swamp with weird people. You know, shout out all my Floridians out there. <laughs> but, you know, a plane, you lose everything and you get jet lag and you're up at altitude with fake air. And that's why we call it, there is no real sensory transition. And that's why there is such a thing as jet lag. And my recommendation for if you have to do jet travel is immediately get onto the land, go do yoga, go put your feet on the bare earth, no matter where you are, or take a walk. If it's winter, you have to get outside and try to get the sun or even stars in your head or on your face, or you're going to have a sense of uh, vertigo about what just happened. Even if it's just an hour flight, I try to do that when I go up to Wyoming on, on a, on a short flight. So, we have this ability now with cars and with planes to go anywhere. I could get to Florida or Mexico or Costa Rica in, in an instant. And I can expand my consciousness, my natural consciousness and experience all these different types of, um, nature in, in one week I could go experience a desert and mountains and a rainforest and, um, both coasts in America, all these different things. But, that isn't just the end all be all because there is a certain power of staying in the same atmospheric condition because you become something greater than yourself. When you like, for instance, I am a eco poet, an eco desert poet, because the desert has taught me the desert. I have become a part of the desert and 
in that time, wherever you live, you can actually tap in and understand the consciousness of that land. You can understand the forms that it takes throughout the season, the migratory bird patterns, the um, feel of the air, what happens, like all these little nuances, but you have to be there all year to really understand that and then catalog that over the course of decades even to really tap into that. And that's why I feel a little bit upset even about leaving Vegas because I've spent, you know, other than two years in Utah and Oregon, my whole life here. And there is a lot of a power that I have as, like I said, because I'm into this. So wherever you are, tap into that, like really tap into that, tap into that, um, that mood. So the mood, <laughs> So Abram starts to talk about different seasons. And one of the things I loved was his quote about fall. The wind is haunted alive only in this liminal season before the onset of winter. Does the wild psyche of the land assert itself so vividly that even the most rational persons find themselves lost now and then in the uncanny depths of the sensuous, their animal sense is awakened. The skin itself begins to breathe. And oh my God, that's why I love fall. Fall's one of my favorite seasons. It's, it's amazing. And so just a quick summary of some of the things that he talks about is that in winter, you become more, the wind makes you, and so he's talking about wind. And in the winter, the wind makes you more frigid and still. Like, have you ever been caught out there in a winter, skiing or something? And just, like, you freeze, man. You literally freeze, and you sit there, and you just let it pass you sometimes. Have you ever been snowshoeing? It literally put my head down. And, I mean, that was a very acute observation by Abrams. But then in the spring, when the wind comes, it gives you the sense of the mountain. You feel it coming. Like if you've ever been spring skiing and you feel like you feel the life coming back. It doesn't, it makes you want to move. Like movement comes back and it's, it's a, it's a really cool thing. And then in the fall, of course, it, it's haunted. And in the summer, everything is alive. And Abram also talks about a thunderstorm. And when thunder cracks, nothing can be stopped. I mean, oh my gosh, when, you know, when thunder boom, like you, everything freezes, no matter what I'm doing, even if I have headphones on, like you do a jolt, everything even outside freezes. It's, it's a common shared mood and experience. And if these moods and experiences don't exist, once again, we can go back to this objective analysis, but let's get into that right now. Let's get into the objective haters right now. So, um, so Abram asks for all the haters out there, aren't we just projecting on nature with our own interior moods, using our own ego, ego to project onto nature. Isn't that all that we're doing? And Abrams says, quote, well, no, not if our manner of understanding and conceptualizing our various interior moods was originally borrowed from the moody um, Copernicus earth itself. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Not, that is, if our image of anger and livid, livid rage has been borrowed, at least in part, from our ancestral animal experience of thunderstorms and the violence of sudden lightning. Not if our sense of emotional release has been fed not only by the flow of tears, but also by our experience of rainfall. And if our concept of mental clarity is nourished by the visual transparency of the air and the open blue of the sky on those days of surpassing, surpassingly low humidity. And this is his response. That no, we are not just projecting that these moods, that these things we feel were first learned to us by nature. These things e exist in nature, the feel and hermitude of the de desert, the connected feeling in the forest, the beautiful flow and relaxation at the beach. These things exist outside of us and they taught us our moods. They taught us the animals, our moods. That's what he is contending here. And that is true. Once again, mood exists outside of us in nature. And once we don't, you know, don't need to get too deep into that. But I think this is one of the coolest concepts in the whole book because it makes sense that rainfall, tears come from rainfall, that there's a certain dreariness and dread and, you know, sadness that, you know, the rain almost has, the darkness, the clouds. And the th like we talked about the thunder crack and anger. It feels like that. If you really feel into times you've been yelled at by an angry parent or ex-spouse, hopefully ex-spouse, you know, you feel it. Rah, rah. You know, or if you've been to a, you know, that's what those meals, moods feel like. So in the journal today, everybody, I would like you guys to talk about 
and try to identify some of the moods that exist in your environment. Like what are the general moods of where you live? And then what are the general moods that you like to live in though? What are the general moods that um, Ian, you know, or whoever, uh, Robert out there, what mood do you live in? Like, what are you, ex what do you want to experience? And is there a disconnection between your environment and your mood? And, and then maybe talk about what, what power can you gain? Like what actually personal, um, what, what action can you take with this? For me in the desert, I can experience a sense of infinity. I can go above and beyond and think of concepts and business ideas and writing ideas that maybe other people can't. So I need to utilize that as much as I can. Write about that journal. Let me know what's up. I've been enjoying everybody's journals. I have actually just started reading all of them. I've you know been keeping up, but now I have caught up completely. So uh, I, and actually, if you're listening, look for some comments. If you're one of the uh, six people who are who have been taking and doing their or who have been doing their journals, I have mostly responded to everybody. So thank you guys for being here. I love you guys. Peace. What's up to all my students in the spiritual ecology course out there? It's your boy Ian from the litunderground.com here today to drop another lesson. So first of all, for all the first time viewers or listeners out there, I would go to the link in the description below to watch the introduction video and read about the course, uh, the course outline and whatnot. And you can see if this, this is a right, the right fit for you, or you can just tag along and see what this episode is about. But I would like to apologize to everybody though because the last five or six episodes have had bad audio quality. And I'm sorry, and you may not have noticed it, but I was just wearing my headphones today, re-watching one of the videos I was uploading, and I, there was this grainy sound in there. And then I watched a couple more videos, and all of them had grainy sound, and I realized I was using a bad cord to hook up my microphone. So I'm so sorry, you guys, and I would re-upload them, but it's like three hours worth of content. So, you know, really just gonna kind of push forward, especially, you know, being that I have, you know, 500 subscribers at the time of this recording. Thank you, everybody, for 500 subscribers, too. We're at 500, going for 1,000 now. Um, you know, so not the most imperative thing at the moment, but I feel bad maybe for the people in the future because we're going to have a million one day, baby. But this chapter is kind of cool because I think Abrams, and today we're talking about the speech of things in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. And I'm, I'm trying to keep I'm going to keep this more personal today because David has this experience with a humpback whale and a sea lion and he talks about how he uses language to be able to connect with them and here's a, and he says quote it was rather as if my body itself was doing the thinking trading vocal utterances and physical expressions back and forth with those smooth skinned and sentient creatures and i can pull the full quote right here for you guys to read and that has been my oops that has been my experiences with coyotes out in the desert. And I am out in the desert every single day doing my thing and hiking, writing, doing yoga, chilling, dying of dehydration. Um, and I see coyotes all the time, probably at least once a week. And most of the time they're within 25 to 50 feet of me. And I can get that close because they know who I am. And what David recommends, first of all, is speaking to them in your natural tone. And I do that all the time. And that's how I think they know who I am. Because one, they know that I'm not a threat. And two, eventually, when they start running away, I chase them. And they don't get scared because they know I can't catch them. So I chase them for a while and they, and they start acting like dogs. It's actually kind of cool. Because they know, they're like, who is this guy? And I start yelling out, like, yippee! You know, I start like doing yips and stuff at them also. And they know like, wow, this guy is a pretty chill guy. And like I said, if I see a certain family once a week or a certain group of, I'm mostly in the same area, they've started to recognize me and really not give a, give a damn about what I'm doing. None of them ever get scared of me anymore. And then if a pair does or a group does, then I'll probably see them again, once again. So this is something that you can employ with. So first he says, embody your primal body. When you're out there with an animal, and you want to speak its language, just embody its primal body. And then maybe say something or let out like a certain noise or a song or a tone. I've done that before too. And they're going to hear in your voice. Because, for instance, and people talk really weird to animals, but pretend I came up to you and pretend your name's like, 
Samantha. And I'm like, oh, Samantha, how, how are you doing? Hey, oh my God. If I did that to you and I was like a random person, you'd be like, who? Oh my God. You'd be like really flustered. But I was like, hey, hey, Samantha, what's going on? How you doing? You know, probably a little bit more mellow. And that's the same thing with animals. We have this different reaction and think that if we act a certain type of way that they're going to have a different type of reaction and they actually are going to. But if we speak to them in our normal, relaxed posture and with our normal energy, then they are actually, we're going to unlock something with them that I would say is a pretty cool thing. And you probably have experienced it before. I've done it with deer and um, elk. I've done this before with a moose like David uh, describes. What else? You can do this with stray dogs that are chasing you on a bicycle. It, it, it's endless. Or even, even animals that you meet for the first time, like a dog or something that's maybe not the most, or cat that's not the most social creature. But, you know, remember with cats, slow blink and let them smell you. So beautiful coyote shots. And so then we get to this section about, okay, so let's, let's read one more quote. Everybody quote. It follows that the myriad things are also listening or attending to various signs and gestures around them. Indeed, when we are at ease in our animal flesh, we will sometimes feel that we are being listened to or sensed by the earthly surroundings. And so we take deeper care with our speaking, mindful that our sounds may carry more than a merely human meaning and resonance. This care, this full-bodied alertness, is the ancient ancestral source of all, of all, source of all word magic. It is the practice of attention to the uncanny power that lives in our spoken phrases to touch and sometimes transform the tenor of the world's unfolding. And words have power, and that's like something that is a part of the personal development and even spirituality world, and this is a spiritual ecology course, that our words carry a certain resonance. And as David talks about in this chapter, actually words and language separate us from nature. And he talks about certain people who live out in the woods or are very natural people. They don't talk very much. I'm sure you have been that person before when someone is a little bit more um, in the rural environment where you talk for three minutes, you're like, wow, they don't really care. I'm just ranting to this person. And when they talk, it's very uh, distinct and uh, to the point. So, I, I, and, oh, I guess we're not going to get into that in this episode, but shout out every, we're going to talk about green language or it's sometimes called the language of the birds in the next video. So I would, I would recommend checking that out because it's one of the coolest concepts in language, but you're talking about the speech of things though, not the language of things because language is not limited to just us. That is one of the things that we mess up here is that language is to, available to all sensible phenomena. Um, we talked, we've already talked about this with mountains and with houses and with stones, how there is this co-creative relationship happening with those things, but we don't open ourselves up to that enough. So also another thing that we can do here that I thought was also a great recommendation is talk to the small things, talk to the small things in our life, like the plants, the rocks, even the wind the day and talk to it in that neutral way and i think that you you're going to get a lot out of that experience so now we're going to talk about prayer everybody and what the prayer has to do with this and you know man i mean this is just kind of cringe these photos but quote prayer in its most ancient and elemental sense consists simply in speaking to things to a maple grove to a flock of crows to the rising wind rather than merely about things as such Prayer is an everyday practice common to oral indigenous peoples the, over the world over. And that is true. But we have somehow gotten into this prayer like Jesus and Christianity and um, all the monotheistic religions and even polytheistic religions that are very structured. And we've, we've lost the essence that indigenous people knew that we have, for, we have forgotten about through the alphabet, through language and what this talking, this dialogue, and I'm, I'm being serious here. You might not, you might look crazy. You might feel crazy, but you have to, this is what we're going to be talking about in the field work. You have to talk in the world, man. You have to speak to animals and to things and you can't hold yourself back. You have to really feel into it, but not 
separate from it. Like I said, don't make voices. Don't plead weird things. What if someone came up to you and you're like, oh my God, nature, thank you so much for being so beautiful. And I really want to have a good day. I really want this job. Like, can you please help me out? I think if you said that to someone you'd only met a couple times as a friend, as a person who in their, on their, in their own space, you, you, you know, they'd kind of have a weird reaction. And I, I don't want to ascribe human personality to this, but I actually think it's effective to be in the most relaxed, calm state you can be when you're doing this. And I think you're going to get more results. And um, here's another quote. Prayer experiences a sensible world as a source of itself. And that's the Christian prayer. Or, um, excuse me, this is the right, um, this is uh, prayer in nature. Um, experiences a sensible world as a source of itself, as a kind of ongoing transcendence wherein the, each sensible thing is steadily bodying forth its own active creativity and And that's what it's about, man. It's what we've talked about with Plato and with the fall of the universe, as you guys have been reading, um, with Copernicus or whatever his name is. The, the illusion, the mystery that nature has for us is available to us and it can happen through prayers and main things that we are talking about in that section so a couple more thoughts before we get into um the conclusion of this is that i would re really recommend everybody read the book the alphabet and the goddess and that really explains in a really nice way about how the alphabet is patriarchal, how monotheistic mono religions are patriarchal. And one of my favorite examples is art. When you look at Western art and its depictions of nature, it's either a part of a landscape and um, in the background. And sometimes there's pure landscape photos, but there's always something weird happening. But if you look at the Chinese landscape photos, you see like a town or you see this crazy painting of nature. Then there's this really minuscule like house or man walking. And it shows how much larger nature is than us. And it's like, if you look at the scaling, if you're like actually being technical about the art, the scaling really, their scaling is off. But they're trying to make a point, almost like a, sur a sur surrealistic, surreal point that nature is so much larger and grander than us. And it should be the core of um, a Chinese painting, at least in that the wilderness and Rivers' tradition of poets and paint, painters. So let's talk about a couple of revelations from the alphabet and the goddess, though. is because 99% of language is not this type of language, everybody. It is not creative language. It is business language, the language that we use in jobs. Think about the world out there. Most of those things, um, most of the writing that's happening in the world is very just like clerical or ad administrative. And it's been like that forever, especially back in the day. Writing was used to send a letter or to send a business transaction or to be using it to calculate and do your books or, you know, things of that nature. And as we've seen throughout history, and this is a generalization, not a fact, um, that men excel a little bit more with getting crazy with business and stuff. And maybe it's because men were just put in that position uh, because we came out of evolution as the dominant physical presence. And, you know, held on to that. So we held on to the business, the money side of everything. That could be it too. But I, as this book kind of, I would say, proves, if not shows, that men have more of a predilection toward that type of language and women have more of a predilection toward um, creative language and hieroglyphs and photos and calligraphy. And that's why, actually, if you look at Asian societies, there's actually been some really, um, and, and not even just any society with hieroglyphs, women are actually treated better and maybe not you know the bounding of the feet and stuff but you know in general he shows in this book that women are treated better than men in societies without the alphabet and what the alphabet brought us though uh as abram says is and monotheism is it is the cold inquiry that is required to create all the stuff right here that detachment that i we were talking about with the scientists to create the computers and the houses and um whatever medical technology that's that that's what was given to us through this cold inquiry but that cold inquiry and it, like i said the, where the problem starts is when people do it for eight hours a day and that can be hard on the body but then they come home they live their whole life in with that cold inquiry they never separate out of that and that's what we have to stop and try to prevent is that people are going to have to continue to do these jobs probably forever 
But we, when they get home, man, we can't keep reinforcing that with more atheism and with more detachment and cynicism and drugs and prescription drugs and um, bad sex. Like <laughs> they have to open themselves up to this new world and, and not live there all the time. Because what's the point? You actually don't get anything. I get at your job, you get something. And in the world, I guess moving through, if you make these rational, but like I said, if you're making a decision like an actual business or like whatever decision, maybe you shouldn't be using your emotions, uh, for instance. So that cold form of inquiry, though, like I said, should be able to be solved through just having a general life. And, I, and it's kind of crazy, but I think that other than the extreme cases, you'll get better at your chosen art of engineering or at science or um, computer computer programming if you have more of a balance in your life with more nature and with uh, more love and laughter and all those other things because you're going to feel more motivated to work and do more in less time. So check out that book, everybody, The Alphabet and the Goddess. So the last thing that – one other thing I would like to talk about, then we'll get to the concluding point, which I think is the best point maybe of the book yet, is that writing – and we talked about this, I think, in week one or video one or two. So we need to write in the forms of nature, that we need to study the cat, the okotillo bush outside my room right now. And we need to write in that form. We can, we can use writing and language as something to connect with nature and to mimic and honor nature and praise nature. Or we can use it as something to distance ourselves from nature. And it's one of these things that we've been given the power and we're not going back. So we might as well utilize it. Because once again, the Luddites and all the... People out there always trying to make this about, oh, well, that's why we don't need language and I try to live a simple life and all this stuff. And it's like, all right. But like I said, we've crossed that threshold, at least for a while, at least until all this stuff is solved and we can go back, I guess, to pastoral living. And I don't even know if we want that or I want that or if anybody wants that. So one of the last cool things that we that is talked about is about getting inside of our own heads and the silent voice of writing and when that came about. And it's crazy because, you know, paperback books really didn't exist. And, and, and he makes the connection that the monotheistic religions and their texts, the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran, all were the first really hardcore written texts. And a lot of those texts, though, didn't have spacing within them. So it was all had to be read. Had to, a lot of it had to be read out loud. And we actually see that in this, like in the Jewish tradition, that they read a lot of like the Torah out loud and memorize it and have to re- uh, re-speak it out loud. And in all the oral traditions, they have to say everything out loud with spacing, with pauses, with dramatizations. But with the advent of spacing, I guess by 7th century monks in you know more common Western languages, suddenly that separation started, that separation happened and we could read books in silence and get way more information out. Um, way more information we could do it on like a quantum level and be reading a, a couple books a day even if you were like a monk who who just read all day and that's what's starting to happen to us now is that the voice inside of our, our heads has vanished because uh, you know people don't really know this but until the early 1900s uh, early 20 early 20th century paperback books books weren't available to most of the people in the world you know if we're talking about classes most of the people in the world just started getting access to books at that point and thus became becoming literate and then being able to access that silent voice so they were thrust we were thrust into a world where now we are reading and we're have to live at you know in capitalism and after the industrial revolution and now with technology and with wars all these different things reinforce that nature isn't important that it doesn't matter that science and technology is the new kid on the block that it's the new gods and that has created i think actually even um, remnants of schizophrenia and stuff in our brain that we can't get out of this voice the chatterbox keeps continuing and it blew my mind that people hundreds of years ago maybe necessarily didn't have that chatterbox because they didn't understand the concept of the silent voice as much they didn't have that high strung high speed voice maybe they had one but it wasn't as coherent and as lucid as this one is and as readers i'm sure you guys know what i'm talking about you guys probably have that chatterbox and that's why I'm going to be releasing or, you know, that's why I'm doing my yoga for authors stuff because I really want to help you guys reduce that chatterbox. So that is all, everybody, for the day. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for watching. Peace. 
Shout out to all my students in the Spiritual Ecology course. It's your boy Ian from the litunderground.com, the new literary kids on the block dropping dope and free content because books can change the world. So today we are covering chapter number nine in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal, The Discourse of the Birds. And if you guys would like to join the Spiritual Ecology course, you guys can go to the link in the description below or watch the introduction uh, introduction video on the YouTube on my YouTube page. So how is everybody doing? I loved this chapter because it made me go out into nature and verify the information, verify the discourse of the birds. And you... To take part in this course, other than the house chapter, you have to be outside to feel this. You have to spend a lot of time outside to gather the raw data to be able to process all of this and grow. If we are trying to build a phenomenological consciousness that connects with nature and a natural awareness, we have to put the work in, everybody. And we've talked about changing the language, for instance, and not using words maybe such as bird brain. Have you ever talked about that? He has the brain of a bird. I've never really said that or heard him anybody say that but I've heard that before in movies and stuff and people talk about how birds are just flying rats and all these other different things but today we are going to talk about birds transcending our aesthetic fixation on them most people even the trippy or you know spiritual woke people out there the deepest they go with birds is an aesthetic fixation maybe an idealization an empathetic connection about them being in flight just like a bird but hopefully today with what we're going to learn, we can build upon that because that's a great place to start. That's better than, um, you know, hunting birds or not even noticing that they're there. You know, kids, you know, throwing rocks or shooting BB guns at birds or just ignoring birds outright. So if we're going to start there, though, and we're going to have to start by going outside. We're going to try to find the birds in your area. If you live in a suburban area or an apartment, there may be no birds to find. There be, may be nothing for you to get. So you are going to have to leave the city. You're going to have to find where the birds are because when birds are interrupted, even by humans or by sound, the discourse of the birds changes and you're not going to hear it in its natural state. You are also going to have to be able to sit and bird. By birding, you're going to have to, I, what I like to do is just bring a book or bring you know my poetry journal and sit and write for 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes and then the birds are going to become aware of you and understand that you're not going to try to kill them and get back into their natural rhythms. So that's just... A couple things to take into account here that if you're going to do this, be gentle, be silent, go to some place where birds aren't are. Birds aren't being disturbed. And a great place I would say is probably like a lake. Maybe go to a lake or something, even if you there's a, a lake inside your uh, town. And I live in Las Vegas, so it was I had to drive 30 minutes fr from my house to really find a place to sit and rest with this. But I've been resting with this. I mean, I've read this book before. I've rested all summer in Wyoming with this. And the amount, there, there was um, 25 to 30 crows a day on this tree I was uh, writing and reading under in Wyoming. And it was, it was a trip, man. And then one day, if, as you see in the spiritual ecology intro, one day uh, a, a, ra a raven came down and just murdered a crow, you know, uh, trickster on trickster energy, man. A raven came down and just destroyed this crow, man, and ate its basically its head off and was eating it, you know, alive. And that was pretty gruesome. So I have a, a the, you know, the videos of that. So anyway, animals are thinking with the whole of their body. Right now, I am engaging in sentences. You're probably chilling. Maybe you're walking, but you're probably in a relaxed, prone state like I am right now. And we are engaging in the abstract world we are engaging with symbols and with sentences and the doing symbolic exchange through youtube or on my website and animals do not or very rarely engage in that animals are always thinking with the whole of their body they jump they leap everything has a placement within the body and that isn't to say that they don't have language or higher consciousness but their their actions are not steeped in the mind it is steeped in the body and this may be, and what is cool about birds is that they do this while engaged in flight. They have the wind and torrents and all the sensation and sight, smell, hearing, and it's all exemplified while they are in the air. So they're really engaging in 
you know, gravity with the natural world. And there is a certain, as fellow animals, as fellow, you know, human animals, you know, homo sapiens, they have a degree of consciousness that we will never achieve or can even dream of understanding. So they, we need to give them the respect that they deserve. Respect meaning to look again, um, spectare, read meaning, um, again, and spectare meaning to look, to look again. We're going to look again at birds right now. And Abrams calls it a disturbed sentience and that they have up in the air and within the body. And it's weird because a lot of therapy, a lot of therapy, for instance, the yoga for authors program on the lit university on the lit underground.com has to do with claiming, reclaiming the body, understanding awareness through the body, unleashing our awareness through the body. And what, and the, this has been going on for thousands of years. And one of the main psychoanalytical thinkers to bring this into our, the forefront of Western consciousness is Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich was a pupil of Freud, you know, along with Carl Jung and Otto Rank. And Jung took it into more the active imagination and the collective subconscious, unconscious, excuse me. Otto Rank thought it was more trauma and trauma um, that we need to heal wounds through art. And Jung thought it was through tapping into the collective unconscious and doing active imagination. And Reich thought it was through the body, especially through sex and through uh, the orgasm. And it's, there's all these correlations between awareness and the body and bringing our bodies back because we can sit and think with our minds all day. We can sit and I can sit in this chair for 16 hours and never have to engage with anything and live in this abstract world other than maybe just the pain in my back and having to go to the bathroom. That's all I have to do. But coming into nature, coming into the body is a great way to unlock something within our own selves. And I think that birds are a, a great role model for us to look to. So another cool um, thing that, oh, another cool thing, another quote, let's read a quote. When we disparage the intelligence of birds or the size of their brains, we miss that flight itself is a kind of thinking, a gliding within the mind, a grace we humans rarely attain in our contemplations. Although if we are following a Falcon with our focus, we sometimes find our thoughts soaring as well. And so we see the soaring raven right here. There, birds are engaging in a deeper level of thinking. And I, I, I'm getting a little, my patience is waning a little bit in terms of like speaking, not speaking to like the really spiritual people. We need to connect with the birds, everybody. We, we need to engage in even, the Abrams doesn't talk about this, active, empathetic imagination with the birds visualization of being a bird this is what a lot of shamanic practices do and finding um spirit allies or your spirit animal is really about the journey of engaging and vis visualizing a certain animal and with birds they can see everything and humans if, okay we're going to get deep here um one time on a psychedelic trip I mean, many, let me say one time, many times when you take a heroic dose with caution, I have transcended and left my body and I have floated over where I was at. So whatever top, topographical location I was at, for instance, if I, one time I was out in the middle of the desert, I drove like two hours to a desert valley I've never been in. And I floated, listen to this, I floated over the desert and all around the valley with perfect sight. And I know that because I got to the valley and I sat there. Then once it was all done, I sobered up, you know, a long time later, I drove around the valley and I saw things that I could have never seen, but I engaged in this astral projection, but I engaged, I was like a bird in the sky floating. And it wasn't like my body, but my mind was up there looking around and I attained, that was some in other experiences like that. I feel are the peak experiences of my consciousness because I entered the fifth dimension, the fourth dimension being, being able to see everything from every single angle. Like for instance, being up in the sky, I could see everything from every single angle. I could see from the ground, but now I could see from the sky. But the fifth dimension is transcending time and space. I transcended time and space up there. I saw the world 
out of time. Uh, but so my highest peak experience, and I've also, I should just say, experiences during meditation, sober meditation, sober kundalini meditation and pranayama practices, followed by some visualization. I have achieved that also in that manner. But once again, why are all my peak experiences up there in the sky floating around? And it's interesting. It's very interesting that connection to yoga and to visualization that a lot of the best work happens up at that level. So that w- this is a little bit of a tangent, but think about that, everybody. Really try to get up there and imagine yourself being a bird because to enter the fourth dimension, be able to see things from every single angle, you need to see from the sky. And who better to look to than our fellow bird, you know, bird, fe- fellow bird, fellow animals, the birds. <laughs> So another cool point that um, Abrams talks about is how the forest is body language. And the forest, when you're out there, all the spruces and the pines, they stand there with a certain stature and they have a certain body language. All the plants do. Out in the desert, it's not as much. And I haven't actually thought about that. That's The forest really does hold a lot of body language. And the forest doesn't need any symbols or sentences to show that, to communicate that. It is shown just through its stature because long after the effect wears off of maybe the artistic aesthetic of seeing a tree in a forest is just a tree now. And it still is communicating to me though. And what is it communicating to me through? I don't know. But the bird, but birds live in trees. Birds live mostly in forests. And they are an extension, once again, of the tree. And... I just thought that's a really cool idea. So David starts to talk about the five different types of um, bird calls or the discourse between the birds. The first one being the song, you know, the bird song. <whistles> and we we hear that all the time. You hear birds singing and chirping and it's great. And that's a pretty easy one to see. And Abrams, if I remember correctly, really doesn't give a a great reason for why they do it maybe a a territorial dispute but we all know that's not what it is territorial dispute that's us being deductionist really is a he says a celebrate celebration a feeling of optimism and a feeling of happiness because i really think that they are engaged in higher level consciousness while up there in the sky i really think they do have something to be happy about because when you feel those things you feel happy like it's obvious. Second is the companion call when a birds are trying to um, stick with. And for all these, you need to go out and try and find this. You need to spend time outside. And if you're living in a winter wasteland, then you need to, you know, be outside in summer. Quit your freaking job. Like all I did over the summer in Wyoming, I had so many things to do. I needed to make money and read all these books and build this website. Didn't do a thing, but everything is still working out. But the time I spent with the birds and with the grass and with the trees was wonderful because I know what a companion call is. Um, You know, when birds are next to each other and they're trying to alert each other to each other's presence and just as a general companion call. Super cool stuff. Of course, the male to male aggression uh, discourse that doesn't happen as much, but it does happen when you see birds attacking each other. Um, The and um, the begging cries when. Um, certain birds are begging for food, especially younger birds, but this still happens even in adult birds. And five but not least is the alarm call when a predator is coming. And we signal this a lot of the time. And crows, it's been shown, actually have a an alarm call. I think I was reading, there was a study shown that, um, or maybe not a study, but, and this can be shown through anecdotal experience, is that when I was under that tree, those crows didn't caw. They didn't leave. They didn't care that I was there because they knew me day in, day out. I was not screwing with them. But when one day when my um, one of our neighbors came over, they all left. I He came over in the same exact way, the same exact direction because he was at uh, the house and then walked from the house. And they all flew away. And then there was the warning call. And it's um, been shown that um, most crows. Crow crow packs or like bird packs have a lookout, especially if they're eating or hanging out and they have a lookout. So I laughed that the day that that bird got killed was that either the lookout screwed up or the lookout got killed when that crow got uh, taken. So I think it's so cool that there's these five different modes, according to David Abrams' friend, 
uh, that birds have discourse with each other. And we can actually engage in this because all these actually have an effect on us. If it's a nice day out and the birds being optimistic, my God, we should be optimistic too. We're alive in nature. When birds are making a companion call to each other, we know that there is another bird around. Now we have two birds. When there are begging cries, we know that the youth are around and that the young are around. There's young birds, um, a young animal hang, um, hanging around us. And then when there's male-to-male -male aggression, we know that there's a fight happening. And all these have certain energy signatures. For instance, when birds were fighting, while I was out reading or writing in Wyoming... I couldn't focus. Just like a fight. If there was a fight happening right next to you, or if there's like a UFC fight or something on, you want to focus. It's hard to do stuff. Trust me, I'm, you know, love boxing and stuff. I can't multitask. I've had to just assume that if I'm going to watch it, I'm just going to sit and watch it because you don't want to miss the grand blow or whatever. So, and then the alarm call is that you know that there is now another predator around. And that you should maybe be alerted to what the heck's going on. Is it another human? Is it a wolf? Is it a grizzly bear? Those are things I have to worry about in Wyoming. And when the crows started calling, I'd start looking around like, what the hell's going on? And all these things have actually helped us in the past. And other animals understand this language also. They've been listening to this their whole life. This is actually some of the most, a lot of their auditory experience has been created by birds. Same with us. If we've lived a natural life, birds have given us a very, deep insight into language into discourse and how to engage with each other one of the cool things i've never thought about is that birds lead us to, to pray if you follow a bird of prey it will lead you to things that can be eaten that was so cool to think about that like they're attracted to other um killable things and we are pred the human predator especially if you were a forager so that helped us survive birds and their discourses helped us survive um and then we get into the whole angel thing so angels and the winged angels that we see in christianity for instance it's so weird because when there's smoke there's fire especially with christianity christianity and mormonism and all these different things they just rip off other spiritual or uh, you know traditions and you know wire it down then just enforce it and a lot of their metaphors and stuff have been effective in the past but they've just tailored it to their narrative and angels coming down and being the messengers of flight and singing where the hell do you think that comes from? Where do you think that comes from? We are the human animals, everybody. There is, you know, we don't need to call, talk about Christianity being bogus on this, this channel, but where does that come from, everybody? Where did these winged, it comes from this higher level of consciousness. They say in Christianity that um, angels live between, they're fall, angels live between um, heaven and earth they are beings that have fallen but have not fallen to the level of humans yet that's who satan was and we toss her in the canterbury tales talks about this and is that not bird consciousness is that not the consciousness and the discourse and understanding what is going on isn't that just a metaphor for all of this that the birds that these messages that come through the ether through the collective unconscious work through whatever our synapses in our brain i don't even care that they have a relation to the birds so in today's journal i'd like i'd love for you guys to oh and let's read this quote before we conclude this is a great quote this actually should have been at the start the convergence between my listening ears and my gazing eyes has brought me much deeper into my animal body and my body's world it is now indelible Delibly evident to me that these birds are not just beings of instinct, at least no more than I am, but are fully awake entities earnestly engaged in the thick of the present moment. And man, once again, I should have put that at the, at the front of my presentation, but we're not the only awake beings out there, everybody. And we can try to find aliens and create AI, but it's, it's all around us and it always has been. So for dude, I have all these great pictures of birds, but, um, for today's journal exercise, of course, you can write 100 to 200 words just about the text or what you're feeling. But for the real assignment, if you really want to engage with the text, write about your relationship with birds. What did you learn today? What has been your relationship with birds up to this point? What have you been doing with them? And then go out in nature and try to identify the five discourses we just talked about between birds. How many did you hear? How long is it going to take you to find those out? Like hold off on this journal. Really try to go out there and 
hear about birds, learn about birds. Let me know what you learned. So everybody, thank you guys for being here. Like, let keep going on the journals. There's five of you guys doing them. I'm reading them all. I still am actually going to respond to them all, but I just haven't got around to it yet. I've been busy with um, a new job and my website and yeah, that's it, everybody. So a, a new English teaching job, which is, which is crazy, teaching middle school. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, I love you guys. Peace. Shout out to all my students in the Spiritual Ecology course. It's your boy Ian from the litunderground.com here today to drop another lesson. So what is up everybody? If you guys don't know about the Lit Underground, we are the new literary kids on the block dropping uncensored, dope, free courses on all different types of literature, philosophy, psychology. If you can think about it, I am reading it and covering it at a deep level and right now, this is the Spiritual Ecology course. Go watch the introduction video or check out the link in the description below if you want to know more. But we have other business to attend to because we are covering chapter 10 in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. And today, this chapter is titled, Slight of Hand. I made the book disappear. And this is a dope chapter. And like these, I keep saying that, but these chapters keep getting better because we cannot move forward without the woo, everybody. We cannot move forward with people. If you are still stuck in nude and sleep or if you are just waking up from have just woken up because maybe some traumatic experience from nude and sleep, I don't know if you're going to really get that some dude's teacher turns himself into a raven. That might be a little bit too far-fetched for you. But for me, a psychonaut, someone who is... A psychonaut and a lifelong yoga practitioner and meditator and daily nature goer. That stuff is totally in the realm of possibility. So once again, I'm I'm just, you know, giving a warning that this we're going to enter the realm of woo. And I would like to start t talking about today is about one of the things that David, David Abram mentions. And I'm going to start well off with the story. And he talks about how when you're around powerful people or spiritual people, it has a certain effect on you. And like you can get a little bit, sometimes in the moment you feel it and you're like, whoa. But sometimes after like you you hang out with somebody or with a group of people, like you come home and you your consciousness is changed. And remember when I was 19, I went to this like spiritual conference in Philadelphia, flew out there, had a great time, learned a lot. But, you know, in the moment, I felt pretty grounded. Like, I felt elevated, and I was like, yeah, hoorah. But, like, I didn't I didn't feel, like, any, like, deep changes. But I went home, and I flew home to Las Vegas. And at the time, I was living with my parents. And I got home, and suddenly, I, I was a new guy. Like, it really affected me. Like, being around a couple hundred people who sh shared a lot of my same beliefs and values. And at the time they were all, a lot of them were smarter than me, you know, cause I was just 19 really starting to get going really had a deep profound effect on me. And I, and I felt that, but then around 7 PM one night, I think the, the night I got home or I got home, I like flew on a super late night flight. Then I had to wake up the next morning and do something. So I took a nap at like 7 PM and I have this nap and I go lucid to my dream. I have an, like a really instant moment of lucidity and we're going to be having a lucid dreaming course for writers soon too, everybody. So check out that, how to lucid dream at least a couple times a week. But so I go lucid and my dad's there in the dream, 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 Jamie. And I say to my dad, I'm like, and this is what I do sometimes. I say, tell me, tell me something that I can verify. Tell me something that no one else knows or tell me something. And then about, about, just tell me something. And I'm going to go ask you in real life about this. And my dad said, Jerry, the crow. And it's so funny. We're talking about Ravens here. He said, Jerry, the crow. And I'm like, okay. So I wake up and guess what? I walk into the next room and my dad's sleeping too. That freaking guy is sleeping too and dreaming. And I wake him up. I'm like, what were you dreaming about? Oh my God. And he's like, well, I don't you know how like parents stop dreaming because of the corporate workforce. And he's like, I don't know. And I, and I say to him, Jerry, the crow. And he's like, huh? I'm like, what, what does Jerry the Crow mean to you? And he's like, well, I never, I don't know about Jerry the Crow, but I used to raise crows 
with my friend Jerry back in Ontario, Canada. My dad's from Markham, Markham, Ontario. And he said down on our property, he, who the hell raises crows? He would raise crows and pigeons. And then, you know, they would release them every day, but then feed them, I guess, keep them overnight. I, I, I guess he was a birder or a, I don't even know what the word is. But he said, I, my next door neighbor who was my age was named Jerry and we raised crows together. I have never, I knew he raised pigeons. I never knew he raised crows and I never heard about his neighbor, Jerry, because his neighbor, Jerry only lived there for like a year and a half. It was just like an in and out type of neighbor who was, you know, a year or two older than him, than older than him. Maybe at one point in my life in my subconscious mind, he told me about that guy, but you know, I'm going with the possibility that I was so open and so activated that that's what happened. That there was a ethereal connection from room to room, especially because we were both sleeping and he gave me a piece of information. I asked and I received. So David Abrams has this really weird technique and it's so genius about how to find the dope people. I need to do this, man. Is uh, He would go into a village and he would do some sleight of hand magic and then everyone would be like, whoa, he's a magic, he's a magician, he's a shaman, he's a weirdo. We need to, we'll, we need to tell the other shop the magician in town about him and then that person would come find him and then he could you know learn the secrets the magical secrets what a smart idea it's like it's almost like peacocking like how how do you find like imagine going like i live in a suburban neighborhood right now like imagine me going door to door and like doing something like showing them like some crystals or like doing a yoga pose like just because eventually they're gonna find someone who does yoga I'm going to find someone who does yoga. And then that person's what they're going to knock on my door and be like, I hear you do yoga. That's basically what he's doing. But in a foreign country, in languages, he does not speak. And he is in the Himalayas, I think in Tibet or Nepal, if I remember correctly. And it's crazy because the elevation up there is insane. And he doesn't really mention it. But has anyone ever lived? And I, I really would appreciate if you guys could leave a comment down below. If you've ever experienced something like that where you hung out with someone spiritual or spiritual group and it changed your consciousness after. Maybe like after the experience. Let me know about that. I'm, inter I'm really interested in these synchronicities and like these experiences. Because I have a million stories similar. Maybe not as crazy as Jerry the Crow. but I, Or more crazy. I mean, you know. LSD is a hell of a drug, but, um, <laughs> high elevation is insane. And let me know down below if you've lived in a high elevation too, but I lived in Wyoming at like six, 6,500 feet. And I, you know, it changed, it changes you. Like I keep saying, like, I'm sorry. If you have a workout regimen, at like a low elevation and you go to a higher elevation, it tanks, especially if you're doing cardio or something. But David Abrams is up at like 15,000 feet up there in the Himalayas. And that really has a certain effect on the spiritual level too, because you have to really integrate into nature. And he talks about being exhausted and all these different things. So what kind of, he kind of, uh, Abrams, goes over this story about how he has this guide and the guide gets scared, but eventually he meets this teacher, man. And this teacher starts to work with him a little bit. And shaman, and I just want to do another, and this is, you guys read the chapter. Let's talk about shamanism. I think that everyone in here to get deeper into spiritual ecology should dive deeper into uh, shamanism. And I've done a lot of, a lot of the things I'm going to teach you guys in this course are shamanic things I've learned in my shamanic lessons and journeys as, you know, I really don't call myself a shaman, but I'm not averse to that label. But one of the cool techniques that shamans do is the integration of the animal and the human. And one of the main ways to do this is to, you know, find the spirit animal. And we've talked about this before, but this comes back to union archetypes. This comes back to active imagination techniques, but even transcending that and dissolving the boundaries between you and animals, dissolving the boundaries between 
you and even the forest and with nature. That's what we are really trying to do here. That's kind of the tagline here is that we're trying to dissolve the boundaries and then be able to feel these things with our new phenom phenomenological consciousness in an empathetic way and then see it through their vision. And as we see in the next chapter, that's what that's what Abram achieves. And I, I studied in a shamanic course under Don Oscar, Don Oscar Miro Casada in the a Peruvian shamanism. Sorry, I'm trying to get the right names here. Um, system and the Pachacuti Mesa tradition. That's sorry. That's what I was trying to think. And it's a very sobering tradition because I entered into shamanism very high off of hallucinogenics, you know, like really right in that wave. And doing a lot of yoga and a lot, but I, I, but suddenly I got there and we were the whole process. Like I thought that we we're going to be drumming and doing all this stuff. And it was going to be just as trippy. And he was going to give me peyote and it was going to be like the books. But what ended up happening was uh, I learned that to get to real spirituality is a very grounding experience. And when you need to ascend, you have tools to ascend, but when you're not ascending, you don't need to be ascending anymore. And that's what starts to happen to a lot of people in the, a lot of spiritual leaders. And you see this in India all the time that these guys really learn how to ascend. They really are these great people, but they never come back down to groundedness. They never come back down to groundedness and to learning and to growing and to gaining more knowledge because they have this crazy ability to enter into the ether and gain like higher metaphysical knowledge. And they can um, transcribe that back to people. And those people reinforce them because their ideas are right, but they have a lot of screwed up ideas that start to integrate with that. For instance, Osho or, um, Osho or Bhagavan is a very enlightened thinker, but for instance, he believed in eugenics operations, very not progressive. And I know, I actually know somebody who was at an event back in the nineties. I met someone at a spiritual conference and they told me this. They said that he was late early nineties, late eighties. They were at a conference and they ran into Osho in the bathroom. The, the, he was not. He was in this bathroom and he got in there and he was taking a dump. And he walks out of the bathroom and smack, he's at this Osho event and he's with Osho. And they make eye contact. And he says that Osho snapped him right into a trance, right into a, a state of samadhi. And he went totally taken over. And then Osho just leaves him and goes to the bathroom and walks out. But he was totally put in the trance but then he walked over to the meeting he want listen you know then listen to the lecture and the lecture was about eugenics and he was like what is this parallel and so what i'm trying to say is that when i entered into shamanism we were doing these rituals where we'd be drumming and meditating and it was all sober and I would create this mesa and learn about the different directions and develop this practice that I did every single day. But it felt nothing like drugs. It felt nothing like that. And over time though, it actually did. And that's one of the coolest parts about this chapter is that Abram says that Real magic is experience the, experiencing the actual moment with nature. Pure awareness is when it happens most. And that's what we're trying to do here. This chapter is great, but we're trying to dissolve boundaries, everybody. And I'm, I don't know what that photo is, is. I'm sorry. So we are trying to dissolve boundaries here. And I'm here to do whatever I need to do to help you. In whatever journal entry or message. I know some of you guys have messaged me. I'm just really caught up with a new with my new English teaching job and I'm trying to balance both and you know yo my yoga personal practice and nature time so I'm trying to do everything that I need to do so thank you guys for you know writing to me and emailing me and I just want you know to help us dissolve boundaries like I'm getting you know kind of sad but like I want to help you and do whatever you can because like you can achieve like a sense of purpose. Like you can, like I'm only here right now because of the boundaries I spent years dissolving. And then, you know, all that, you know, and then going out in nature, like the only reason you're listening to me is because of that and all these different things. And like, 
drugs and sex and even yoga and the fame and trying to get followers on Instagram and making this a career, all that stuff really takes away from, from the, just the practice of integrating with like animals again. And like, I, I've even gone away from that, you know, like I've really have a connection to like coyotes and to ravens and to certain birds. And because of like environmental things that are happening, you know, around, around my area, like I can't experience that as much anymore. Like it's really like there's a certain area I go to or used to go to. And now it's like got narcs all around, man. Like if I'm trying to be there out at night or after sunset, someone will come and find me and tell me I can't be there anymore. And it's out in the middle of the desert. It's like a wildlife refuge. And I spent 10 years of my life there almost every single night. If if there's 365 days of the year, I was there at least 325 of those days for hours. And I developed this, you know, really deep relationship and really dissolved boundaries. And in a place like where, you know, in like in the desert, there's very few places where natural water occurs. So you, you know, I've been resorted to having to, you know, go out to the desert where it's, you know, like the desert desert where it's dry and it's barren. And there's really not, you don't have access to ravens or to crows or to birds or to snakes or to bugs. You might see a jackrabbit or coyote every once in a while, but you know, it's a little bit more like, like the Las Vegas desert is not, you know, the Arizona desert or like the Texas desert or the California desert. It is a very, it's like the driest, most barren one, or it's the Mojave desert, man. Like things do not live out here. And I'm just happy that you guys are here. I'm just happy I'm making these videos because I want to do this more too. I'm like really thankful for David Abrams that, you know, he's talking about this and this is really powerful stuff. And like, whatever I can do to help you do this, man, whatever I can do to help you like on this path of especially just dissolving these boundaries between you and nature, like that's more important than anything I can do. I'm going to one day, everybody have thousands of videos, maybe thousands of subscribers, maybe millions, hopefully millions, but All that stuff, you know, courses on Cormac McCarthy and Haruki Mirakami and the bicameral mind. None of that really means anything. And like, I don't know if I just need to keep talking about this forever, but it's very, very, very hard to, you know, really figure out what to do, everybody, because like, this is what matters most. This is what the human journey is about. And like you doing this is the most important thing that you'll ever do for yourself. And it, I'm, you know, I'm just stuck in my heart and in my emotions right now, like trying to figure out like what I can do more to, you know, really, you know, I don't need to, (laughs) I don't want to carbon tax. I don't need climate change, man. I just want people to like feel this man because and like, why, why in these ancients, why is there always just one shaman? Why isn't everybody the freaking shaman? Like, is there, is it always, is there always just been haters? Is that it? Like, is there always just been goobs, bro? Is there always just a kid? Like, you know, like I'm teaching right now, these classes are always just a kid. That's like not going to do the work until the last night or like, just not going to do it at all. Or just always not try and just ask for answers. Is there, is that always just going to happen? Like, is there any way to prevent those people from like, not being here than corrupting everyone else. Cause all it takes is one. Like when I'm in class, man, all it takes is like one or two students to ruin the whole vibe. And then like everyone, it's like, it's like, I'm trying, I'm like swimming in the ocean, trying to throw people like a rope to hold on to, but they have to carry everyone just, but before those two kids, like we were just chilling on a ship. That's all that was going like everyone was nice and calm and everything was fine and we were all on the journey. But then all it takes is just like one or two people, man. So it's like, is that what happens in villages? And then those one or two people, if they can't get roped back in, just it just is endless. And I think that's like the virus. That's like evil. That's like the adversary. Like whatever that is, man, that like disconnects us from this. And a lot of it is symbols and words. But I think that's even like not th- going deep enough. It's really Base consciousness and not even base con because base, you know, it's weird because like we talk about the muladhara chakra, like and base consciousness, like in yoga, but that's almost an insult to be like our animal instincts and like how those aren't important. So 
yeah man i just let me know about your thoughts about that if you've made it this far like thank you for coming like thank you for like coming on this like tangent with me i did not this is not what the note this is not what i was planning but what do we do everybody like i'm gonna finish this series it's gonna be however 100 plus videos whatever but i'm asking you if you've made it this far like what do we do and I want to help, you know, help you out. And one of the best ways to do this is that I was in like a pretty bad relationship and I was so, man, so hurt that and, you know, manipulated and stuff that I, I didn't smoke weed or like really do caffeine or drink alcohol or really do anything. I did, I did nothing. I basically did nothing for a year and or more a year and a half, 18 months. And, in eight, those 18 months, man, all I did, everybody, was cry and, you know, be really sad. And But I would go out in nature and I would try to write and I would be so tired because, you know, if you've ever been in a bad relationship, you don't really sleep or you don't really eat. And I was, I'm 6'3", and I was like 160 pounds, man. Like I was like a shell. I'm 20 pounds heavier now. And it wasn't like I was 160 with muscle. I was like skinny fat 160. And I would just, I would just go out into nature and, and I, this process finally happened and it was weird because I had done it for years before. Like I had done sh like shamanic stuff and, but it was, the weed was always hanging over my head though. And other things like the pursuit of like a relationship and all these things. But when I was like at rock bottom, like this is when this stuff actually came for me. So like. No matter where you're at, like you can do this, man. And it might actually be better if you are at like in a bad spot to like th to go out and do this. And, and, and I was just trying to mention that, like I was sober because of how bad I was doing. Like if I was not sober, like I, things would have even gotten worse in terms of like my emotional fortitude because I did, I had none. I was, you know, on the brink of, of killing myself. You know, if I'm just going to be honest, like I, it was a really, really bad point. And Yeah, everybody, you know, I don't want to sit and cry, but I'm already crying. Anyway, thank you guys for joining. I'm I'm not going to take this any longer, but, you know, you guys can do this, man. Whatever it is, whoever is listening in the future, in the past, whatever the fuck, you guys can do this. Thank you guys for being here from the bottom of my heart. Like, let me know how you're doing. Let me know how I'm doing. If I can make something better about this course. Thank you guys for being here. <laughs> Shout out to all my students in the Spiritual Ecology course. It's your boy Ian from the litunderground.com here today to drop another lesson. So what is up, everybody? If you guys don't know about the Lit Underground, we are the new literary kids on the block dropping uncensored, dope, free courses on all different types of literature, philosophy, psychology. If you can think about it, I am reading it and covering it at a deep level. And right now... This is the Spiritual Ecology course. Go watch the introduction video or check out the link in the description below if you want to know more. But we have other business to attend to because we are covering chapter 10 in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. And today, this chapter is titled, Slight of Hand. I made the book disappear. And this is a dope chapter. And like these, I keep saying that, but these chapters keep getting better because we cannot move forward without the woo, everybody. We cannot move forward with people. If you are still stuck in nude and sleep or if you are just waking up from have just woken up because maybe some traumatic experience from nude and sleep, I don't know if you're going to really get that some dude's teacher turns himself into a raven. That might be a little bit too far-fetched for you. But for me, a psychonaut, someone who is... A psychonaut and a lifelong yoga practitioner and meditator and daily nature goer. That stuff is totally in the realm of possibility. So once again, I'm I'm just, you know, giving a warning that this we're going to enter the realm of woo. And I would like to start t talking about today is about one of the things that David, David Abram mentions. And I'm going to start well off with the story. And he talks about how when you're around powerful people or spiritual people, it has a certain effect on you. And like you can get a little bit, sometimes in the moment you feel it and you're like, whoa. But sometimes after like you you hang out with somebody or with a group of people, like you come home and you your consciousness is changed. And 
remember when I was 19, I went to this like spiritual conference in Philadelphia, flew out there, had a great time, learned a lot. But, you know, in the moment I felt pretty grounded, like I felt elevated and I was like, yeah, hoorah. But like I didn't I didn't feel like any like deep changes, but I went home and I flew home to Las Vegas. And at the time I was living with my parents and I got home and suddenly I, I was a new guy. Like it really affected me, like being around a couple hundred people who sh- shared a lot of my same beliefs and values. And at the time they were all, a lot of them were smarter than me, you know, cause I was just 19 really starting to get going really had a deep profound effect on me. And I, and I felt that, but then around 7 PM one night, I think the, the night I got home or I got home, I like flew on a super late night flight. Then I had to wake up the next morning and do something. So I took a nap at like 7 PM and I have this nap and I go lucid to my dream. I have an, like a really instant moment of lucidity and we're going to be having a lucid dreaming course for writers soon too, everybody. So check out that, how to lucid dream at least a couple times a week. But so I go lucid and my dad's there in the dream, 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 Jamie. And I say to my dad, I'm like, and this is what I do sometimes. I say, tell me, tell me something that I can verify. Tell me something that no one else knows or tell me something. And then about, about, just tell me something. And I'm going to go ask you in real life about this. And my dad said, Jerry, the crow. And it's so funny. We're talking about Ravens here. He said, Jerry, the crow. And I'm like, okay. So I wake up and guess what? I walk into the next room and my dad's sleeping too. That freaking guy is sleeping too and dreaming. I wake him up. I'm like, what were you dreaming about? Oh my God. And he's like, well, you know how like parents stop dreaming because of the corporate workforce. And he's like, I don't know. And I, and I say to him, Jerry, the crow, and he's like, huh? I'm like, what What does Jerry the Crow mean to you? And he's like, well, I never, I don't know about Jerry the Crow, but I used to raise crows with my friend Jerry back in Ontario, Canada. My dad's from Markham, Markham, Ontario. And he said down on our property, he, who the hell raises crows? He would raise crows and pigeons and then, you know, they would release them every day, but then feed them, I guess, keep them overnight. I, I, I guess he was a birder or a, I don't even know what the word is, but he said, I, my next door neighbor who was my age was named Jerry and we raised crows together. I have never, I knew he raised pigeons. I never knew he raised crows and I never heard about his neighbor, Jerry, because his neighbor, Jerry only lived there for like a year and a half. It was just like an in and out type of neighbor who was, you know, a year or two older than him, than older than him. Maybe at one point in my life in my subconscious mind, he told me about that guy, but you know, I'm going with the possibility that I was so open and so activated that that's what happened, that there was a ethereal connection from room to room, especially because we were both sleeping and he gave me a piece of information. I asked and I received. So David Abrams has this really weird technique and it's so genius about how to find the dope people. I need to do this, man, is uh, he would go into a village and he would do some sleight of hand magic and then everyone would be like, whoa, he's a magic, he's a magician, he's a shaman, he's a weirdo. We need to, we'll, we need to tell the other shop the magician in town about him. And then that person would come find him. And then he could, you know, learn the secrets, the magical secrets. What a smart idea. It's like, it's almost like peacocking. Like how, how do you find, like imagine going, like I live in a suburban neighborhood right now. Like imagine me going door to door and like doing something like showing them like some crystals or like doing a yoga pose, like just cause eventually they're going to find someone who does yoga. I'm going to find someone who does yoga. And then that person's what they're going to knock on my door and be like, I hear you do yoga. That's basically what he's doing. But in a foreign country in languages, he does not speak. And he is in the Himalayas, I think in Tibet or Nepal, if I remember correctly. And it's crazy because the elevation up there is insane and he doesn't really mention it, but has anyone ever lived? And I, I really would appreciate if you guys could leave a comment down below, if you've ever experienced something like that, where you hung out with someone spiritual or spiritual group and it changed your consciousness after, maybe like after the experience, let me know about that. I'm in, I'm really interested in these synchronicities and like these experiences because I have a million stories similar, maybe not as crazy as Jerry the crow, but I, or more crazy. I mean, you know, LSD is a hell of a drug, but, um, (laughs) 
high elevation is insane. And let me know down below if you've lived in a high elevation too. But I lived in Wyoming at like 6,500 6, feet. And I, you know, it changed. It changes you. Like, I keep saying like. I'm sorry. If you have a workout regimen at like a low elevation and you go to a higher elevation, it tanks, especially if you're doing cardio or something. But David Abrams is up at like 15,000 feet up there in the Himalayas. And that really has a certain effect on the spiritual level too, because you have to really integrate into nature. And he talks about being exhausted and all these different things. So what kind of, he kind of, uh, Abrams goes over this story about how he has this guide and the guide gets scared, but eventually he meets this teacher, man. And this teacher starts to work with him a little bit. And Shaman, and I just want to do another, and this is, you guys read the chapter. Let's talk about shamanism. I think that everyone in here to get deeper into spiritual ecology should dive deeper into uh, shamanism. And I've done a lot of, a lot of the things I'm going to teach you guys in this course are shamanic. Things I've learned in my shamanic lessons and journeys as, you know, I really don't call myself a shaman, but I'm not averse to that label. But one of the cool techniques that shamans do is the integration of the animal and the human. And one of the main ways to do this is to, you know, find the spirit animal. And we've talked about this before, but this comes back to union archetypes. This comes back to active imagination techniques, but even transcending that and dissolving the boundaries between you and animals, dissolving the boundaries between you and even the forest and with nature. That's what we are really trying to do here. That's kind of the tagline here is that we're trying to dissolve the boundaries and then be able to feel these things with our new phenom phenomenological consciousness in an empathetic way and then see it through their vision. And as we see in the next chapter, that's what, that's what Abram achieves. And I, I studied in a shamanic course under Don Oscar, Don Oscar Miro Casada in the a Peruvian shamanism. Sorry, I'm trying to get the right names here. Um, system and the Pachacuti Mesa tradition. That's sorry. That's what I was trying to think. And it's a very sobering tradition because I entered into shamanism very high off of hallucinogenics, you know, like really right in that wave. And, doing a lot of yoga and a lot, but I, I, but suddenly I got there and we were the whole process. Like I thought that we we're going to be drumming and doing all this stuff. And it was going to be just as trippy. And he was going to give me peyote and it was going to be like the books. But what ended up happening was uh, I learned that to get to real spirituality is a very grounding experience. And when you need to ascend, you have tools to ascend, but when you're not ascending, you don't need to be ascending anymore. And that's what starts to happen to a lot of people in the, a lot of spiritual leaders. And you see this in India all the time that these guys really learn how to ascend. They really are these great people, but they never come back down to groundedness. They never come back down to groundedness and to learning and to growing and to gaining more knowledge because they have this crazy ability to enter into the ether and gain like higher metaphysical knowledge. And they can um, transcribe that back to people. And those people reinforce them because their ideas are right, but they have a lot of screwed up ideas that start to integrate with that. For instance, Osho or, um, Osho or Bhagavan is a very enlightened thinker, but for instance, he believed in eugenics operations, very not progressive. And I know, I actually know somebody who was at an event back in the nineties. I met someone at a spiritual conference and they told me this. They said that he was late early nineties, late eighties. They were at a conference and they ran into Osho in the bathroom. The, the, he was not. He was in this bathroom and he got in there and he was taking a dump. And he walks out of the bathroom and smack. He's at this Osho event and he's with Osho and they make eye contact. And he says that Osho snapped him right into a trance, right into a, a state of samadhi. And he went totally taken over. And then Osho just leaves him and goes to the bathroom and walks out. But he was totally put in the trance but then he walked over to the meeting he want listen you know then listen to the lecture and the lecture was about eugenics and he was like what is this parallel and 
So what I'm trying to say is that when I entered into shamanism, we were doing these rituals where we'd be drumming and meditating and it was all sober. And I would create this mesa and learn about the different directions and develop this practice that I did every single day. But it felt nothing like drugs. It felt nothing like that. And over time though, it actually did. And that's one of the coolest parts about this chapter is that Abram says that real magic is experience the experiencing the actual moment with nature. Pure awareness is when it happens most. And that's what we're trying to do here. This chapter is great, but we're trying to dissolve boundaries, everybody. And I'm, I don't know what that photo was, is. I'm sorry. So we are trying to dissolve boundaries here. And I'm here to do whatever I need to do to help you in whatever journal entry or message. I know some of you guys have messaged me. I'm just really caught up with a new, with my new English teaching job and I'm trying to balance both and, you know, yo my yoga personal practice and nature time. So I'm trying to do everything that I need to do. So thank you guys for, you know, writing to me and emailing me. And I just want, you know, to help us dissolve boundaries. Like I'm getting, you know, kind of sad, but like, I want to help you and do whatever you can, because like you can achieve like a sense of purpose. Like you can, like, I'm only here right now because of the boundaries I spent years dissolving. And then, you know, all that, you know, and then going out in nature, like the only reason you're listening to me is because of that and all these different things. And like drugs and sex and even yoga and the fame and trying to get followers on Instagram and making this a career, all that stuff really takes away from, from the, just the practice of integrating with like animals again. And like, I, I've even gone away from that, you know, like I've really have a connection to like coyotes and to ravens and to certain birds. And because of like environmental things that are happening, you know, around, around my area, like I can't experience that as much anymore. Like it's really like there's a certain area I go to or used to go to. And now it's like got narcs all around, man. Like if I'm trying to be there out at night or after sunset, someone will come and find me and tell me I can't be there anymore. And it's out in the middle of the desert. It's like a wildlife refuge. And I spent 10 years of my life there almost every single night. If, if there's 365 days of the year, I was there at least 325 of those days for hours and I developed this, you know, really deep relationship and really dissolved boundaries. And in a place like where, you know, in like in the desert, there's very few places where natural water occurs. So you, you know, I've been resorted to having to, you know, go out to the desert where it's, you know, like the desert desert where it's dry and it's barren and there's really not, you don't have access to ravens or to crows or to birds or to snakes or to bugs. You might see a jackrabbit or a coyote every once in a while, but you know, it's a little bit more like, like the Las Vegas desert is not, you know, the Arizona desert or like the Texas desert or the California desert. It is a very, it's like the driest, most barren one, or it's the Mojave desert, man. Like things do not live out here. And I'm just happy that you guys are here. I'm just happy I'm making these videos because I want to do this more too. I'm like really thankful for David Abrams that, you know, he's talking about this and this is really powerful stuff. And like, whatever I can do to help you do this, man, whatever I can do to help you like on this path of, especially just dissolving these boundaries between you and nature, like that's more important than anything I can do. I'm going to one day, everybody have thousands of videos, maybe thousands of subscribers, maybe millions, hopefully millions, but all that stuff, you know, courses on Cormac McCarthy and Haruki Murakami and the bicameral mind. None of that really means anything. And like, I don't know if I just need to keep talking about this forever, but it's very, very, very hard to, you know, really tr figure out what to do everybody because like, this is what matters most. This is what the human journey is about. And like you doing this is the most important thing that you'll ever do for yourself. And it, I'm, you know, I'm just stuck in my heart and in my emotions right now, like trying to figure out like what I can do more to, you know, really 
you know, I don't need to, <laughs> I don't want a carbon tax. I don't need climate change, man. I just want people to like feel this man because, and like, why, why in these ancients, why is there always just one shaman? Why isn't everybody the freaking shaman? Like, is there, is it always, is there always just been haters? Is that it? Like, is there always just been goobs, bro? Is there always just a kid like, you know, like I'm teaching right now, these classes are always just a kid that's like not going to do the work until the last night or like just not going to do it at all or just always not try and just ask for answers. Is there, is that always just going to happen? Like, is there any way to prevent those people from like not being here and then corrupting everyone else? Cause all it takes is one. Like when I'm in class, man, all it takes is like one or two students to ruin the whole vibe. And then like everyone, it's like, it's like I'm trying I'm like swimming in the ocean trying to throw people like a rope to hold on to but they have to carry everyone just but before those two kids like we were just chilling on a ship. That's all that was going like everyone was nice and calm and everything was fine and we were all on the journey. But then all it takes is just like one or two people, man. So it's like is that what happens in villages and then those one or two people if they can't get rope back in just it just is endless and I think that's like the virus. That's like evil that's like the adversary like whatever that is man that like disconnects us from this and a lot of it is symbols and words but i think that's even like not th going deep enough it's really base consciousness and not even base because con base you know it's weird because like we talk about the muladhara chakra like and base consciousness like in yoga but that's almost an insult to be like our animal instincts and like how those aren't important so yeah, man, I just, let me know about your thoughts about that. If you've made it this far, like, thank you for coming. Like, thank you for, like, coming on this, like, tangent with me. I did not, this is not what the note, this is not what I was planning. But what do we do, everybody? Like, I'm going to finish this series. It's going to be however 100 plus videos, whatever. But I'm asking you if you've made it this far, like, what do we do? And I want to, help you know, help you out. And one of the best ways to do this is that, I was in like a pretty bad relationship and I was so, man, so hurt that and, you know, manipulated and stuff that I, I didn't smoke weed or like really do caffeine or drink alcohol or really do anything. I, I did nothing. I basically did nothing for a year and or more, a year and a half, 18 months. And in eight, those 18 months, man, all I did, everybody was cry and, you know, be really sad and but I would go out in nature and I would try to write and I would be so tired because you know if you've ever been in a bad relationship you don't really sleep or you don't really eat and I was I'm 6'3 and I was like 160 pounds man like I was like a shell I'm 20 pounds heavier now and it wasn't like I was 160 with muscle I was like skinny fat 160 and I would just I would just go out into nature and and I, this process finally happened and it was weird because I had done it for years before. Like I had done sh like shamanic stuff and, but it was, the weed was always hanging over my head though. And other things like the pursuit of like a relationship and all these things. But when I was like at rock bottom, like this is when this stuff actually came for me. So like no matter where you're at, like you can do this, man. And it might actually be better if you are at like in a bad spot to like th to go out and do this. And, and, and I was just trying to mention that, like I was sober because of how bad I was doing. Like if I was not sober, like I, things would have even gotten worse in terms of like my emotional fortitude, because I did, I had none. I was, you know, on the brink of, of killing myself. You know, if I'm just going to be honest, like I, it was a really, really bad point. And yeah, everybody, you know, I'm don't want to sit and cry, but I'm already crying. Anyway, thank you guys for joining. I'm, I'm not going to take this any longer, but you know, you guys can do this, man. Whatever it is, whoever is listening in the future, in the past, whatever the fuck, you guys can do this. Thank you guys for being here from the bottom of my heart. Like, let me know how you're doing. Let me know how I'm doing. If I can make something better about this course. Thank you guys for being here. What is up, everybody? It's your boy Ian from the litunderground.com, the leader in free and dope literature, psychology, philosophy courses.
because we are trying to change the world through books and knowledge. So we made it, everybody, the last official chapter of David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. Wow, I've learned a lot on this reread and having to read it slower and talk about it. Like it has changed my life as I talked about in the sight of hand video where I started crying. Um, so if you guys are new, go to the link in the description below or watch the intro video on this channel because we are going deep once again today and talking about oral traditions. And we are covering chapter 12, I think, in David Abrams' book, Becoming Animal. I already talked about that, the real and its wonder. So the first point he talks about, which I thought was really cool, was I'm sure you've experienced this before. You've maybe been on a solo hike or something. You've been out and you've just done nothing. It's just been you and your thoughts and nature and or even a backpacking trip. And then as soon as you hit the first sign of words or even civilization, but in this sense, it was put waste here for David. It throws everything off. Like I remember this happened a couple months ago. I did a huge hike, man, like up to the top of Mount Charleston, the largest peak in Las Vegas in the Las Vegas Valley. And as I was coming back down, I saw this avalanche sign, this or this sign that talks about how the ski, like you don't touch rockets that you find because the ski patrol are shooting rockets up there to, to for avalanche prevention. And I was just like, what the hell is going on? Like, why would they, why would I find a rocket on the side of this mountain? And you know, that, that kind of shook me out. And that, has that ever happened to you? That's a comment I would like you guys to leave down below today. Has that, have you ever been ripped out how David was ripped out? And it's interesting because like I write eco poetry. I am the, des the desert poet trying to be the greatest of all time, even though I don't have very much competition, but still trying to be the greatest, everybody. And when I'm out there preparing my poetry, I like to sit and like wander around in nature and spend some time out there. And then, you know, I start getting the magical feeling. And then when I start writing poetry, man, that magical feeling starts to go, go away. And because I'm writing poetry, which is like the most magical art of like writing, medium of writing, it doesn't go as way, away as fast as if I was going to start writing like an essay or something. But it starts to fade and I'm like trying to ride the high and like I'm trying to get some really good uh, lines out before suddenly I'm just now stuck in the world of symbol and words again. And to get it back, I have to sit and relax even for a couple minutes and find a nice spot and like... Look at some birds or like if you're in the desert, we may not have any birds, but, you know, just look around and feel and hopefully, you know, gain that back to, to continue on. So I thought that was really cool. And the rest of this chapter is really talking about oral tradition. And this is such a cool concept. And I really think that David hit all this right on the nail. And he talks about how oral awareness is really just of the local terrain that I am out there being the desert poet because I have lived in the desert 26 out of the 28 years of my life and have spent most of my days for the last 14 years out in the desert. I have experience. I can share that experience through an oral storytelling to like people. And I've done that before. I've taken people out to the desert and shown them a whole new world and Hopefully I'll do that with my writing, but nothing will compare to the times where I've taken people out to the desert and told them the stories that I've experienced. Like one time I was, I, I, I'm one of, I'm novel in progress right now. It's taking place in Southern Tucson, historical novel and the Tohono Odom Native American tribe has something to do with that. And I was like, how the hell am I going to like get access to the, the Tohono Odom? And like, not just get their approval to write about them, but just get some good. I'm not, they're like very secondary too. So it's not like I would have to like, I'm the, yeah, that it's not like there's any, they're not really central to the story. But I was like at the time they were though, I've kind of phased that out, but I'm out in the desert and I put this intention out there and I'm walking, right? And I'm walking, I'm walking and I never see anybody out there. Like, holy shit. And I walked for a couple hours and then I come back to my car and I'm out in the, like what I mean, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I drove 30 minutes outside of the town, not a building in sight. Then drove 20 minutes out into the desert and then parked my car. I come back and I'm walking and it's like dark now. It's like night. And I see someone walking toward me. And I'm like, oh shit. And it's this lady and she's like, hey, hey. And I'm like, hey. And 
we start talking and she's like really ethereal and kind of out there a little bit whim whimsical. And then she says, I worked for the Tohono Odom for years. And this is where you need to go to get into contact with them. I'm like, well, can I get your phone number? Can I get someone in the tribe's phone number? And she's like, no, I don't really use phones anymore. And I don't know if I don't feel comfortable giving you any, any of their phone numbers. Cause you know, they're just kind of the, these people who I do know are very reserved. And I was like, all right. And I was like, who the hell was this crazy lady? But then the whole time I'm thinking this girl, is this lady real? And then sure enough, the location and place and people she told me to go and talk to was a hundred percent correct. The place I would have never found, but had everything I needed. And they had no idea who this lady was. Was that lady real or not real? Another time I was out in the desert. I'm just going to drop a couple of these stories for you with weird ladies out in the middle of the desert, dude, like same type of situation, different location. And I hear beaches and I'm out there chilling. Like, and it's almost once again, almost like nocturnal twilight. I'm almost there. I'm walking back here. Beaches, peaches. And I'm like, what the hell? And I see a lady and I'm like, Hey, and she's like, Hey, she's like, have you seen a black cat? And dude, we are like out. Like, like I said, we're like, it's a 30 minute drive on a highway. Like we're a good 40 miles away from civilization. And I'm like, no, I haven't seen a black cat out here. She's like, yeah, I lost my cat over on the other side of Las Vegas Valley, like an hour and a half away. And he was spotted the other day right around this area. I'm like, spotted by who? And who knew it was your cat? I'm like, and she's like, yeah, if you see him, let me know. And that's all she said. And I was like, all right, I'll let you know. And I, once again, there was no exchange of it. She didn't say, hey, let me know at barb1 at gmail.com. No, she said, let me know. And so I moved on and left and I never saw her again. Those are stories about the desert, man. Those, that's, that's the, these kind of the weird alien stories are from the desert. Like those are stories that only I can share. Like shit like that doesn't happen maybe out in the woods. Like you don't, there's a reason Roswell, Arizona, that alien stories are like run amok because there's like a certain nature and a certain, like, you know, there's like more Bigfoot and abduction stories out in the woods and like creepy, crazy things, monsters. But out in the desert, it's like, Things have to come out of nowhere and like grab you. Um, I mean, was that the, did I make contact with, the, were those ladies, the aliens, everybody? I don't know. But see, these are stories that when I tell someone we're out in the woods at nocturnal twilight and I'm telling them that and like, maybe we'll see somebody tonight, you know, it, it hits a little bit harder, even though I felt like those kind of stories still smack a little bit, even over this virtual reality that you're listening to me through right now. So he, David, he, David Abrams, lays out t uh, 10 ways that about 10 things about oral tradition, basically. And the first one is that oral awareness is about the local terrain. And we just talked about that. Two is that it is a shared perception. It is us having the perception of the local terrain and something else. It takes two to tango and oops, create a story. Friends, we've talked about this the whole time. It's the co-creative experience, if not just with uh, another human, but with a rock. It all is interplay, and we have an impact on it, and it has an impact on us. Number three, animate and inanimate are the same and have all and all have pulses. And this is something that like nobody once again wants to get into. The one of the only comments I've gotten so far on this course, like in the YouTube comments, is like, "Are rocks and stones really rocks and wood really animate?" and <laughs> I was just like, you know, read the book, man. Like, I don't, like, obviously they are, but to get into the oral world, everybody, and that's what, you know, we're, I'm just going to mention this now. To get into this world that we see right here, man, it, there are, to give it life, we have to get rid of the words. To come out here and to see the possibilities, it has to happen through the oral tradition because. It, that tradition comes from the terrain. It is a terrain. It is an extension of that. The, you know, this video is not. It is not that. It is something else. It's an educational tool, but it is not that. So, number four is that all things speech. 
speak. Each has its own influential and expressive power that even the rock and all these different things, all of them have a place and have their own mode of expression. And then number five, there is subjectivity that if we accept all this, that all of us just have our own perception of this natural land and everything. And it's a totally subjective world because every blade of grass also has its own form of expression. Six is that the earth is a story and we are the characters. Not that we are the stories and the earth is the character, that the earth is the story. The earth is the foundational axiomatic principle. And we are just characters in that story. And we are going to leave one day and the earth is going to remain. Um, number seven is time is not linear. And that is a very important thing because when you're out there in nature, things move in different ways. It's not cyclical. And the different seasons and different places give a different sense of time and what is going on. I mean, even just the seasons and the, the uh, rising and setting of the sun at earlier times or later times all have an influence. But those things aren't linked to time unless we link it to time. And really getting back down to this phenomenological awareness requires us to abandon time as much as we can and you know one time of i think in the cosmic trigger series by robert anton wilson he talks about living on it creating his own calendar and living on a new calendar i think that would be a really cool thing to do honestly is to live on our own calendar i might want to get back into that again man is like what the hell is the calendar man and you know maybe living like on the astrological calendar starting with aries you know first uh, cause that's where, you know, the year starts and with that, or, you know, there's a couple different interpretations, uh, to that, or actually some calendars start in December, uh, astrological calendars eight, we are, excuse me, this is nine, but I, I want sorry, my numbers are screwed up nine. We are immersed in earth's imagination and dreams. If we are characters in the story, that's why we have dreams. That's why it's so impactful to us. We are a part of the story, our dreams, our thoughts, our creativity, can come from us, but it also a lot of the time comes from the earth and it is this living force that is all around us. And last but not least though, our story is our own. We have been given this on earth to chart our own story. All, all, of, us, all of us subjective beings out there have the ability to chart our own story. And I think that is just like a really cool conclusion. And this is all what builds up the oral tradition that we all have our own story. Like that is we really look at all this like the shared perception it's like sharing to, to understand oral stories we have a connection with the coyote the rocks have life all things speak everything has an opportunity to live everything has a subjective angle the earth is living and we are just characters in it and are under its almost influence and mercy at some level time is not linear like native american traditions a lot didn't even have the concept of time we are immersed in Earth's imagination and dreams. And that's why dreams and visions are so big and a part of the Native American tradition. And then our story is our own. That's just the classic hero arc that like we can go out and, you know, create our own storyline. And David's recommendation is that we need to acknowledge the mystery and return to natural awareness, everybody. The mystery of the earth, the mystery that we don't know. Because when you acknowledge that mystery, then you can move into a different plane of consciousness. We can finally move into this plane where we don't have to know and we can live a non-violent and non-hierarchical life because that's the goal, everybody, is to live a non, you know, live a non-violent and non-hierarchical life and then supplement that with na natural awareness and then that should end 99.9% .9 of the problems on earth. That's the real thing we need to worry about, not about climate change. I mean, that's important too. But bringing that to people and getting that acknowledgement, because if we can't acknowledge that, it's we're not going anywhere. So another cool thing that David talked about was religious texts and how the writing down of sacred texts made all ruined the natural consciousness, and it forced us not to go out and experience all this. Because we have, for instance, I love yoga. I love, you know, the Ramayana for instance, but I am not an Indian and it doesn't really matter if I'm not an Indian, but I've never been to India. I've never spent in, not just, I haven't been, in, I haven't spent years there. I don't really understand those traditions. So they can activate me in a certain way, but desert traditions and desert stories like Dune, Dune spoke to me in a way no book has ever spoken me to me before because it, I felt like I was heard for the first time. Like I was 
spoken to out of natural consciousness because there are a couple uh like sonoran strange there's like a couple books that take place in the desert but dune was the first that or and one of the only that uses the desert to change consciousness through the spice and through the land and that spoke to me and that was a part of my tradition and that awoke me more than books that are objectively better than that book it changed my life and i think that's the same for all these different types of people and if i was I was just told that. Um, I mean, I was I, I read that story to myself. If I was told that story, like just a basic three-hour version of that, I would have my mind blown even more. If I heard about these people and what they were doing, I had this great story to tell using all aspects of their body, I would have my mind blown. It would be great. And I think that's what we need to search out, everybody, is... And quote, the local earth in effect was the primary mnemonic or memory trigger for remembering the oral tales. And that's what we're missing out on, everybody. And the not not hearing oral tales of from those around us have muted the land and the power of the land. Us not having oral tales at all in person, but especially ones that take place in our own land, have are causing serious problems to our psychology and to our society. And that's something I want to do in my local community. After I read this, I said, I want to do oral storytelling in the desert of my area, in my area. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I encourage you to do the same thing. Create a meetup group, market it, Instagram page, whatever. Do it with your friends. Do it with your, even if there's just two people, eventually someone else is going to show up if you market it hard enough and make it free and go out there and speak in the land. If you live in the snow, stand out there for, make it 30 minutes long and just everyone says something, tells a story, exuberates themselves out in the land that you all live in. I think it will really change who we are. And so then David lays it all out in three different areas that there's the oral, the local level. Oral tales are like the local level, what we're talking about, like bringing people together. We can, I can help activate people's consciousness through my desert tales and my desert poems and my desert stories. Books are more a cosmopolitan thing that we can understand people in a very wide ranging group and we can take them wherever. And then the digital realm, like what this is, it's global, man. Like I have viewers from all around the world. 100 plus countries who are listening to this right now. Where, where are you from? You know? And, but it all starts with the oral tales. It all starts on a local level. I am nothing without the, I would not be here. I would be a nobody. I would just be another employee if I didn't experience what I did in the desert and learn stories and create my own mythology around it. That is my base. That is literally my axiomatic ground that I am standing on for all creativity. I, Everything I achieve is because of my relationship to that. And I think the same should be maybe said for you. And if you're trying to make progress, that'd be a great place to start with. Because, you know, you see this with influencers and all these people is that they just seem hollow. They seem empty because they have this digital and global success, but they don't have any roots at home. So let's bring it back locally, everybody. Let's talk to the students. Let's talk about everything that is going on. Let's talk to young people, old people. Let's, you know, bring this back together and make this experience known again. Oral storytelling doesn't need to be relegated to Native American tribes or to just one. It can be all of us, man, because at one point we all were oral storytellers. We all participated in this tradition. So that's it for today, everybody. I'm going to have a conclusion video up. Go check that out because in that there are the book report prompts for your book report that you hopefully are going to write and I am going to read and edit and review. So thank you for being here. Shout out to all my students who have now completed the first book of the spiritual ecology course because today we are covering the conclusion in david abram's book becoming animal and if you guys are just hopping into the course check out the link in the description below hit the subscribe button or watch the introduction video on the channel to get all of the details so david wraps all this up in a very beautiful way because he touches upon a lot of the points that we have discussed throughout this course and throughout the book 
And the first thing that he mentions is that literature, when translated to Latin, means letter, and letter means fact, according to David. The analysis. And this is not an oral culture because an oral, oral culture has nothing to do with fact. It has to do with having an axiomatic relationship with the, your local terrain and then creating stories with that. And it's not even a metaphor. Once again, metaphor is rooted in fact and analysis. It's not metaphorical. It's not literal because it, there, Oral stories don't even function in that realm. When you involve the whole body, when you involve consciousness and awareness and live performance, none of those things matter. Metaphor and being literal, that doesn't matter. And everyone knows that doesn't matter, except now we have the random goofballs who will say, oh, turtles stacked up on ton of, upon other turtles. What a, what a bunch of idiots, you know? Or like, wow, what a cool tradition. But like, they're calling, anytime you, and not analyze it or try to talk about an oral tradition, you, you're just, it's never going to work. And we can talk about it and be like, wow, it's just a whole different analysis. We can look at Christi Christianity and say, wow, that's a bunch of BS because they actually believe that and became a warring tribe and like pushed that upon other people. And you could say that Native Americans were warring tribes also and maybe pushed their beliefs on other people. But with the lack of, time awareness and the lack of the concepts of metaphor and things being literal in fact and even even we could call the scientific method and uh, the native americans didn't have the wheel when the uh, the westerners came there was a lot of things that weren't happening yet in terms of civilization and the and the quote unquote civilized mind whatever that means, you know, the civilized mind that has killed billions of innocent people, you know, the civilized mind that killed 300 million people in the 20th century, the innocent people by under the hands of government. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about there. But one of the cool things that he talks about and he in this chapter is that the science that the, you know, the really scientific atheist types and the new agers are really no different because they all have a central focus on themselves. They all, for instance, the scientists, they're all just focused on progress and what it means and objectivity. And that's really just a central focus on the self. And with the new age, the, the my enlightenment movement, it's all about gaining more enlightenment, more bliss, all these other things. And it's none of it is honoring nature. None of it is trying to bring back that connection to the local terrain and what's going on out there. So. I thought that, and I've I've known that forever. That really, they they aren't different. The counterculture and the common, the consensual reality, and the counterculture reality are all the same. They're just two sides of the same coin. And to break out of that, you have to you know break down. You have to enter. If they're in a Hegelian dialectic in the line, you have to enter the circle that you know is holding the the line together. So they vacate the same space in the realm, and and they're vacating that space of just selfishness. That's what they're doing. And when we got, when we get rid of Christianity and all these other things, this is what has come into play now. And in the old world, in the fallen Christian and Islamic mindset, we are fallen. With this, we live in a fallen, beastly world. You know all those metaphors that we saw in especially in 16th and 15th, 16th, 15th and 17th century poetry, English poetry and European poetry. And now we live in a purely mechanical world. That's what we've transitioned to with atheism and scientism and even a lot of new ageism and law of attractionism that none of this is in your control, that consciousness is purely subjective and all these different things that you, we are living, living in a deterministic reality and of course it's a little bit of a mix of both that there is some determinism and there's a bit of free will but when you rest in that middle zone life is a little bit harder you can't have all the answers and that like as we talked about last week that's what you we have to accept though that we are going to have to live within the mystery heading really deep into science can give you some answers heading deep into manifestation and spiritual arts can give you a lot of you know, great results too, and, you know, really drive your consciousness. But at the end of the day, you're not really focusing on what matters most, most, which is the connection to what we actually can be connected to. 
being able to manifest money, being able to manifest whatever you want or feel a certain bliss doesn't mean that you have a connection to the local terrain, which is once again, the root of all these different things. We couldn't have scientism. We couldn't have spiritual new ageism without that. And if you don't have that and you're trying to do those things, you're going to be on a shaky, shaky ladder. That's why the, you, you, um, scientists, you know, atheistic and scientism types and more spiritual types always have so much trauma and so much baggage that their lives are in shambles. If you look at what they're, they don't live very balanced lives and that's because they don't have a very balanced and grounded point of view in nature. So, and the last thing is just that the animate world versus the inanimate world, you know, us as animate, animate mammals, and then maybe a little bit less animate mammals, such as a cat or something, then inanimate beings such as a rock. That's the same comparison. That's the same Hegelian dialectic. It's the good versus the bad. It's the fallen world versus the versus heaven and God. And as we've talked about ad infinitum in this course, everything is animate. Everything has an expressive power. And we have just are still functioning in a hierarchical Christian religious sense of seeing things in terms of consciousness through language or through, through certain actions instead of expression. So that's basically it for the course, everybody. And I want to want to have a quick discussion about the book reports. The book reports, if you, if you guys are actually participating in the writing aspect of this course, I would say they should be anywhere from 700 to 1200 words. And you guys can pick your own topic. And if you guys don't know what to do, you can always just synthesize a certain school of thought or thinker that you love with David Abram's book or Becoming Animal or a certain concept in the book. You can take, for instance, David's chapter about the shadow and compare it to Carl Jung or the whole, I mean, the whole mind chapter has a lot of potent material with Plato and Descartes and any other philosopher. That debate with, you can bring in Heidegger and the analytics. There's so much you can bring in in that sense or our detachment from nature is maybe a form of trauma and then you could show us how to heal that wound from a Freudian, Reichian, Jungian, Ronkian, you know, whatever psychoanalytical lens. You can also take a historical aspect, tracking maybe the oral history of all these different things. That would, you know, historical or oral analysis of what's going on and the pattern of that and what that, and you could tie that to psychology too, or philosophy. Um, you could talk about, David's just general response to environmentalism. How much did you hear about climate change and protests and all these different things? There was a different approach to how to change the world. And you could really bring that into an academic sense and talk about that and show different results and talk about how without that axiomatic pressure, nothing's going to get done. And maybe talk about other revolutionary groups that had success. If you look at groups that have success, they all share a common core belief and a lot of the country or a lot of people also share that. But having a spiritual connection and understanding that we are just animals in our relate our spiritual relationship with the environment, that is very hard to find with people. I mean, I'm not even thinking one out of a hundred have any, I mean, we're probably talking one out of 500 or a thousand type levels with that. And that's just not enough. If we look at the math, I mean, that's, 10, that's a hundred out of every million. So a hundred times 300 million is, I don't know what 3000, 30,000 people. Let's just say my math's totally wrong. And it's 30,000 people. We have 30,000 people are not going to make the environmental impact that we need right now. And the way that you figure this out, everybody is you ask people questions. You have to do an analysis of what their thoughts are. And you've learned how to build a phenomenological consciousness and awareness in this book, you have the tools now. Now you can see if people are actually functioning on this level. We learned at least 12 different main principles here. And if people don't even have, people may have one or two just because it's kind of simple knowledge. But if people aren't getting up into three, four, five, then I don't think they really count. Like everyone, it's pretty easy to be like, everything, oh my God, everything's connected. Or, um, 
you know, we are a fallen being and the science, scientism and new age and the new age is all just the same, all the same. Like those are, I mean, a lot of people don't know that, but those are simple, but they need to be stacked on top of each other. Having a relationship with the things in your house, understanding the animate nature of supposedly inanimate things, understanding the moods of nature and how moods, our moods could have been created by observing nature. Um, the act of shape shifting, the act of the, the fragmented nature of our consciousness and the liminal space that we can occupy and maybe even shape shift ourselves. Um, the, even just as simple of understanding our shadow, like there, like, like I said, you could go chapter by chapter and take the main point out. And those are actually very simple main points that you guys probably knew a lot of before you even began this course. So that's how you can analyze somebody, everybody, and really see how many people are out there that believe these things. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for going through this whole book analysis with me. I'm sure this is going to be three or four hours long. So I'll see you guys in the next part of the course. We are covering Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram next. Then Mystery Teachings of the Living Earth by John Michael Greer. Then... Soulcraft by Bill Plotkin, and then Eco Psychology by Theodore Rozak. If I got all those correct, that is the order. It's probably good that they're, you know, we're going to be stringing those along over the course of the next couple months. A lot of other courses are going to be launching. Check out the Spiritual Ecology of Dune course that just that has been launched by the time you are hearing this. And that's it, everybody. Stay tuned. Comment what you guys thought of this review, this whole course, this whole book. And I will see you guys maybe when you're writing your essays and in the next video.